1878. Archibald Philip Primrose, the 5th Earl of Rosebery, who would go on to be British Prime Minister in 1894, marries Hannah de Rothschild, the daughter of Baron Meyer de Rothschild. The marriage produces four children, Harry Primrose, Lord Darmany, later 6th Earl of Rosebery, the Honourable Neil Primrose, Lady Sybil Primrose, and Lady Margaret Primrose. 1879. Lionel de Rothschild dies. 1880. Rothschild agents begin fermenting a series of pogroms predominantly in Russia, but also in Poland, Bulgaria and Romania. These pogroms result in the slaughter of thousands of Jews, causing approximately 2 million to flee, mainly to New York, but also to Chicago, Philadelphia, Boston and Los Angeles. However some are assisted with Rothschild money to begin settling in Palestine. The reason these pogroms were initiated, was to create a large Jewish base in America, who when they arrived, would be educated to register as Democrat voters. Some 20 years later, this would result in a massive Democratic power base in the United States and be used to elect Rothschild frontmen such as Woodrow Wilson, to the presidency to carry out the bidding of the Rothschilds. In America, John Swinton, then the preeminent New York journalist, was the guest of honor at a banquet given him by the leaders of his craft. Someone who knew neither the press nor Swinton offered a toast to the independent press. Swinton outraged his colleagues by replying there is no such thing, at this date of the world's history, in America, as an independent press. You know it and I know it. There is not one of you who dares to write your honest opinions, and if you did, you know beforehand that it would never appear in print. I am paid weekly for keeping my honest opinion out of the paper I am connected with. Others of you are paid similar salaries for similar things, and any of you who would be so foolish as to write honest opinions would be out on the streets looking for another job. If I allowed my honest opinions to appear in one issue of my paper, be for 24 hours my occupation would be gone. The business of the journalists is to destroy the truth, to lie outright, to pervert, to vilify, to fawn at the feet of mammon, and to sell his country and his race for his daily bread. You know it and I know it, and what folly is this toasting an independent press? We are the tools and vassals of rich men behind the scenes. We are the jumping jacks. They pull the strings and we dance. Our talents, our possibilities and our lives are all the property of other men. We are intellectual prostitutes. 1881. President James A. Garfield, the 20th President of the United States who lasted only 100 days, states two weeks before he is assassinated whoever controls the volume of money in our country is absolute master of all industry and commerce and when you realize that the entire system is very easily controlled, one way or another, by a few powerful men at the top, you will not have to be told how periods of inflation and depression originate. On March 13, the Tsar of Russia, Alexandre, is assassinated in St. Petersburg, following several assassination attempts that began in 1866, less than a year after President Lincoln's victory in the American Civil War. Edmund James de Rothschild has a son, Morris de Rothschild. 1883. After 6,000 feet of tunnel in the Channel Tunnel project has been excavated, the British government halts the project citing the fact that it would be a threat to Britain's security. 1885. Nathaniel Rothschild, son of Lion de Rothschild becomes the first Jewish peer and takes the title of Lord Rothschild. 1886. The French Rothschild Bank, de Rothschild FREs obtains substantial amounts of Russia's oil fields and forms the Caspian and Black Sea Petroleum Company, which quickly becomes the world's second largest oil producer. 1887. Edward Albert Sassoon, grandson of Rothschild opium monopolist David Sassoon, 
marries Aileen Caroline de Rothschild, the granddaughter of Jacob, James, Meyer Rothschild. Aileen Caroline's father, Gustav, together with his brother, Alphonse, took over the Rothschild's French arm following their father Jacob's death. The Rothschilds financed the amalgamation of the Kimberley Diamond Mines in South Africa. They subsequently become the biggest shareholders of this company, De Beers, and mine precious stones in Africa and India. 1888. No my Halfen, future wife of Maurice de Rothschild is born. 1891. The British Labour leader makes the following statement on the subject of the Rothschilds This blood-sucking crew has been the cause of untold mischief and misery in Europe during the present century, and has piled up its prodigious wealth chiefly through fermenting wars between states which ought never to have quarrelled. Whenever there is trouble in Europe, wherever rumours of war circulate and men's minds are distraught with fear of change and calamity you may be sure that a hook-nosed Rothschild is at his games somewhere near the region of the disturbance. Comments like this worry the Rothschilds and towards the end of the 1800s they purchase Reuters news agencies so they can exercise some control over the media. 1895 Edmund James de Rothschild, the youngest son of Jacob, James, Meyer Rothschild, visits Palestine to see the Jewish colonies he funded as a result of the Rothschild engineered pogroms in Russia, Poland, Bulgaria and Romania. He is impressed and vows to continue to supply funds to these colonies in furtherance of the long-term Rothschild objective of creating a Rothschild-owned Jewish state. 1897. The Rothschilds found their Zionist Congress to promote Zionism. Zionism is portrayed as a political movement seeking to secure a homeland for the Jews, but is in reality a conspiracy to bring the entire world under a world government administered and controlled by Jews, and in particular, the Rothschilds. The first meeting of the Zionist Congress is arranged to take place in Munich, however due to opposition from local Jews, this meeting has to be moved to Baal, Switzerland and takes place on 29th August. The meeting is chaired by Ashkenazi Jew, Theodor Hertz, who would go on to state in his diaries it is essential that the sufferings of Jews become worst this will assist in realization of our plans, I have an excellent idea that I shall induce anti-Semites to liquidate Jewish wealth, the anti-Semites will assist us thereby in that they will strengthen the persecution and oppression of Jews. The anti-Semites shall be our best friends. Hexagram Hertzl is subsequently elected president of the Zionist organization which adopts the Rothschild Red Hexagram, as their Zionist flag which 51 years later will end up on the flag of Israel. At this conference, Shame Wiseman, who would go on to, to become its head declares there are no English, French, German or American Jews, but only Jews living in England, France, Germany or America. Edward Henry Harriman becomes a director of the Union Pacific Railroad and goes on to take control of the Southern Pacific Railroad. This is all financed by the Rothschilds. 1898. At the World Zionist Congress in July, Max Manderstam makes the following statement The Jews energetically reject the idea of fusion with the other nationalities and cling firmly to their historical hope of world empire. Pope Leo Zei states the following on the subject of usury. The charging of interest on money on the one hand there is the party which holds the power because it holds the wealth, which has in its grasp all labor and all trade, which manipulates for its own benefit and its own purposes all the sources of supply, and which is powerfully represented in the councils of state itself. On the other side there is the needy and powerless multitude, sore and suffering. Rapacious usury, which, although more than once condemned by the church, is nevertheless under a different form but with the same guilt, still practiced by avaricious and grasping men. So that a small number of very rich men have been able to lay upon the masses of the poor a yoke little better than slavery itself. Ferdinand de Rothschild dies. 
1899. Due to the discovery of a vastly increasing amount of wealth in gold and diamonds within South Africa, the Rothschilds through their agents Lord Alfred Milner and Cecil Rhodes send 400,000 British soldiers over there to fight against the enemy, which consists of 30,000 Boer farmers with rifles who would rather not leave their own land. It is during this so-called war, that the concentration camp is invented, when the British rounded up anyone sympathetic to the Boers, which included women and children, and placed them in unsanitary, fever-ridden camps. The Rothschild British Army go on to win this war and thus the vast wealth in gold and diamonds, for the Rothschilds. Indeed in a speech he gave on October 30, 1937, Rear Admiral Henry Hamilton Beamish, had the following to say on the subject of the Boer War. The Boer War occurred 37 years ago. Boer means farmer. Many criticized a great power like Britain for trying to wipe out the Boers. Upon making inquiry, I found all the gold and diamond mines of South Africa were owned by Jews, that Rothschild controlled gold, Samuels controlled silver, Bohm controlled other mining and Moses controlled base metals. Anything these people touch they inevitably pollute. Stephanus Johannes Paul Kruger The current president of the Transvaal Republic in South Africa, Stephanus Johannes Paul Kruger, would state the following this year, regarding the only way he could envision peace in South Africa if it were conceivable, to eject the Jew monopolist from this country neck and crop without incurring war with Great Britain then the problem of everlasting peace would be solved. 1901. The Jews from the colonies set up in Palestine by Edmund James de Rothschild, send a delegation to him which state the following if you wish to save the Yeshava, the Jewish settlement, first take your hands from it, and for once permit the colonists to have the possibility of correcting for themselves what needs correcting. Edmund James de Rothschild is not at all pleased to receive this delegation and he says to them I created the Yeshava, I alone. Therefore no men, neither colonists nor organizations have the right to interfere in my plans. The Rothschild Banking House in Frankfurt, Germany, M. A. Von Rothschild und Essie, closes as there is no male Rothschild heir to take it on. 1902. Philippe de Rothschild is born. 1903. In August at the 6th Zionist Congress in Baal, Switzerland, a discussion takes place regarding an offer from Britain to provide Uganda as a base for a future Jewish Zionist state. The Jews present complain they want Palestine, and then suddenly Max Nordau makes the following shocking statement regarding how the Jews will get Palestine through a stepping stone process, which would play out to the letter more than 15 years later. This is what he said let me tell you the following words as if I were showing you the rungs of a ladder leading upward and upward, Hertz, the Zionist Congress, the English Uganda Proposition the future world war, the peace conference where with the help of England the free and Jewish Palestine will be created. 1905. A group of Rothschild-backed Zionist Jews led by Georgi Apolinovich up an attempt to overthrow the Tsar of Russia in a communist cheat. They fail and are forced to flee Russia only to be given refuge in Germany. This year's Jewish Encyclopedia, Volume 2. P.497, on the subject of control of the Catholic Church, states it is a somewhat curious sequel to the attempt to set up a Catholic competitor to the Rothschilds that at the present time the latter are the guardians of the papal treasure. 1906. The Rothschilds claim that due to growing instability in the region and increasing competition from Rockefeller, the Rockefeller family are Rothschild descendants through a female bloodline, own Standard Oil, they decide to sell their Caspian and Black Sea Petroleum Company to Royal Dutch and Shell. This is another example of the Rothschilds trying to hide their true wealth which they are actually consolidating. 1907. Rothschild, Jacob Siff, the head of Kuhn, 
Loeb and Company in a speech to the New York Chamber of Commerce, warns that unless we have a central bank with adequate control of credit resources, this country is going to undergo the most severe and far-reaching money panic in its history. Suddenly America finds itself in the middle of another financial crisis, known as the Panic of 1907, which goes on to decimate the lives of millions of Americans. 1909 Jacob Siff founds the National Advancement for the Association of the Colored People NAP. This is done to incite black people into rioting, looting and other forms of disorder, in order to cause a rift between the black and white communities. Jewish historian, Howard Sachar, states the following in his book, A History of the Jews in America. In 1914, Professor Emeritus Joel Spingin of Columbia University became chairman of the NACP and recruited for its board such Jewish leaders as Jacob Sif, Jacob Ilikopf, and Rabbi Stephen Wise. Other Ashkenazi Jew co-founders included Julius Rosenthal, Lillian Wald and Rabbi Emil G. Hirsch. It would not be until over 60 years later in the 1970s that the NACP would appoint its first black president. Benjamin Hooks. Interestingly the Jewish Talmud is the proponent of the racist Hamitic myth, a subject on which former employee of the Simon Wiesenthal Center, Harold Brackman, wrote the following in his doctoral dissertation entitled, The Ebb and Flow of Conflict, The History of Black-Jewish Relations Through 1900. There is no denying that the Babylonian Talmud was the first source to read a negrophobic content into the episode by stressing Canaan's fraternal connection with Cush. The more important version of the myth, however, ingeniously ties in the origins of blackness, and of other, real and imagined negroid traits, with Noah's curse itself. According to it, Ham is told by his outraged father that, because you have abused me in the darkness of the night, your children shall be born black and ugly, because you have twisted your head to cause me embarrassment, they shall have kinky hair and red eyes, because your lips jested at my exposure, theirs shall swell, and because you neglected my nakedness, they shall go naked with their shamefully elongated male members exposed for all to see. Morris de Rothschild marries Ashkenazi Jew, no my Halfton. 1911. Werner Sombart, in his book, The Jews and Modern Capitalism, states that from 1820 on, it was the, age of the Rothschild, and concluded that there was, only one power in Europe, and that is Rothschild. He also stated Jewish influence made the United States just what they are, that is, American. For what we call Americanism is nothing else, if we may say so than the Jewish spirit distilled modern capitalism is nothing more nor less than an expression of the Jewish spirit. Capitalism was born from the money loan. Money lending contains the root idea of capitalism. Turn to the pages of the Talmud and you will find that the Jews made an art of lending money. They were taught early to look for their chief happiness in the possession of money. They fathomed all the secrets that lay hidden in money. They became lords of money and lords of the world. 1912 In the December issue of, Truth, magazine, George R. Conroy states of banker Jacob Siff Mr. Siff is head of the great private banking house of Kuhn, Loeb, and Co., which represents the Rothschild's interests on this side of the Atlantic. He has been described as financial strategist and has been for years the financial minister of the great impersonal power known as Standard Oil. He was hand in glove with the Harrimans, the Goulds, and the Rockefellers in all their railroad enterprises and has become the dominant power in the railroad and financial power of America. 1913 On March 4, Woodrow Wilson is elected the 28th President of the United States. Shortly after he is inaugurated, he is visited in the White House by Ashkenazi Jew, Samuel Untermeyer, of law firm, Guggenheim, Untermeyer, and Marshall, who tries to blackmail him for the sum of $40,000 in relation to an affair Wilson had whilst he was a professor at Princeton University, 
with a fellow professor's wife. President Wilson does not have the money, so under my volunteers to pay the $40,000 out of his own pocket to the woman Wilson had the affair with, on the condition that Wilson promised to appoint to the first vacancy on the United States Supreme Court a nominee to be recommended to President Wilson by Untermeyer. Wilson agrees to this. On March 31st, J. P. Morgan, alleged owner of the J. P. Morgan banking empire dies. He is thought to be the richest man in America, but his will reveal he owned only 19% of J. P. Morgan companies. The other 81%? Owned by the Rothschilds. Jacob Siff sets up the Anti-Defamation League, AD, as a branch of the Bnibrit in the United States. This organization is created for the purpose of identifying anyone who questions or challenges the unlawful actions of elitist Jews or the Rothschild global conspiracy as anti-Semitic and against the Jewish race as a whole. Strangely enough, the same year that they do this they also set up their last and current central bank in America, the Federal Reserve. In order to get support for this from the public, they brazenly state that only a central bank could curb inflations and depressions when in fact the very idea of a central bank is to manipulate the money supply to cause this. Following the passing of the Federal Reserve Act on December 23, Congressman Charles Lindbergh states the act establishes the most gigantic trust on earth. When the president signs this bill, the invisible government of the monetary power will be legalized. The greatest crime of the ages is perpetrated by this banking and currency bill. It is important to note that the Federal Reserve is a private company, it is neither federal nor does it have any reserve. It is conservatively estimated that profits exceed $150 billion per year, yet the Federal Reserve has never once in its history published accounts. Some recent evidence has come forward as to who really owns the Federal Reserve, and they are the following banks. Rothschild Bank of London, Warburg Bank of Hamburg, Rothschild Bank of Berlin, Lehman Brothers of New York, Lazard Brothers of Paris, Kuhn Low Bank of New York, Israel, Moses Sef Banks of Italy, Goldman, Sachs of New York, Warburg Bank of Amsterdam, Chase Manhattan Bank of New York. These are all Rothschild banks. 1914. The start of World War I. In this war, the German Rothschilds loan money to the Germans, the British Rothschilds loan money to the British, and the French Rothschilds loan money to the French. Furthermore, the Rothschilds have control of the three European news agencies, Wolf. 1849. In Germany, Reuters, 1851, in England, and Harvest, 1835, in France. The Rothschilds use Wolf to manipulate the German people into a fervor for war. It is around this time that the Rothschilds are rarely reported in the media, because they own the media. 1915. The Islamic Ottoman government of Turkey is overthrown by Masonic Jewish socialists, who deceptively called themselves, the Young Turks. The upshot of this is a Jewish-led genocide of two million Christian Armenians, many of whom are tortured and have their hands cut off. Indeed, according to the British consul, there were so many severed hands, that if they were laid side by side, a highway could have been made out of them. As a result of this revolution, the man who would become known as Mustafa Gimlatachuk, an alcoholic crypto-Jew, would rise to dictatorial power in Turkey. 1916. On June 4, Ashkenazi Jew, Louis Dimbitz Brandeis is appointed to the Supreme Court of the United States by President Wilson, as per his agreed blackmail payment to Samuel Untermeyer some three years earlier. Justice Brandeis is also the elected leader of the Executive Committee for Zionist Affairs, a position he has held since 1914. The Middle of World War I. Germany are winning the war as they are being financed by the Rothschilds to a greater extent than France, Italy and England, simply because the Rothschilds, 
do not want to support the Tsar in Russia, and of course Russia was on the same side as France, Italy and England. Then a significant event occurs. On December 12, Germany, although they were winning the war and not one foreign soldier had set foot on their soil, offers armistice to Britain with no requirement of reparations. The Rothschilds are anxious to make sure this is not accepted by the British as they have a few cards left up their sleeve in relation to what they initiated this war for. So, whilst the British are considering Germany's offer, Rothschild agent Louis Brandeis sends a Zionist delegation from America to Britain to promise to bring America into the war on the side of the British, provided the British agree to give the land of Palestine to the Rothschilds. The Rothschilds wanted Palestine to protect the great business interests they had in the East. They also desired their own state in that area along with their own military which they could use as an aggressor to any state that threatened those interests. The British subsequently agree to the deal for Palestine and the Zionists in London contact their counterparts in America and inform them of this fact. Suddenly all the major newspapers in America that up to that point had been pro-German turn on Germany, running propaganda pieces to manipulate the American public against the Germans, such as, German soldiers are killing Red Cross nurses, and, German soldiers are cutting off babies' hands. Interestingly Woodrow Wilson is re-elected president this year, the slogan of his campaign being, re-elect the man who will keep your sons out of the war. 1917. As a result of Germany's offer of peace, the Rothschild war machine goes into total overdrive in America, spreading anti-German propaganda throughout the American media which leads to President Wilson under the instructions of the Jewish American Supreme Court Justice, Louis Dimbitz Brandeis, reneging on his promise to the electorate in taking America into World War I on April 6. As per the Rothschild promise to the British, to take America into the war, they decide they want something in writing from the British to prove that they will uphold their side of the bargain. The British Foreign Secretary, Arthur James Balfour, a Jew, therefore drafts a letter which is commonly known as the Balfour Declaration, which is reprinted below. Foreign Office November 2, 1917 Dear Lord Rothschild I have much pleasure in conveying to you, on behalf of His Majesty's Government, the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations which has been submitted to, and approved by, the Cabinet. His Majesty's Government view would favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine, or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. I should be grateful if you would bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation. Yours sincerely Arthur James Balfour. The Rothschilds order the execution by the Jewish Bolsheviks they control of Tsar Nicholas A and his entire family in Russia, even though the Tsar had already abdicated on March 2nd. This is to get control of the country and an act of revenge for Tsar Alexander I blocking their world government plan in 1815 at the Congress of Vienna, and Tsar Alexander I siding with President Abraham Lincoln in 1864. It is extremely important for them to slaughter the entire family including women and children in order to make good on the promise to do so made by Nathan Meyer Rothschild in 1815. This act is a show of power play and defiance by the Jews to the rest of the world. United States Congressman, Oscar Callaway, informs Congress that J. P. Morgan is a Rothschild front and has taken control of the American media industry. He states in March, 1915, the J.P. Morgan interests, the steel, shipbuilding, and powder interest, and their subsidiary organizations, got together 12 men high up in the newspaper world and employed them to select the most influential newspapers in the United States and sufficient number of them to control generally the policy of the daily press. 
they found it was only necessary to purchase the control of 25 of the greatest papers. An agreement was reached. The policy of the papers was bought, to be paid for by the month, an editor was furnished for each paper to properly supervise and edit information regarding the questions of preparedness, militarism, financial policies, and other things of national and international nature considered vital to the interests of the purchasers. 1918. The real purpose of communism becomes apparent less than a year after the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, the stealing of the wealth of the people, especially the Rothschild's favorite, gold, for the benefit of the state, the state which is of course now owned by the Rothschild family, and administered by Jews. This is highlighted by the following dispatch from Petrograd reported in the New York Times on January 30th the people's commissaries have decreed a state monopoly of gold. Churches, museums and other public institutions are required to place their gold articles at the disposal of the state. Gold articles belonging to private persons must be handed over to the state. Informants will receive one third of the value of the articles. In March of this year, Lenin makes a statement against anti-Semitism which is put onto phonograph record and circulated around the country, as part of a massive campaign to stifle the burgeoning counter-revolutionary movement against the Jews. In April, the London Times correspondent to Russia, Robert Wilton, produces a table showing the ethnic structure of the 384 commissars in the new Russian government. These commissars include, to Negroes, 13 Russians, 15 Chinamen, 22 Armenians, and more than 300 Jews. Of those Jews, 264 had come to Russia from the United States since the downfall of the imperial government. The president of the University of Wisconsin, Charles R. Van Hise, delivers an address entitled, The Foundation of a New World Order to the, Wisconsin State Convention of the League to Enforce Peace. During this address he states the world has become one body, and no great member of it can proceed independently of the other members. They must act together, and this is possible only through formal treaty covenants. 1919. In January, Jew, Karl Liebknechtin Sephardic Jew, Rosa Luxemburg, are killed as they attempt to lead another Rothschild-funded communist chief, this time in Berlin, Germany. On January 18, the Versailles Peace Conference commences, to decide reparations that the Germans are required to pay to the victors following the end of World War I. A delegation of 117 Jews headed up by Ashkenazi Jew, Bernard Baruch, who would go on to state to a select committee of the United States Congress, I probably had more power than perhaps any other man did in the war. Doubtless that is true, bring up the subject of the promise of Palestine for them. At this point the Germans realized why America had turned on them and under whose influence, the Rothschilds. The Germans, naturally, felt they had been betrayed by their Jewish population. This is because, at the time the Rothschilds made their deal with Britain for Palestine, in exchange for bringing America into the war, Germany was the most friendly country in the world towards the Jews, indeed the German Emancipation Edict of 1820 to guaranteed Jews in Germany all civil rights enjoyed by Germans. Also, Germany was the only country in Europe which did not place restrictions on Jews, even giving them refuge when they had to flee from Russia after their first attempted communist coup failed there in 1905. Nevertheless, Palestine is confirmed as a Jewish homeland, and whilst its handover to the Rothschilds takes place it is to remain under the control of Britain as the Rothschilds control Britain. At the time less than 1% of the population of Palestine is Jewish. Interestingly, the host of the Versailles Peace Conference is its Jewish boss, Baron Edmund de Rothschild. Indeed in his book, The Inside Story of the Peace Conference, Emile Joseph Dillon states the following of the Versailles Peace Conference It may seem amazing to some readers, but it is not the less a fact that a considerable number of delegates, to the Peace Conference at Versailles, 
believed that the real influences behind the Anglo-Saxon people were Jews. The formula into which this policy was thrown by the members of the conference, whose countries it affected, and who regarded it as fatal to the peace of Eastern Europe ends thus, henceforth the world will be governed by the Anglo-Saxon peoples, who, in turn, are swayed by their Jewish elements. Furthermore, the Rothschilds use this conference to obtain the German-owned railway rights in Palestine and give them control over the nation's infrastructure. On May 30, a spin-off meeting from this so-called peace conference is held, also chaired by Baron Edmund de Rothschild, at the Hotel Majestic in Paris, where it is decided, that an organization be set up to advise, control, what governments do. This body is called the, Institute of International Affairs, which would subsequently metamorphosize into two arms. The British, Royal Institute of International Affairs, RIA, in 1920, and its American counterpart the, Council on Foreign Relations, CFR, in 1921. Both of these bodies are to be controlled by the Rothschilds. Finally, the Rothschilds also use the Versailles Peace Conference to set up their second overt attempt at world government, which they promote under the pretext of ending all wars, which they of course create. They call this the, League of Nations. Fortunately, this would not be accepted by enough countries, and would therefore fade away. But before it did, the future president of the World Zionist Congress, Naam Sokolo, would state the following of it the League of Nations is a Jewish idea. We created it after a fight of 25 years. On March 29 the Times of London reports the following on the Bolsheviks in Russia One of the curious features of the Bolshevist movement is the high percentage of non-Russian elements among its leaders. Of the 20 or 30 commissaries, or leaders, who provide the central machinery of the Bolshevist movement, not less than 75% were Jews. It is reported that the Rothschilds are angry with the Russians because they were not prepared to allow them to form a central bank within their nation. They therefore gathered groups of Jewish spies and sent them into Russia to drum up a revolution for the benefit of the common man, which was actually a takeover of Russia by Rothschild-controlled Jewish elite. Indeed, one of these leading Jewish spies, Leon Trotsky, even used to play chess with Baron Rothschild whilst he was in Vienna. These Jewish spies were, in age-old deceptive Ashkenazi crypto-Jew tradition, given Russian names, for example Trotsky was a leading member of the first group and his original name was Bronstein. These groups were sent to areas throughout Russia to incite riots and rebellion. The Jewish Post International Edition, week ending January 24, 1991, confirms Vladimir Lenin was Jewish. He was a crypto-Jew, and was born, Vladimir Likolayanov. Lenin is on record as having stated the establishment of a central bank is 90% of communizing a nation. These Jewish, Rothschild-funded Bolsheviks would go on in the course of history to slaughter 60 million Christians and non-Jews in Soviet-controlled territory. Indeed the author A. A. Kondrasoltsitsin in his work, Gulag Archipelago, Volume 2, affirms that Jews created and administered the organized Soviet concentration camp system in which these tens of millions of Christians and non-Jews died. On page 79 of this book he even names the administrators of this, the greatest killing machine in the history of the world. They are, Aaron Soltz, Yekaf Rappoport, Lazar Kogan, Matvey Berman, Jean-Ric Yagoda, and Naftali Frenkel. All six are Jews. In 1970 Soltzitzin would be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for Literature. Indeed, in April, George Peter Wilson, of the London Globe, wrote an article which contained the following definition of Bolshevism Bolshevism is the dispossession of the Christian nations of the world to such an extent that no capital will remain in the hands of the Christians, that all Jews may jointly hold the world in their hands and reign wherever they choose. On July 23rd, Scotland Yard report the following to the American Secretary of State There is now definite evidence that Bolshevism is an international movement controlled by Jews, 
communications are passing between the leaders in America, France, Russia and England, with a view toward concerted action. On June 19, Australian Prime Minister Billy Hughes, is quoted with the following statement in the Saturday Evening Post The Montefiores have taken Australia for their own, and there is not a goldfield or a sheep run from Tasmania to New South Wales that does not pay them a heavy tribute. They are the real owners of the Antipodean continent. What is the good of our being a wealthy nation, if the wealth is all in the hands of German Jews? N. M. Rothschild and Sons are given a permanent role to fix the world's daily gold price. This takes place in the City of London offices, daily at 1,100 hours, in the same room until 2004. and 20. Winston Churchill, whose mother, Jenny, Jacobson, Jerome, was Jewish, meaning he is Jewish under Israeli immigration law, as he was born of a Jewish mother, writes the following in an article on page 5 of the Illustrated Sunday Herald, dated February 8. Some people like Jews and some do not, but no thoughtful man can doubt the fact that they are beyond all question the most formidable and the most remarkable race which has ever appeared in the world. And it may well be that this same astounding race may at the present time be in the actual process of producing another system of morals and philosophy, as malevolent as Christianity was benevolent, which, if not arrested would shatter irretrievably all that Christianity has rendered possible. From the days of Spartacus way I shopped to those of Karl Marx, and down to Trotsky, Russia, Bielikun, Hungary, pre-crypto Jew name, Cohen, Rosa Luxemburg, Germany, and Emma Goldman, United States, this worldwide conspiracy for the overthrow of civilization and for the reconstitution of society on the basis of arrested development, of envious malevolence, and impossible equality, has been steadily growing. It played a definitely recognizable part in the tragedy of the French Revolution. It has been the mainspring of every subversive movement during the 19th century, and now at last this band of extraordinary personalities from the underworld of the great cities of Europe and America have gripped the Russian people by the hair of their heads and have become practically the undisputed masters of that enormous empire. There is no need to exaggerate the part played in the creation of Bolshevism and in the actual bringing about of the Russian Revolution by these international, and for the most part atheistic Jews. It is certainly a very great one, it probably outweighs all others. With the notable exception of Lenin, subsequently revealed as a Jew, the majority of the leading figures are Jews. In the September 10th edition of, The American Hebrew, it is stated the Bolshevist revolution in Russia was the work of Jewish brains, of Jewish dissatisfaction, of Jewish planning, whose goal is to create a new order in the world. What was performed in so excellent a way in Russia, thanks to Jewish brains, and because of Jewish dissatisfaction, and by Jewish planning, shall also, through the same Jewish mental and physical forces, become a reality all over the world. The Cause of World Unrest, published this year, H. A. Gwyn, contributes an introduction in which he states the following in earlier history. Kings, princes, governors stood between the masses and their exploiters. Truffly speaking, the people were prevented by established authority from being victimized. Today all that is changed, and we now live in an age which will we be known, perhaps, in history as the age of the exploitation of the people. The pages of this book will trace the threads of a conspiracy engineered by people whose main object has been to destroy utterly anything, kings, governments, or institutions, 
which might stand between them and the people they would exploit. The main outline of the contents of this book is, in brief, that there has been for centuries a hidden conspiracy, chiefly Jewish, whose objects have been and are to produce revolution, communism and anarchy, by means of which they hope to arrive at the hegemony of the world by establishing some sort of despotic rule. Also this year, the t Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion, is published in England, having first been deposited in the British Museum in 1905. This document is the blueprint for the domination of the world by Jews, and is said to have formed the minutes of the First World Zionist Congress held in Baal, Switzerland, in 1897. It is immediately slammed as anti-Semitic by the Jews, who claim it is a forgery, but interestingly will not go as far as to call it a fake. The only way to determine if this plan for Jewish domination of the world is real, is to look at the evidence and establish whether the Jews have dominated the world, or have made clear efforts to do so. There is more than enough evidence for the former to be the case and in fact this is what Henry Ford said about the protocols, 85 years ago, in 1921 the only statement I care to make about the protocols is that they fit in with what is going on. They are 16 years old, and they have fitted the world situation up to this time. They fit it now. 1921. In her book, published this year, World Revolution or the Plot Against Civilization, noted historian, Nestor Webster, states the following of the Jews since the earliest times it is as the exploiter that the Jew has been known amongst his fellow men of all races and creeds. Moreover, he has persistently shown himself ungrateful. The Jews have always formed a rebellious element in every state. Under the orders of Jacob Sif, the Council on Foreign Relations CFR, is founded by Ashkenazi Jews, Bernard Baruch and Colonel Edward Mandelhaus. Sif gave his orders prior to his death in 1920, as he knew an organization in America needed to be set up to select politicians to carry on the Rothschild conspiracy, indeed the formation of the CFR was actually agreed in a meeting on May 30, 1919 at the Hotel Majestic in Paris, France. The CFR membership at the start is approximately 1,000 people in the United States. This membership includes the heads of virtually every industrial empire in America, all the American-based international bankers, and the heads of all their tax-free foundations. In essence all those people who would provide the capital required for anyone who wished to run for Congress, the Senate or the Presidency. The first job of the CFR is to gain control of the press. This task is given to John D. Rockefeller who sets up a number of national news magazines such as Life, and Time. He finances the Jew, Samuel Newhouse, to buy up and establish a chain of newspapers all across the country, and another Jew, Eugene Meyer, who would go on to buy up many publications such as the Washington Post, Newsweek, and the Weekly Magazine. The idea of controlling the press is not simply to censor news the Rothschilds don't want you to hear. It is primarily to be used as an education tool to condition the public by emphasizing what news is important and what news isn't. A perfect example of this is a newspaper which runs lead stories about the shenanigans of whatever flavor of the month celebrity they choose, yet bury within the inside pages some brief account of an ongoing war that will overtly or covertly have an effect on each and every one of us. Another example of this is putting more and more emphasis on sport as opposed to news. The CFR also needed to get control of radio, television and the motion picture industry. This task is split amongst the international bankers from, Goon Loeb, Goldman Sachs, the Warburgs, and the Lehmanns. Interestingly the Jewish Encyclopedica Judaica would have the following to say on this subject all the large Hollywood companies with the exception of United Artists, were founded and controlled by Jews. Finally the CFR needed to control what was being taught in the schools, and the task was given to the Carnegies. In Germany, Jacob Klatzkin, a Jewish political Zionist ideologist in Germany at the time, 
where incidentally the Jews of Germany were enjoying full political and civil rights, makes the following provocative statement hoping it will undermine the Jewish community in Germany and make them flee to Palestine we Jews are aliens, a Jew can never be a loyal German, whoever calls the foreign land his fatherland is a traitor to the Jewish people. 1922 President Theodore Roosevelt who died in 1919 is quoted in the March 27th edition of the New York Times with the following statement These international bankers and Rockefeller Standard Oil interests control the majority of newspapers and the columns of these newspapers to club into submission or drive out of public office officials who refuse to do the bidding of the powerful corrupt cliques which compose the invisible government. The reason the New York Times ran this article was due to the mayor of New York, John Hylan, who had been reported in the same paper the previous day, March 26, with the following statement The warning of Theodore Roosevelt has much timeliness today, for the real menace of our republic is this invisible government which like a giant octopus sprawls its slimy length over city, state, and nation. It seizes in its long and powerful tentacles our executive officers, our legislative bodies, our schools, our courts, our newspapers, and every agency created for the public protection. To depart from mere generalizations, let me say that at the head of this octopus are the Rockefeller Standard Oil interest and a small group of powerful banking houses generally referred to as international bankers. This little coterie of powerful international bankers virtually run the United States government for their own selfish purposes. They practically control both parties, write political platforms, make cat's paws of party leaders, use the leading men of private organizations, and resort to every device to place in nomination for high public office only such candidates as will be amenable to the dictates of corrupt big business. These international bankers and Rockefeller Standard Oil interests control the majority of newspapers and magazines in this country. In his book, The Juice, published this year, noted historian, Hilaire Belloc, states the following in relation to the increasing phenomenon of the crypto Jew. Take the particular trick of false names. It seems to us particularly odious. We think when we show our contempt for those who use this subterfuge that we are giving them no more than they deserve. It is a meanness which we associate with criminals and vagabonds, a piece of crawling and sneaking. Men whose race is universally known, will unblushingly adopt a false name as a mask, and after a year or two pretend to treat it as an insult if their original and true name be used in its place. He goes on to reveal how some Jews did not need to change their name as they simply intermarried with the aristocracy of England when he states the Jew might almost be called a British agent upon the continent of Europe and still more in the Near and Far East. He was admitted to every institution in the state, a prominent member of his nation became chief officer of the English executive, and, an influence more subtle and penetrating, marriages began to take place, wholesale between what had once been the aristocratic territorial families of this country and the Jewish commercial fortunes. After two generations of this, with the opening of the 20th century those of the great territorial English families in which there was no Jewish blood were the exception. In nearly all of them was the stain more or less marked, in some of them so strong that though the name was still an English name and the tradition those of a purely English lineage of the long past, the physique and character had become wholly Jewish and the members of the family were taken for Jews whenever they traveled in countries where the gentry had not yet suffered or enjoyed the admixture. 1924. Joseph Stalin, a Georgian, becomes Premier of the Soviet Union. Joseph Stalin's real name is Jagashvili, which translates from Georgian as, son of a Jew. In the Georgian language, Shvili, means son of, and, Juga, means Jew. Stalin also has three wives in his lifetime. Ekaterina Svanids, Kedja Avija, and Rosa Kaganovich, all of them Jewesses. Interestingly Stalin passes a law during his premiership that resulted in anyone found guilty of anti-Semitism being sentenced to death. 
On May 10, J. Edgar Hoover is made Director of the Bureau of Investigation. Boy, which will become the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, in 1935. He would remain its director until his death in 1972. Hoover was a homosexual and during some point in his career he was photographed engaged in homosexual acts with associate FBI director, Clyde Tolson, his lifelong companion for more than 40 years who inherited his estate upon his death. These photos were obtained for the Anti-Defamation League, and, through the mafia run by Jewish Don, Mylansky, for the purposes of blackmailing Hoover. In his book, You Gentiles, Morris Samuel states the following of his people, the Jews we Jews, we are the destroyers and will remain the destroyers. Nothing you can do will meet our demands and needs. We will forever destroy because we want a world of our own. Since 1922, Morris Samuel worked as secretary to Chaim Wiseman, the leader of the World Zionist Movement. In the January 17th issue of, The Jewish Courier, it is stated Jews may adopt the customs and language of the countries where they live, but they will never become part of the native population. In her book, Secret Societies and Subversive Movements, published this year, Nesta Webster states the following of the Jewish religion The Jewish conception of the Jews as the chosen people who must eventually rule the world forms indeed the basis of Rabbinical Judaism. The Jewish religion now takes its stand on the Talmud rather than on the Bible. Edmund de Rothschild establishes the Palestine Jewish Colonization Association, Pika, which acquires more than 125,000 acres of land. He goes on to establish numerous business ventures there including the founding of Israel's wine industry. On July 1st, as he leaves the Shezad Hospital in Jerusalem, Dr. Yaakov Yisrael Dian is assassinated by Zionist, Avera Amtehomi. This is as a result of his organization of a meeting between a delegation of Orthodox leaders and a group of Arab leaders headed by King Abdullah. Dr. Dian was a promoter of peace with the veteran Arab residents of the Holy Land, the direct opposite of what the Zionists wanted. 1925. This year's Jewish Encyclopedia states of the existence of Ashkenazi Jews, who represent approximately 90% of so-called world Jewry, with the startling admission that the so-called enemy of the Jews, Esau, also known as Edom, see Genesis 36 colon 1, now actually represents the Jewish race, when on page 42 of volume V it is stated Edom is in modern Jewry. On March 19th, the British manufacturer, Walter Crick, is quoted in the Northampton Daily Echo as having made the following statement Jews can destroy by means of finance. Jews are international. Control of credits in this country is not in the hands of the English, but of Jews. It has become the biggest danger the British Empire ever had to face. On April 1st, the Jew, Lord Arthur James Balfour, he of the infamous Balfour Declaration, gives a speech as guest of honor at the inauguration of the Hebrew University at Mount Scopus, Jerusalem, Israel. He goes on to tour around Palestine, where he is greeted enthusiastically by the Jewish population, whilst the Arabs welcome him with black flags. On December 3rd, in the, London Morning Post, George Bernard Shaw, who incidentally won the Nobel Prize for Literature this year, had the following to say on the subject of the Jew this is the real enemy. The invader from the east, the Druze, the ruffian, the oriental parasite, in a word the Jew. 1926. N. M. Rothschild and Sons refinance the Underground Electric Railways Company of London Limited which has a controlling interest in the entire London underground transport system. David Sarnoff, a Jew, launches the first United States radio chain in as a service of a car. Sarnoff will go on to, to be heavily involved in the development of color television and build NBC into one of the big three TV networks. Morris de Rothschild has a son, Edmund de Rothschild. 1927. On October 28, the Jewish Tribune of New York, 
states in an article Masonry is based on Judaism. Eliminate the teachings of Judaism from the Masonic ritual and what is left? Also speaking on this subject, the well-known Rabbi, Isaac Weiss, states Freemasonry is a Jewish establishment, whose, history, grades, official appointments, passwords, and explanations, are Jewish from beginning to end. 1928. William S. Paley, a Jew, founds CBS Radio and goes on to build it into a multi-billion dollar TV empire. On page 572 of June 1 St's Rothschild own publication, La Revue de Paris, a letter to Karl Marx from Baruch Levy is reprinted, an extract of which reads as follows the Jewish people as a whole will be its own messiah. It will attain world dominion by the dissolution of other races, by the abolition of frontiers, the annihilation of monarchy, and by the establishment of a world republic in which the Jews will everywhere exercise the privilege of citizenship. In this, new world order, the children of Israel will furnish all the leaders without encountering opposition. The governments of the different peoples forming the world republic will fall without difficulty into the hands of the Jews. It will then be possible for the Jewish rulers to abolish private property, and everywhere to make use of the resources of the state. Thus will the promise of the Talmud be fulfilled, in which is said that when the messianic time is come, the Jews will have all the property of the whole world in their hands. 1929. In April, Rothschild. Paul Warburg sends out a secret warning to his friends that a collapse and nationwide depression has been planned for later this year. It is certainly no coincidence that the biographies of all the Wall Street giants of that era, John D. Rockefeller, J. P. Morgan Jr. Joseph Kennedy, Bernard Baruch, et al., all marvel at the fact these people got out of the stock market completely just before the crash and put their assets into cash or gold. So, as all the bankers and their friends already knew, in August the Federal Reserve began to tighten the money supply. And on October 24, the big New York bankers called in their 24-hour broker call loans. This meant that both the stockbrokers and their customers had to dump their stocks on the stock market to cover their loans, irrespective of what price they had to sell them for. As a result of this the stock market crashed, a day that would go down in history as, Black Thursday. In his book, The Great Crash 1929, John Kenneth Galbraith makes the following shocking statement at the height of the selling frenzy Bernard Baruch brought Winston Churchill into the visitors gallery of the New York Stock Exchange to witness the panic and impress him with his power over the wild events on the floor. Republican Congressman Louis T. McFadden, chairman of the House Banking and Currency Committee, from 1920 to 1931, who was a staunch critic of the Jewish bankers is quite candid as to who was responsible when he states of this crash it was not accidental. It was a carefully contrived occurrence. The international bankers sought to bring about a condition of despair here so that they might emerge as rulers of us all. Despite the claims of how the Federal Reserve would protect the country against depressions and inflation, they continued to further contract the money supply. Between 1929 and 1933, they would reduce the money supply by an additional 33%. Even Milton Friedman, the Nobel Peace Prize winning economist stated the following in a radio interview in January 1996 the Federal Reserve definitely caused the Great Depression by contracting the amount of currency in circulation by one third from 1929 to 1933. In only a few weeks from the day of the crash, three billion dollars of wealth vanished. Within a year, forty billion dollars of wealth vanished. However, it did not simply disappear. It just ended up consolidated in fewer and fewer hands, as was planned. An example of this is Joseph P. Kennedy, John F. Kennedy's father. In 1929 he was worth four million dollars, in 1935 following the greatest depression in America's history, that had increased to over 100 million dollars. 
This is why depressions are caused. To take money out of the hands of the many for the benefit of a few. On this occasion the money would be largely spent overseas, as whilst this great depression was occurring, millions of American dollars was being spent on rebuilding Germany from damage sustained during World War I, in preparation for the Rothschilds next war, World War II. Republican Louis T. McFadden, Chairman of the House Banking and Currency Committee from 1920 to 1931, would state the following in relation to this after World War I, Germany fell into the hands of the German international bankers. Those bankers bought her and now they own her, lock, stock, and barrel. They have purchased her industries, they have mortgages on her soil, they control her production, they control all her public utilities. The international German bankers have subsidized the present government of Germany and they have also supplied every dollar of the money Adolf Hitler has used in his lavish campaign to build up a threat to the government of Bruning. When Bruning fails to obey the orders of the German international bankers, Hitler is brought forth to scare the Germans into submission. Through the Federal Reserve Board over 30 billion of dollars of American money has been pumped into Germany. You have all heard of the spending that has taken place in Germany? Modernistic dwellings, her great planetariums, her gymnasiums, her swimming pools, her fine public highways, her perfect factories. All this was done on our money. All this was given to Germany through the Federal Reserve Board. The Federal Reserve Board has pumped so many billions of dollars into Germany that they dare not name the total. Interestingly, the money pumped into Germany to build her up in preparation for World War II, is into the German Nissen banks which are affiliated with the Rothschild controlled Harriman interest in New York. 1930. This year, 33 years after the First World Zionist Congress was held in Baal, Switzerland, the first Rothschild World Bank, the Bank for International Settlements, BIS, is established in the same place, Baal, Switzerland. It is established by Charles G. Dawes, Rothschild agent and vice president under President Calvin Coolidge from 1925 to 1929, O&D. Young, Rothschild agent, founder of a car and chairman of General Electric from 1922 until 1939, and Jamar Schacht of Germany, President of the Reichsbank. The BIS is referred to by the bankers as the Central Bank for the Central Banks. To put this bank into perspective today, whereas the International Monetary Fund, IMF, and the World Bank deal with governments, the BIS deals only with other central banks. All its meetings are held in secret and involve the top central bankers from around the world. For example, the former head of the Federal Reserve, Alan Greenspan would go to the BIS headquarters in Basel, Switzerland, ten times a year for these private meetings. The BIS also has the status of a sovereign power and is immune from governmental control. A summary of this immunity is listed below. 1. Diplomatic immunity for persons and what they carry with them, that is diplomatic pouches. 2. No taxation on any transactions, including salaries paid to employees. 3. Embassy type immunity for all buildings and slash or offices operated by the BIS worldwide including China and Mexico. 4. No oversight or knowledge of operations by any government authority, they are not audited. 5. Freedom from immigration restrictions. 6. Freedom to encrypt any and all communications of any sort. 7. Freedom from any legal jurisdiction, they even have their own police force. Georgetown professor and historian, Carol Quigley, commented on the creation of this central bank in his 1975 book, Tragedy and Hope, as follows the powers of financial capitalism had, a, far-reaching, plan, nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. 
This system was to be controlled in a feudalist fashion by the central banks of the world acting in concert, by secret agreements arrived at in frequent meetings and conferences. The apex of the system was to be the Bank for International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland, a private bank owned and controlled by the world's central banks which were themselves private corporations. Each central bank sought to dominate its government by its ability to control treasury loans, to manipulate foreign exchanges, to influence the level of economic activity in the country, and to influence cooperative politicians by subsequent economic rewards in the business world. A handful of United States senators led by Henry Cabot Lodge, would fight to keep the United States out of the bank for international settlements. However, even though the United States rejected this world central bank, the Federal Reserve still sent members to participate in its meetings in Switzerland, right up until 1994 when the United States was, officially, dragged into it. 1931 This year United States State Department papers come to light of the following. In 1917 during the Russian Revolution, M. Dendijk, the Netherlands minister in Russia at the time, informed various governments including Britain, France and the United States of the danger of communism which he identified as overtly Jewish, when he sent them a communique, a segment of which states the danger is now so great that I feel it my duty to call the attention of the British and all other governments to the fact that if an end is not put to Bolshevism in Russia at once the civilization of the whole world will be threatened. This is not an exaggeration. I consider that the immediate suppression of Bolshevism is the greatest issue now before the world, not even excluding the war which is still raging and unless as above stated Bolshevism is nipped in the bud immediately it is bound to spread in one form or another over Europe and the whole world as it is organized and worked by Jews who have no nationality and whose one object is to destroy for their own ends the existing order of things. Prominent member of the Jewish Alliance Israelite Universal, Jeanne Zulet, states this year the meaning of the history of the last century is that today 300 Jewish financiers, all masters of lodges, rule the world. 1933. On January 30th, Adolf Hitler becomes Chancellor of Germany. He expels the Jews as communists, out of all governmental positions within Germany. Interestingly, at the time the number of Jews in Germany's government was over 20 times those in their government since the end of World War I. As a result of this expulsion, in July, the Jews hold a world conference in Amsterdam during which they demand that Hitler reinstate every Jew back to his former position. Hitler refuses and as a result of this, Samuel Untermeyer, the Ashkenazi Jew who blackmailed President Wilson, and is now the head of the American delegation and the president of the whole conference, returns to the United States, and makes a speech on radio which was transcribed in the New York Times, on, Monday, August 7, 1933. In the speech he made the following statements The Jews are the aristocrats of the world. Our campaign is the economic boycott against all German goods, shipping and services. What we are proposing is to prosecute a purely defensive economic boycott that will undermine the Hitler regime and bring the German people to their senses by destroying their export trade on which their very existence depends. Each of you, Jew and Gentile alike, must refuse to deal with any merchant or shopkeeper who sells any German-made goods or who patronizes German ships or shipping. Two-thirds of Germany's food supply would have to be imported, and could only be imported with the proceeds of what they exported, so if Germany could not export, two-thirds of Germany's population would starve, as there would be not enough food for more than one-third of the population. Nevertheless, Jews throughout America participate in this boycott, protesting outside and damaging any stores in which they found any products with, made in Germany, printed on them, causing stores to have to dump these products or risk bankruptcy. Once the effects of this boycott began to be felt in Germany, 
the Germans began boycotting Jewish stores in the same way the Jews had done to stores selling German products in America. The Nazis and the Jews in Palestine collaborate, as they would for the next seven years. This is because they essentially wanted the same thing. The Jews in Palestine wanted all the Jews to live in Palestine and the Nazis wanted all Jews out of Germany. Both sides therefore sign a transfer agreement known as, Havara, which permitted the transfer of Jews and all their capital from Germany to Palestine. As a result of this agreement, 60,000, approx 20% of Germany's Jews, emigrate to Palestine, and make up 15% of the Jewish population thereby 1,939. They take with them $40 million of assets, worth approximately $600 million today, with the blessing of the Nazi regime. According to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum by September 1939, approximately 282,000 Jews had left Germany and 117,000 from annexed Austria. Of these, some 95,000 emigrated to the United States, 60,000 to Palestine, 40,000 to Great Britain, and about 75,000 to Central and South America, with the largest numbers entering Argentina, Brazil, Chile, and Bolivia. More than 18,000 Jews from the German Reich were also able to find refuge in Shanghai, in Japanese-occupied China. At the end of 1939, about 202,000 Jews remained in Germany and 57,000 in annexed Austria, many of them elderly. Interestingly all of these Jews who left Germany voluntarily before the Second World War even started, will go on to be known as Holocaust survivors, and entitled to reparation payments following the end of the Second World War. This is because the definition of a Holocaust survivor is as follows any Jew who lived in a country at the time when it was 1. Under Nazi regime, 2. Under Nazi occupation, or 3. Under regime of Nazi collaborators as well as any Jew who fled due to the above regime or occupation. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, a Sephardic crypto-Jew, real name Rosenfeld, orders the all-seeing eye to be placed upon all new dollar bills along with the motto, Novus Ordo Seclorum. This is Latin for, a new order of the ages, or as more commonly stated today, New World Order. Furthermore, on November 16, President Roosevelt recognizes the Bolshevik regime of Stalin in Russia without consultation with Congress while 8,000 Ukrainians march in protest in New York. Roosevelt would never admit his Jewish ancestry, but he would go further than most. In the New York Times of March 14, 1935, he is quoted with the following statement in the distant past My ancestors may have been Jews. All I know about the origin of the Roosevelt family is that they are apparently descendants of Claes Martens and Van Roosevelt who came from Holland. In his book, From Pharaoh to Hitler, What is a Jew? Jewish author, Bernard Joseph Brown, admits that since the Jews of today are not Israelites, they have no claim to the land of Palestine. On May 11, Haim Nachman Bialik, a Jewish poet, widely recognized as Israel's national poet, in an address given to Jews at the Jewish University in Jerusalem, states not in vain have Jews been drawn to journalism. In their hands it became a mighty weapon highly fitted to meet their needs in their war of survival. 1934. In January, staunch Zionist, Vladimir Jabotinsky gives an update on Samuel Untermeyer's boycott of Germany when he makes the following statement The fight against Germany has now been waged for months by every Jewish community, on every conference, in all labor unions and by every single Jew in the world. There are reasons for the assumption that our share of this fight is of general importance. We shall start a spiritual and material war of the whole world against Germany. Germany is striving to become once again a great nation and to recover her lost territories as well as her colonies. But our Jewish interests call for the complete destruction of Germany. Collectively and individually, the German nation is a threat to us Jews. 
Swiss banking's secrecy laws are reformed and it becomes an offence resulting in imprisonment for any bank employee to violate bank's secrecy. This is all in preparation for the Rothschild engineered Second World War in which as usual they will fund both sides. In its June 20th issue, New Britain Magazine of London, publishes a statement made by former British Prime Minister David Lloyd George in which he states that Britain is the slave of an international financial bloc. The article also contains the following words written by Lord Bryce Democracy has no more persistent and insidious foe than money power. Questions regarding Bank of England, its conduct and its objects, are not allowed by the Speaker, of the House of Commons. In his book, Jews Must Live, published this year, Jewish writer, Samuel Roth states of the Jews our major vice of old, as of today, is parasitism. We are a people of vultures living on the labor and the good nature of the rest of the world. But, despite our faults, we would never have done so much damage to the world if it had not been for our genius for evil leadership. Granted our parasitism. Edmund de Roth's child dies. 1935. Between 1930 and 1935. Elizabeth Dunn publishes her four-volume set, Documents Illustrative of the History of the Slave Trade to America. This shows that Jews totally dominated the trade in African slaves to America and at least 15 of the ships used to transport the slaves were owned by Jews, some of whom had clear and close ties to the Rothschilds. In order to deceive the authorities that no Jews were involved, they often would use an all-Gentile crew and captain. On November 6, Mao Zedong states all political power comes from the barrel of a gun. The Communist Party must command all the guns, that way, no guns can ever be used to command the party. Subsequently from 1948 to 1952, 20 million political dissidents are rounded up and exterminated as they are unable to defend themselves from the Communists and China due to Mao Zedong's gun control laws. 1936. With regard to the increase in anti-Semitism in Germany, Samuel Landman, at the time, Secretary to the World Zionist Organization, in his 1936 book, Great Britain, the Jews, and Palestine, states the following of the United States entry into World War I the fact that it was Jewish help that brought USA into the war on the side of the Allies has rankled ever since in German, especially Nazi, minds, and has contributed in no small measure to the prominence which anti-Semitism occupies in the Nazi program. On October 3rd, Republican Congressman, Louis T. McFadden, Chairman of the House Banking and Currency Committee, from 1920 to 1931, is poisoned to death. This is the third assassination attempt on his life, he had suffered an earlier poisoning and had had shots fired at him. McFadden had been one of the staunchest critics of the Federal Reserve and the Jewish criminal cabal behind it. 1937. In his book, Stalin, Trotsky, or Lenin, George Marlin states if the tide of history does not turn toward communist internationalism, then the Jewish race is doomed. In other words he's saying that the Jews are totally in charge of communist internationalism, and if the world does not turn to a new world order of Jewish communist internationalism, then the Jewish race is doomed. Interestingly, internationalism is an early incarnation of globalization. Another writer, William Joyce, an Englishman, so disgusted with Britain's subservience to the Jews that he would defect to Germany just before World War II, and broadcast a radio program from there trying to wake up the British people to the enemy in their midst, stated this year Britain and Germany, particularly with the assistance of Italy, can form against Bolshevism and international finance, twin Jewish manifestations, a bulwark much too strong to invite attack. International finance is controlled by great Jewish money lenders and communism is being propagated by Jewish agitators who are at one fundamentally with the powerful capitalists of their race in desiring an international world order, which would, of course, 
give universal sovereignty to the only international race in existence. Indeed, on February 4, renowned historian, Hilaire Belloc, makes the following statement in G. K. Weekly The propaganda of communism throughout the world, in organization and direction is in the hands of Jewish agents. As a for anyone who does not know that the Bolshevist movement in Russia is Jewish, I can only say that he must be a man who is taken in by the suppression of our deplorable press. This year, Professor Ray Kulisha, a Jew, calls for the genocide of all Germans to be the priority of worldwide Jewry when he states Germany is the enemy of Judaism and must be pursued with deadly hatred. The goal of Judaism today is a merciless campaign against all German peoples and the complete destruction of the nation. We demand a complete blockade of trade, the importation of raw materials stopped and retaliation towards every German, woman and child. On April 28 in an article published in the Daily Express, 27-year-old Lord Victor Rothschild also demonstrates how prophetic he is when asked by reporter, W. Hickey, where he intended to live when the lease on his Piccadilly home ran out. He replied nowhere probably, I just don't know. Not till after the war anyway. It would be two and a half years before World War II would start, yet, naturally, he already knew the war was coming. On October 30, Rear Admiral Henry Hamilton Beamish, stated the following to an assembly in New York in 1848 the word anti-Semitic, was invented by the Jews to prevent the use of the word, Jew. The right word for them is, Jew. I implore all of you to be accurate, call them Jews. There is no need to be delicate on this Jewish question. You must face them in this country. The Jew should be satisfied here. I was here 47 years ago, your doors were thrown open to the Jews and they were free. Now he has got you absolutely by the throat, that is your reward. 1938. On January 1st, Nesta Webster publishes her book, Germany and England, in which she states England is no longer controlled by Britons. We are under the invisible Jewish dictatorship, a dictatorship that can be felt in every sphere of life. On November 7th, a Jew, Herschel Grinspan, assassinates Ernst Vomt, a minor official at the German embassy in Paris. In December, Sir Oswald Mosley makes the following revealing statement on the allegation that the Jews are being persecuted in Germany supposing that every allegation were true. Supposing it was a fact that a minority in Germany were being treated as the papers allege, was that any reason for millions in Britain to lose their lives in a war with Germany? How many minorities had been badly treated in how many countries since the war without any protest from press or politicians? Why was it only when Jews were the people affected that we had any demand for war with the country concerned? There was only one answer. That today Jewish finance controlled the press and political system of Britain. If you criticize a Jew at home then jail threatens you. If others touch a Jew abroad, then war threatens them. Rabbi Stephen Wise, the president of both the American Jewish Congress and the World Jewish Congress puts forward his expectations of the Jews' loyalty to his country of domicile when he makes the following statement to a rally in New York I am not an American citizen of the Jewish faith. I am a Jew. I am an American. I have been an American for 63 64 of my life, but I have been a Jew for 4,000 years. Hitler was right in one thing. He calls the Jewish people a race and we are a race. 1939. I.G. Farben the leading producer of chemicals in the world and largest German producer of steel dramatically increases its production. This increased production is almost exclusively used to arm Germany for World War II. This company is controlled by the Rothschilds and goes on to use Jews and other disaffected peoples as slave labor in concentration camps. Interestingly, I.G. Farben also created Zyklon Begas that it will be alleged was used to exterminate Jews. In Germany, 
Hitler had been doing phenomenally well in turning his country around economically ever since he came to power. He did this by breaking with the Jewish international bankers, and trading by barter, thus bartering the surplus of goods Germany had, with the surplus of goods Germany needed that another country had, without debts being incurred on either side. He, like Abraham Lincoln before him, simply issued what money was needed on the authority of the German government, which was backed by the productivity of the German labor force, and not the empty promises of Jewish international bankers, who in a country without debt, could not function. As a result of this policy, Germany was able to regenerate the social and spiritual life of all its citizens. Put simply, when you are able to help your people, the people in turn help you as they are of course happy because they are being respected, and are thus able to respect themselves. As a result of a Germany being run for the benefit of the Germans as opposed to for the benefit of Jewish bankers, the citizens of Germany were able to make Germany the most powerful and prosperous state in Europe in only a seven year period. An example of how Hitler achieved this is recorded in William Galey Simpson's 1978 book, Which Way Western Man? in which he states the German peasant, who had been on the verge of utter ruin, was given an honored status as the source of the nation's food supply, his land was released from the grip of the Jewish usurer and measures taken to ensure that it should, remain permanently in the possession of one family, handed down from father to son. The Jews could not let this continue as they knew that it would spell the death of their debt-driven money system and so World War II starts this year, in earnest. This war is about one thing, which money system would survive. This is not a war between Germany and the Allies, it is a war between Germany and the Jewish money power who are in control of the Allied leadership and use them and their media to propagandize the Allied populace into hatred of the Germans. On May 22, Anthony Crossley, Conservative MP for Oldham, makes the following statement in the House of Commons in relation to the plight of the Arabs as a result of Jewish persecution of the Arabs, in Palestine I do not believe that there has ever been a debate in this house, when this house would have been more justified in calling to the bar an Arab speaker to explain the Arab point of view from the viewpoint of his own countrymen and his own country. There are no Arab members of parliament. There are no Arab constituents to bring influence to bear upon their members of parliament. There is no Arab control of newspapers in this country. It is impossible almost to get a pro-Arab letter into the Times. There are in the city no Arab financial houses who control large amounts of finance. There is no Arab control of newspaper advertisements in this country. There are no Arab ex-colonial secretaries who one by one get up and thunder as they will, at the government during the debate, because of the mistakes they themselves have made in the past. Finally, and I want the colonial secretary to pay special attention to this point, tomorrow night there is to be a broadcast. There is to be himself giving the government point of view. There is to be the honorable member for the Don Valley to advance what is obviously the Zionist point of view. There is to be the honorable member for Carnarvon Burroughs supporting the Zionist point of view. There will not be a supporter of the Arabs who can advance their point of view. On August 15, less than three months later, Anthony Crossley will be killed in action off the coast of Denmark, having joined the British armed forces soon after the outbreak of World War II. 1940. Hans Jürgen Kohler in his book, Inside the Gestapo, states the following, of Maria Anna Gruber, Adolf Hitler's grandmother a little servant girl dot 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 came to Vienna and became a domestic servant dot 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 at the Rothschild mansion dot 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 and Hitler's unknown grandfather must be probably looked for in this magnificent house. This is reiterated by Walter Langer in his book, The Mind of Hitler, in which he states Adolf's father, our Hitler, was the illegitimate son of Maria Anna Gruber. Maria Anna Gruber was living in Vienna at the time she conceived. At that time she was employed as a servant in the home of Baron Roth's child. As soon as the family discovered her pregnancy she was sent back home. where Awa was born. 
The idea that Hitler could have been a Rothschild illegitimate seems ridiculous, however it cannot be denied that one of Hitler's major successes had been the emigration of Jews to Palestine, something which was also one of the Rothschild's main aims. The Rothschilds knew that a country without a population would be meaningless. Furthermore, the propaganda the Jews got out of the Second World War advanced the Rothschilds program of Jewish supremacism more significantly than any other event in history. This year William Joyce, living in self-imposed exile in Germany publishes his book, Twilight Over England, in which he states of the Jewish character adamantine materialism, a flair for assuming mysticism outwardly, a supreme contempt for other races a complete disregard for other people's rights, cleverness in imitation and improvisation, contempt for all labor not associated with high profits, great energy in the cause of money making, a hatred of all nationalism but their own, a high degree of loyalty to their own family and their own community, an implicit faith in the power to corrupt Gentiles, a brilliant capacity for intrigue and a pathetic inability to keep pace with any deeper thought or higher idealism are the chief characteristics of the Jewish race. On all these attributes, volumes could be written, but it should suffice to express the resultant of these forces very simply in the following tendencies. 1. An inability to avoid forming a state within a state. 2. Complete inability to view their Gentile hosts as possessing equal rights with their own. 3. Predetermined specialization in all those processes which bring high profit. Hence, in capitalism, almost exclusive preoccupation with finance, distribution, and exchange as distinct from productive industry. Professional work undertaken either for profit or for the sake of social advancement. 4. A natural tendency to utilize social and economic advancement for the purpose of gaining political power. 5. An unholy dread of nationalism as a factor which would draw attention to their racial nature and expose their operations. 6. The deliberate debasement of the standards of culture in the land of their sojourn. 7. The elimination by competition of the Aryan who merely wants to get enough for himself and not more than anybody else. These resultants seem to manifest themselves in every land that the Jew inhabits. 1941. President Roosevelt takes America into the Second World War by refusing to sell Japan any more steel scrap or oil. Japan is in the midst of a war against China and without that scrap steel and oil, Japan knows they will be unable to continue that war. Roosevelt in turn knows this economic boycott would provoke the Japanese to attack America, which they subsequently did at Pearl Harbor. Interestingly, back in 1939, President Roosevelt tried his hardest to railroad the United States into the war in Europe to accommodate the Jews in the United States, and the world, but when that failed he knew he would have to try a different tactic. That was, of course, what happened at Pearl Harbor. Sir Josiah Stamp, director of the Bank of England during the years 1928 to 1941, makes the following statement with regard to banking the modern banking system manufactures money out of nothing. The process is perhaps the most astounding piece of sleight of hand that was ever invented. Banking was conceived in iniquity and born in sin. Bankers own the earth. Take it away from them, but leave them the power to create money, and with the flick of the pen they will create enough money to buy it back again. Take this great power away from them and all great fortunes like mine will disappear, and they ought to disappear, for then this would be a better and happier world to live in. But if you want to continue to be slaves of the banks and pay the cost of your own slavery, then let bankers continue to create money and control credit. 1942. Prescott Bush, father and grandfather of future American presidents George Herbert Walker and George W. respectively, has his company seized under the, Trading with the Enemy, Act. He had been funding Hitler from America, whilst American soldiers were being killed by German soldiers. Interestingly the Anti-Defamation League, ADL, 
never criticizes any of the Bush family for this. On May 8, the Jewish Chronicle runs an editorial in which they state boastfully we have been at war with Hitler since the first day that he gained power. Indeed, on December 3, Shane Wiseman, President of the World Jewish Congress, makes the following statement in New York We are not denying and we are not afraid to confess, this war is our war and that it is waged for the liberation of Jewry. Stronger than all fronts together is our front, that of Jewry. We are not only giving this war our financial support on which the entire war production is based. We are not only providing our full propaganda power which is the moral energy that keeps this war going. The guarantee of victory is predominantly based on weakening the enemy forces, on destroying them within their own country, within the resistance. And we are the Trojan horse in the enemy's fortress. Thousands of Jews living in Europe constitute the principal factor in the destruction of our enemy. There, our front is a fact and the most valuable aid for victory. Leonard Goldenson founds the ABC television network and is president overseas ABC's success. 1943. February 18, Zionist, Isaac Greenbaum, head of the Jewish Agency Rescue Committee, in a speech to the Zionist Executive Council states if I am asked, could you give from the R, uh, United Jewish Appeal, monies to rescue Jews, I say, no and I say again no. He goes on to state one cow in Palestine is worth more than all the Jews in Poland. This is not a surprise, as Zionism and Nazism had similar aims. They both wanted the Jews out of Germany. However, the Zionists were not interested in any Jews that didn't want to go to Palestine and thought it would be more beneficial to ensure these Jews be placed in concentration camps, in order to frighten Jews worldwide into fleeing to Palestine, which they touted as the only state where they could be safe. 1944. On November 6, Lord Moyne, British minister resident in the Middle East is assassinated in Cairo by two members of the Jewish terrorist group, the Stern Gang, led by future Prime Minister of Israel, Yitzhak Shamir. He is also responsible for an assassination attempt against Harold McMichael, the High Commissioner of the British Mandate of Palestine, this same year. Interestingly he also masterminds another successful assassination this year against the United Nations representative in the Middle East, Count Folk Bernadou, although he had secured the release of 21,000 prisoners from German camps during World War II, was seen by Yitzhak Shamir and his terrorist collaborators as an anti-Zionist. In Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, the International Monetary Fund, IMF and the World Bank, initially called the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development or IBIRD, the name, World Bank, was not actually adopted until 1975, are approved with full United States participation. The principal architects of the Bretton Woods system, and hence the IMF, are Harry Dexter White and John Maynard Gaines. Interestingly Harry Dexter White who died in 1946, would be identified as a Soviet spy whose code name was, Jurist, on October 16, 1950, in an FBI memo and as for John Maynard Gaines, he is British. What the IMF and World Bank essentially did, was repeat on a world scale what the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 had established in the United States. They created a banking cartel comprising the world's privately owned central banks, which gradually assumed the power to dictate credit policies to the banks of all nations. In the same way the Federal Reserve Act authorized the creation of a new national fiat currency called, Federal Reserve Notes, the IMF has been given the authority to issue a world fiat money called, Special Drawing Rights, or SDRs. Member nations would end up being pressured into making their currencies fully exchangeable for SDRs. The IMF is controlled by its board of governors, which are either the heads of different central banks, or the heads of the various national treasury departments who are dominated by their central banks. Also, 
the voting power in the IMF gives the United States and the United Kingdom, the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England, effective overall control of it. 1945. On July 16, the first successful test of the atomic bomb occurs at the Trinity site, 200 miles south of Los Alamos. Its creator, J. Robert Oppenheimer, a Rothschild, states in Wonder I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. He is right, within the month, subsequent detonations over Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan, result in the deaths of 140,000 people in Hiroshima and 80,000 in Nagasaki. The End of World War II. It is reported that the Rothschild controlled IG. Farben plants were specifically not targeted in the bombing raids on Germany. Interestingly at the end of the war, whilst parts of Germany lay in ruins, they were found to have only sustained 15% damage. The tribunals held at the end of the Second World War, to investigate Nazi war crimes, censor any materials recording Western assistance to Hitler, such as that of Prescott Bush. The Rothschilds take a giant step towards their goal of world domination when their third overt attempt at world government, the second, League of Nations, which is called the, United Nations, is approved this year. 1946. On January 3rd, William Joyce is executed. As he awaits his execution he makes his last statement in death as in this life. I defy the Jews who caused this last war, and I defy the power of darkness which they represent. I warn the British people against the aggressive imperialism of the Soviet Union. May Britain be great once again, and, in the hour of the greatest danger to the West, may the standard of the Hagenkratz, swastika, be raised from the dust, crowned with the historic words, Ihabt Dutch Jesegt you have actually won. I am proud to die for my ideals, and I am sorry for the sons of Britain who have died without knowing why. On February 12th, the British security services receive a telegram from a reliable source in Palestine claiming that the Stern Gang are training members to go to England to assassinate members of His Majesty's government, especially Mr. Bevin, British Foreign Minister Ernest Bevin. On July 22nd, the future Prime Minister of Israel, Ashkenazi Jew, David Ben Gurion, orders another future Prime Minister of Israel, Ashkenazi Jew, Menachem Begin, to carry out a terrorist attack on the King David Hotel in Palestine, to try and drive out the British. As a result of this, 91 people are killed, most of them civilians, 41 Arabs, 28 British, 17 Jews, and 5 others. Around 45 people are injured. When he was asked by prominent journalist, Russell Warren how, if he considered himself the father of terrorism in the Middle East, Menachem Begin proudly replied no, in the entire whole world. Sixty years later on July 22, 2006 another future Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu together with many other Israeli government representatives, dedicate a plaque at the site of this terrorist atrocity which cites the bombers as freedom fighters to be admired by Israel. Just to put the gravity of the attack on the King David Hotel into perspective, it was at the time the biggest death toll as a result of single terrorist action ever and was only surpassed nearly 40 years later by the bombing of the United States barracks in Beirut in 1982. The Bank of England is nationalized which means that the state acquired all the shares in the Bank of England which now belong to the Treasury and are held in trust by the Treasury solicitor. However, as the government has no money to pay for the shares, they give the current secret shareholders of the Bank of England, government stocks instead of money for their shares. This means that although the state now receives the operating profits of the bank, this gain is largely offset by the fact that the government now has to pay interest on the new stocks it has issued to pay for the shares. So, although the Bank of England is now state-owned, the fact is that the British money supply is still almost entirely in private hands, with 97% of it being in the form of interest-bearing loans of one sort or another, created by private commercial banks.
As a result of this, the bank is largely controlled and run by those from the world of commercial banking and conventional economics. The members of the Court of Directors, who set policy and oversee its functions, are drawn almost entirely from the world of banks, insurance, economists and big business, and of course a Rothschild continues to sit on its board. Although the Bank of England is called a central bank it is now essentially a regulatory body that supports and oversees the existing system. It is sometimes referred to as, the lender of last resort, insofar as one of its functions as the banker's bank is to support any bank or financial institution that gets into difficulties and suffers a run on its liquid assets. Interestingly, in these circumstances, it is not obliged to disclose details of any such measures, the reason being so as to avoid a crisis in confidence. 1947. The British who prior to World War II declared that there would be no more immigration of Jews to Palestine in order to protect the Palestinians from their acts of terror against both them and British soldiers, transfer control of Palestine to the United Nations. The United Nations resolved to have Palestine partitioned into two states, one Jewish and one Arab, with Jerusalem to remain as an international zone to be enjoyed by all religious faiths. This transfer is scheduled to take place on May 15, 1948. However, just to put into perspective who controls the United Nations, on, please be aware that the UN had no right to give Arab property to anyone, as indeed even though the Jews owned only 6% of Palestine at the time, Resolution 181 granted the Jews 57% of the land leaving the Arabs who at that time had 94% with only 43%. Terror attacks against the British in Palestine continued. In fact during the summer, three Jewish terrorists, Jacob Weiss, Mrnakar, and Avshalom Habib found guilty of an attack on Acre Jail on May 4 were to be hanged. At the same time, the airgun terrorist gang headed by future Prime Minister, Menek and Begin, were holding two British sergeants, Mervyn Pps and Clifford Martin, as hostages for the three Jewish terrorists. Indeed Begin stated we will hang the British sergeants at exactly the same time as our men die. The executions of the Jewish terrorists took place, and the British sergeants were found executed also hanging from to eucalyptus trees. Captain D. H. Galati of 23rd Field Squadron, Royal Engineers, cut down one of the bodies only to be seriously injured by an explosion. Unsatisfied with killing these British soldiers, the Jews had booby-trapped their corpses. Interestingly, a popular British newspaper, the Daily Express, carried as their lead story a large picture of these soldiers strung up in the trees, but this front page has now been deleted from the Daily Express archives. The owner of the Daily Express, Richard Desmond, a Jewish pornographer. Information collected by the Anti-Defamation League, ad, in its spy operations on United States citizens is used by the House Select Committee on Un-American Activities. Subcommittee Chair, Claire Hoffman dismisses the Edel's reports on suspected communists as hearsay. In October, Ashkenazi Jew, Albert Einstein, writes an open letter to the United Nations encouraging all national governments to be destroyed to make way for a one-world government to be run by the UN. In his diary of July 21, President Harry S. Truman makes the following entry The Jews have no sense of proportion, nor do they have any judgment on world affairs. The Jews, I find, are very, very selfish. They care not how many Estonians, Latvians, Finns, Poles, Yugoslavs or Greeks get murdered or mistreated as, post-war, displaced persons as long as the Jews get special treatment. Yet when they have power, physical, financial or political, neither Hitler nor Stalin has anything on them for cruelty or mistreatment to the underdog. 1948. In the spring of this year, the Rothschilds bribe President Harry S. Truman, 33rd President of the United States 1945, 1953, 
to recognize Israel as a sovereign state with $2 million which they give to him on his campaign train. At midnight on May 14, the State of Israel is officially, proclaimed, in Tel Aviv. Eleven minutes later President Truman declares the United States as the first foreign nation to recognize it. Truman later confides to friends that he wanted to recognize the Jewish state in their first hour of its birth, yet when pressed by journalists on this subject, he refuses to discuss his pro-Jewish stance any further. The flag of Israel is unveiled. The emblem on the flag is a blue-colored version of the Rothschild, red hexagram. It has a blue border at the top and the bottom which represents the Nile and Euphrates rivers. This is put there to make the Jewish territorial ambitions very clear, and Israel in accordance with its biblical borders. This would of course mean the inclusion into Israel of, Iraq, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, and parts of Saudi Arabia. This use of the Rothschild hexagram is disguised as it is referred to in the Rothschild media as a, Star of David. However, it is clear to anyone with knowledge of esoteric symbolism that this hexagram was used in the ancient mystery religions as the symbol of, Mush, described as a demon of unwilling sacrifice and is also interestingly the name of the stone owl, the elite worship at Bohemian Grove, and, Astaroth, described as the Lord Treasurer of Hell. Due to the fact it is made up of six lines, has six triangular sectors and six points, it is commonly regarded as a symbol of Satan. Interestingly, the hexagram is also used to represent Saturn, which has been identified as the esoteric name for, Satan. Would this not indicate that anyone killed in the name of Israel is actually a sacrifice to their god, Satan? Furthermore, the Jewish Sabbath is on Saturday, which was originally known as Saturn's Day. So, to recap, the hexagram on the Israeli flag represents the number of the beast 666, it is an ancient representation of Satan, also known as Saturn, and the Jewish weekly religious day is Saturn's day. In the early hours of April 19, 132 Jewish terrorists from the Agon Gang, led by future Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin, and the Stern Gang, led by future Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Shamir, brutally massacre 200 men, women and children as they are sleeping peacefully in the Arab village of Deir Yassin. In an effort to prevent outside observers discovering the brutality of their war crimes, they try to burn some of the bodies, but when that proves unsatisfactory, they stuff some in a well to hide them from the Red Cross representatives who arrive on the scene the next day and would subsequently tell the world. Indeed reports from survivors can be found in the, Report of the Criminal Investigation Division, a Palestine government document labeled, No. 179-110-17-G S dated April 13th, 15th, and 16th, 1948, in which British interrogating officer, Assistant Inspector General Richard Catling states the recording of statements is hampered also by the hysterical state of the women, who often break down many times, whilst the statement is being recorded. There is, however, no doubt that many sexual atrocities were committed by the attacking Jews. Many young schoolgirls were raped and later slaughtered. Old women were also molested. One story is current concerning a case in which a young girl was literally torn in two. Many infants were butchered and killed. I also saw one old woman who gave her age as 104, who had been severely beaten about the head with rifle butts. Women had bracelets torn from their arms and rings from their fingers, and parts of some women's ears were severed in order to remove ear rings. As a result of this the Jews go on to detest the Red Cross which is why, in the future, they always block them entering any territory in which they are involved in conflict, for as long as possible, to give them time to clean up evidence of their criminal acts. Following the United Nations transfer of Palestine to an independent Jewish state and an independent Arab state on May 15, the Israelis launch another military assault on the Arabs, today known as Palestinians, with blaring loudspeakers on their trucks informing the Arabs that if they do not flee immediately, they will be slaughtered. 
800,000 Arabs with the recent memory of the day of Yasin massacre at the forefront of their minds, flee in panic. They ask for help from neighboring Arab states, but those states do not get involved as they are no match for the Israelis whose up-to-date military hardware had been supplied by the Jewish Stalinist regime in Russia. Following this series of Jewish genocidal war crimes, the Jews now control 78% of the former Palestine as opposed to the 57% that had already been given to them illegally by the Jewish-controlled United Nations. The Arabs, many of them Christians, would never be paid compensation for their homes, property and businesses stolen from them during this genocide, and as a result these people end up in slum refugee cities of tents. Furthermore at least half of the Arabs, in a desperate hurry to flee with their lives, leave their birth certificates behind. The State of Israel then passed a law that only those Arabs who are able to prove their citizenship are allowed to return to their land, now known as Israel, which meant these 400,000 Arabs could not return and lost all the property they had left there. Ashkenazi Jew David Ben-Gurion, one of the father founders of Israel and its first prime minister, candidly describes Jewish aims in his diary entry of May 21 as follows The Achilles heel of the Arab coalition is the Lebanon. Muslim supremacy in this country is artificial and can easily be overthrown. A Christian state ought to be set up there, with its southern frontier on the river Litani. We would sign a treaty of alliance with this state. Thus when we have broken the strength of the Arab Legion and bombed Amman, we could wipe out Transjordan, after that Syria would fall. And if Egypt still dared to make war on us, we would bomb Port Said, Alexandria and Cairo. We should thus end the war and would have put paid to Egypt, Assyria and Judea on behalf of our ancestors. On October 1st, Commander Anton Muller and his second in command, Camille Lacout, send the following memo from Vienna to all interested parties. Military Police Service Circular Letter No. 31-48. Vienna, 1 October 1948. 10th Dispatch. The Allied Commissions of Inquiry have so far established that no people were killed by poison gas in the following concentration camps, Bergen-Belsen, Buchenwald, Dachau. Flossenburg, Grossrosen, Motorsen and its satellite camps, Natzweiler, Neuengam, Niederhagen, Wolfsburg, Ravensbruck, Sachsenhausen, Stathoff, Thracienstadt. In those cases, it has been possible to prove that confessions had been extracted by torture, and that testimonies were false. This must be taken into account when conducting investigations and interrogations with respect to war crimes. The result of this investigation should be brought to the cognizance of former concentration camp inmates who at the time of the hearings testified about the murder of people, especially Jews, with poison gas in those concentration camps. Should they insist on their statements, charges are to be brought against them for making false statements. On February 3rd, Colin Knickerbocker, reporting in his Society News column in the Hearst Press, which appeared in the New York Journal American, stated on the subject of Rothschild, Jacob Siff today it is estimated by Jacob's grandson, John Siff, a prominent member of New York Society, that the old man sank about $20 million for the final triumph of Bolshevism in Russia. On October 1st, Mao Zedong declares the founding of the People's Republic of China in Tiananmen Square, Beijing. He is funded by Rothschild, created communism in Russia and handled by the following Rothschild agents, Solomon Adler, a former United States Treasury official who was a Soviet spy, Israel Epstein, the son of a Jewish Bolshevik imprisoned by the Tsar in Russia for trying to foment a revolution there, and Frank Co, a leading official of the Rothschild-owned IMF. In December 16 th's Jewish Chronicle, Israeli Prime Minister, David Ben-Gurion, is quoted with the following statement Jerusalem is not the capital of Israel and world Jewry, it aspires to become the spiritual center of the world. 1950 
figures reveal that as planned by the Rothschilds, every nation involved in World War II greatly multiplied their debt, bringing them further and further under Jewish control. Between 1940 and 1950, United States federal debt went from $43 billion to $257 billion, a 598% increase. During that same period Japanese debt increased by 1,348%, French debt increased by 583%, and Canadian debt increased by 417%. James Paul Wapurg appearing before the Senate on 7 February arrogantly states we shall have world government, whether or not we like it. The only question is whether world government will be achieved by conquest or consent. Thus the Rothschilds get to work on their plan for global government which starts with a three-step plan to centralize the economic systems of the entire world. These steps are 1 central bank domination of national economies worldwide. 2. Centralized regional economies through super states such as the European Union, and regional trade unions such as NAFTA. 3. Centralization of the world economy through a world central bank, a world currency and ending national independence through the abolition of all trade tariffs by treaties such as the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade GATT, Israel passes their law of return, guaranteeing every person born of a Jewish mother, throughout the world, the right to dwell in the state of Israel, however the Palestinians, who had lived there for 1,300 years, are denied that right. John David, former chief of the Justice Department's internal security section, notes that the Israeli intelligence service is the second most active in the United States after the Soviets both of which are of course controlled by Jews. 1951. On April 1st, the Israeli secret intelligence agency the Mossad, which will go on to terrorize the world, is formed. The Mossad soon takes control of its American arm, the Anti-Defamation League. The motto of the Mossad is probably the most disturbing secret service motto in the world. It is, by way of deception, thou shalt do war. 1952. Israeli Prime Minister, David Ben-Gurion oversees a project in which a generation of Sephardic Jews in Israel are weeded out from their Ashkenazi counterparts at school and, to avoid suspicion by the parents, these Sephardic children are then taken on, school trips. On these supposed, trips. They actually receive a radiation treatment, purportedly for ringworm infection. At this time, the permitted maximum X-ray dose was 0.5 rad, yet these children received 350 rad, directly to their heads. As a result at least 6,000 die shortly afterwards, with those remaining developing severe conditions such as cancers, epilepsy, and psychosis. Those that are still alive today, and many of their children and grandchildren, are stricken with genetic diseases and malignant tumors. This is an attempt to genocide the Sephardic Jews who are an underclass in Israel and even referred to by many Ashkenazi Jews, as niggers. On April 23rd, during a debate on immigration law, Congressman John Ranking makes the following statement to the House on the subject of the Jews which is recorded in the congressional record they whine about discrimination. Do you know who is being discriminated against? The white Christian people of America, the ones who created this nation. Communism is racial. A racial minority seized control in Russia and in all her satellite countries, such as Poland, Czechoslovakia, and many other countries I could name. They have been run out of practically every country in Europe in the years gone by, and if they keep stirring race trouble in this country and trying to force their communistic program on the Christian people of America, there is no telling what will happen to them here. 1953 Dwight Eisenhower who in the 1915 West Point Military Academy graduating class yearbook, is referred to as a terrible Swedish Jew, is elected President of the United States. 
On June 19, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg are executed in America for espionage. They had been caught supplying secrets regarding atomic bomb manufacture to the Soviet Union, a country they had great affinity for, having met at a young Communist League meeting in America, and also being Jewish, of course. N. M. Rothschild and Sons found the British and Newfoundland Corporation Limited to develop 60,000 square miles of land in Newfoundland, Canada, which comprises a power station to harness the power of the Hamilton, later renamed Churchill, Falls. At the time this was the largest construction project ever to be undertaken by a private company. 1954. The Levin Affair. Israeli agents recruit Egyptian citizens of Jewish descent to bomb Western targets in Egypt, and plant evidence to frame Arabs, in an apparent attempt to upset American-slash-Egyptian relations. Israeli Defense Minister, Ashkenazi Jew, Pinhas Levin is eventually removed from office, though many think real responsibility lies with David Ben-Gurion. This is the first known use of Jews who look like Arabs being used by the Jews to carry out terrorist attacks that they then blame on the Arabs, and is an example of how their secret service motto, by way of deception, thou shalt do war, works in practice. A hidden microphone planted by the Israelis is discovered in the office of the United States Ambassador in Tel Aviv. In Holland, the Bilderberg Group meets for the first time at the Bilderberg Hotel in Arnhem. The Bilderberg Group is a Rothschild-founded international organization of approximately 100, 200 influential people, mostly politicians and business people, who meet annually, and in secret, to carry out the bidding of the Jewish world power behind the scenes. Regulars at these meetings, put forward the forthcoming global policy, which delegates report back to their respective governments who then implement this policy. Bilderberg meetings are also used so that Rothschild, David Rockefeller and Jewish frontmen such as Henry Kissinger, can check out potential leaders of countries, and decide whether or not they want them as leaders of said countries. For example, Bill Clinton was there in 1991, Tony Blair was there in 1993, and Angela Merkel was there in 2005. Also Rands, who didn't pass the Bilderberg audition, such as, future Chancellor of the Exchequer, Gordon Brown, and former leader of the Conservative Party, William Hague, were there in 1991 and 1998 respectively. 1955. The Israeli government carries out the clandestine terrorist bombings of a number of American facilities in Cairo with the aim of making the Americans believe the Egyptians are responsible for them, in order to damage relations between the United States and Egypt. Edmund de Rothschild founds Compagnie Financière, Paris. 1956. On October 28, many can begin, he of the infamous Deir Yassin massacre and who would go on to be a future Prime Minister of Israel, states at a Tel Aviv conference you Israelis, you should never become lenient if you kill your enemies. You shall have no pity on them until we have destroyed their so-called Arab culture, on the ruins of which we shall build our own civilization. Telephone taps are found connected to, to telephones in the residence of the United States military attached in Tel Aviv. 1957 during a joint British, Israeli, and French invasion of the Suez Canal, Ariel Sharon commands units which murder Egyptian prisoners of war, as well as civilian Sudanese workers who the Jews had captured. A total of 273 unarmed prisoners are executed and dumped into mass graves. This story is suppressed for nearly 40 years until it breaks in the August 16, 1995 edition of the London Daily Telegraph. James de Rothschild dies and it is reported, by the Rothschild-owned media, that he bequeaths a large sum of money to the State of Israel to pay for the construction of their parliament building, the Knesset. He states that the Knesset should be, a symbol, in the eyes of all men, of the permanence of the State of Israel. 
On page 219 of his book, Tales of the British Aristocracy, L.G. Bine, the editor of Burke's Peerage, states that the Jews dot 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 have made themselves so closely connected with the British peerage that the two classes are unlikely to suffer loss which is not mutual. So closely linked are the Jews and the Lords that a blow against the Jews in this country would not be possible without injuring the aristocracy also. Morris de Rothschild dies in Paris. 1959. In February, crypto Jew, Fidel Castro, declares himself Prime Minister of Cuba, after leading a communist revolution there. 1916. In his book, Impact, Essays on Ignorance and the Decline of American Civilization, published this year, Ezra Pound states a nation that will not get itself into debt drives the usurers to fury. 1962. On June 25, prayer is banned from the American public school system following a Supreme Court decision. This court decision was based upon a case brought by a New York Jew named Engel in the case Engel v. Vidali. Senator Robert Byrd, a Democrat from West Virginia, states of this decision Can it be that we too, are ready to embrace the foul concepts of atheism? Somebody is tampering with America's soul, I leave it to you who that somebody is. Droth's child FREs establishes Imtel as an umbrella company for all their mineral mining interests. Frederick Morton publishes his book, The Rothschilds, in which he states though they control scores of industrial, commercial, mining and tourist corporations, not one bears the name Rothschild. Being private partnerships, the family houses never need to, and never do, publish a single public balance sheet, or any other report of their financial condition. 1963. On June 4, President John F. Kennedy, the 35th President of the United States 1961-1963, signs Executive Order 11110 which returns to the United States government the power to issue currency, without going through the Rothschild's owned Federal Reserve. Less than six months later on November 22, President Kennedy is assassinated by the Rothschilds for the same reason as they assassinated President Abraham Lincoln in 1865, he wanted to print American money for the American people, as opposed to for the benefit of a money-grabbing warmongering foreign elite. This Executive Order 11110, is actually rescinded by President Lyndon Baines Johnson, an alleged crypto Jew, the 36th President of the United States 1963 to 1969, in one of the first acts he carries out as United States President. Another, and probably the primary, reason for Kennedy's assassination is, however, the fact that he made it quite clear to Israeli Prime Minister, David Ben-Gurion, that under no circumstances would he agree to Israel becoming a nuclear state. The Israeli newspaper Hey Eretz on February 5, 1999, in a review of, Avner Cohen's book, Israel and the Bomb, states the following on this subject the murder of American President John F. Kennedy brought to an abrupt end the massive pressure being applied by the U.S. administration on the government of Israel to discontinue the nuclear program. The book implied that, had Kennedy remained alive, it is doubtful whether Israel would today have a nuclear option. A point of interest here, is that Kennedy's wife, Jackie Kennedy, was Jewish. This is revealed by Gore Vidal, in his autobiography, Palimpsest, a memoir. It turns out Vidal's stepfather, Hugh Orchin Kloss, subsequently wed Jackie Kennedy's mother, Janet Bavia. This story was also covered in the New York Times on November 9, 1995. Also for those of you who saw the Oliver Stone's JFK, which came up with a different conclusion with regard to the reasons for Kennedy's assassination, you may wish to know that Oliver Stone is Jewish. 
Finally there is some speculation that the Kennedy family, were indeed a Jewish family who had settled in Ireland, some generations before, although this is unconfirmed. Edmund de Rothschild establishes La Compagnie Financiere Edmund de Rothschild, LCF, in Switzerland as a venture capital house. This later develops into an investment bank and asset management company with many affiliates. He also marries his wife Nadine and they have a son, Benjamin de Rothschild. On January 10th, of this year, the 45 goals of the Communist Manifesto are stated in the United States Congress, by A. S. Herlong Jr. of Florida, and therefore formed the Congressional Record of the Day. Below is that list, which is important to study today to help you understand whether you live in a democracy, a republic, or under communism, which is of course, the control of the masses by Jewish interests. 1. U.S. Acceptance of coexistence as the only alternative to atomic war. 2. U.S. Willingness to capitulate in preference to engaging in atomic war. 3. Develop the illusion that total disarmament, by, the United States would be a demonstration of moral strength. 4. Permit free trade between all nations regardless of communist affiliation and regardless of whether or not items could be used for war. 5. Extension of long-term loans to Russia and Soviet satellites. 6. Provide American aid to all nations regardless of communist domination. 7. Grant recognition of Red China. Admission of Red China to the UN. 8. Set up East and West Germany as separate states in spite of Khrushchev's promise in 1955 to settle the German question by free elections under supervision of the UN. 9. Prolong the conferences to ban atomic tests because the United States has agreed to suspend tests as long as negotiations are in progress. 10 allow all Soviet satellites individual representation in the UN. 11. Promote the UN. As the only hope for mankind. If its charter is rewritten, demand that it be set up as a one world government with its own independent armed forces. 12. Resist any attempt to outlaw the Communist Party. 13. Do away with all loyalty oaths. 14. Continue giving Russia access to the U.S. Patent Office. 15. Capture one or both of the political parties in the United States. 16. Use technical decisions of the courts to weaken basic American institutions by claiming their activities violate civil rights. 17. Get control of the schools. Use them as transmission belts for socialism and current communist propaganda. Soften the curriculum. Get control of teachers associations. Put the party line in textbooks. 18. Gain control of all student newspapers. 19. Use student riots to foment public protests against programs or organizations which are under communist attack. 20. Infiltrate the press. Get control of book review assignments, editorial writing, policy making positions. 21. Gain control of key positions in radio, TV, and motion pictures. 22. Continue discrediting American culture by degrading all forms of artistic expression. An American communist cell was told to, eliminate all good sculpture from parks and buildings, substitute shapeless, awkward and meaningless forms. 23. Control art critics and directors of art museums. Our plan is to promote ugliness, repulsive, meaningless art. 24. Eliminate all laws governing obscenity by calling them, censorship and a violation of free speech and free press. 25. Break down cultural standards of morality by promoting pornography and obscenity in books, magazines, motion pictures, radio, and TV. 26. Present homosexuality, degeneracy and promiscuity as, normal, natural, and healthy. 27. 
infiltrate the churches and replace revealed religion with social religion. Discredit the Bible and emphasize the need for intellectual maturity which does not need a religious crutch. 28. Eliminate prayer or any phase of religious expression in the schools on the ground that it violates the principle of separation of church and state. 29. Discredit the American Constitution by calling it inadequate, old-fashioned, out of step with modern needs, a hindrance to cooperation between nations on a worldwide basis. 30. Discredit the American Founding Fathers. Present them as selfish aristocrats who had no concern for the common man. 31. Belittle all forms of American culture and discourage the teaching of American history on the ground that it was only a minor part of the big picture. Give more emphasis to Russian history since the communists took over. 32. Support any socialist movement to give centralized control over any part of the culture, education, social agencies, welfare programs, mental health clinics, etc. 33. Eliminate all laws or procedures which interfere with the operation of the communist apparatus. 34. Eliminate the House Committee on Un-American Activities. 35. Discredit and eventually dismantle the FBI. 36. Infiltrate and gain control of more unions. 37. Infiltrate and gain control of big business. 38. Transfer some of the powers of arrest from the police to social agencies. Treat all behavioral problems as psychiatric disorders which no one but psychiatrists can understand, or treat. 39. Dominate the psychiatric profession and use mental health laws as a means of gaining coercive control over those who oppose communist goals. 40. Discredit the family as an institution. Encourage promiscuity and easy divorce. 41. Emphasize the need to raise children away from the negative influence of parents. Attribute prejudices, mental blocks and retarding of children to suppressive influence of parents. 42. Create the impression that violence and insurrection are legitimate aspects of the American tradition, that students and special interest groups should rise up and use united force to solve economic, political or social problems. 43. Overthrow all colonial governments before native populations are ready for self-government. 44. Internationalize the Panama Canal. 45. Repeal the Connolly Reservation so the United States cannot prevent the World Court from seizing jurisdiction over domestic problems. Give the World Court jurisdiction over nations and individuals alike. 1965. Israel illegally obtains enriched uranium from NUMEC, Nuclear Materials and Equipment Corporation. Due to friction between different races in Britain, the Race Relations Act of 1965 is introduced into Parliament by the then Attorney General, Russian Jew, Frank Soskis. This act makes racial discrimination unlawful in public places. Introduction of different races into countries is the Jews' most effective form of warfare yet against the Western world, and is known as the Silent War, which has taken place at various times this century, primarily in the United States and the United Kingdom. This is generally done under the pretext of needing other races to fill a gap in the labor market in that country, although of course in America, Jews brought Africans into the country to sell as slaves whilst the electorate of the countries concerned are never asked whether they want immigration into their country. The Jews support immigration into countries for the following reasons. 1. In accordance with their most holy book, the Talmud, Jews see the world population as consisting of Jews and non-Jews, also known as Goim, Goy, and Gentiles. The only possible end result of immigration is the destruction of all races as they interbreed with one another and form one single race. That race will be the non-Jews. 2. The Jews have always wanted a world government, which coincidentally they will control. 
by mixing up all the races into different countries, they can argue that as every country in the world now consists of many different races, national boundaries are obsolete and should be replaced with a single world government. 3. The Jews are fully aware of the danger a cohesive native population is to their dreams of a Jewish world government, having had the experience of being kicked out of so many countries several times in history due to the natural reaction of a cohesive population against their evil and exploitative actions there. The introduction of people, foreign to a country, as citizens, removes the threat of the native peoples acting as a single cohesive unit. This is because the different cultures and customs of both peoples, are hard for either people to accept. Whilst these two groups of people are preoccupied sorting this out, the Jews have the benefit of invisibility to carry on as they please without question. They only ever seem to declare their race, when they speak of the great benefits in diversity, and anyone who doesn't agree must be, a, racist, or a, hater. Yet the plan they are promoting will result in the ethnic cleansing of specific racial types that have been on the planet for thousands of years, which they do not regard as racist or hateful. Interestingly, the Jewish-owned media throughout the world will go to promote diversity or political correctness, whilst at the same time promoting the apartheid state of Israel, the only state in the world where you have to be of a particular race to emigrate to. Yes, you have to be biologically Jewish to be able to emigrate there, and it is forbidden for a Jew to marry a non-Jew. 1967. The treatment of the Palestinians by the Jews, finally ignites enough anger in the Arab world for Egypt, Jordan and Syria to mobilize on Israel's borders. All of these three countries are suddenly attacked by Israel and as a result, the Sinai which included Gaza is stolen from Egypt and the West Bank and the Jordan River stolen from Jordan. As a result of this, on June 8, the Israelis launch an attack on the USS Liberty with Israeli aircraft and motor torpedo boats, in an effort to blame it on Egypt, to bring America into the war on their side, and of course follow to the letter, their Mossad motto, by way of deception, thou shalt do war. As a result of their attack, 34 American servicemen are killed and 174 wounded. Israel lies as usual, claiming it mistook this warship that was flying a large United States flag, for an ancient out-of-service Egyptian horse carrier El Qzir, that is incidentally 180 feet shorter. They also claim the ship was in the war zone, when it was actually in international waters, far from many fighting. The Israelis' attack on this warship lasts for 75 minutes during which time they shoot up one of the United States flags, resulting in the sailors desperately raising another one. The Israelis also machine gun the lifeboats the Americans deploy in order to prevent them escaping, yet another war crime. In the aftermath of this attack, the American sailors who survived are warned by the United States military not to discuss the matter with anyone due to national security, a term which when translated into plain English, means Jewish security. An able tribunal is set up to investigate the incident but it is not allowed to investigate whether the attack was deliberate, a subject which is left off their remit, and United States Senators and Congressmen are warned not to raise this subject for fear of inciting anti-Semitism. The story of course receives no prominence in the Rothschild-controlled mainstream media and as usual Israel is in no way even rebuked for their crimes by their subservient country of America. The day after this attack, June 9, Israel illegally occupies the Golan Heights which it seizes from Syria. This area goes on to provide Israel with one third of its fresh water. Israeli General Matityahu Peld, is quoted in Haaretz, March 19, 1972, with the following statement the thesis that the danger of genocide was hanging over us in June 1967 and that Israel was fighting for its physical existence is only bluff, which was born and developed after the war. Rothschild Fares is renamed Bank Rothschild. 1968. No my Halfton, wife of Morris de Rothschild dies. 
1970. While working for Senator Henry Scoop Jackson, Ashkenazi Jew, Richard Pull is caught by the FBI giving classified information to Israel. Nothing is done. British Prime Minister, Edward Heath, makes Lord Victor Rothschild the head of his policy unit. Whilst he is in that role Britain enters the European community, a major step towards world government. 1971. In their book, None Dare Call It Conspiracy, Gary Allen and Larry Abraham state in the reality of socialism you have a tiny oligarchical clique at the top, usually numbering no more than 3% of the total population, controlling the total wealth, total production and the very lives of the other 97%. Certainly even the most naive observe that Mr. Brezhnev doesn't live like one of the poor peasants out on the great Russian steppes. But, according to socialist theory, he is supposed to do just that. If one understands that socialism is not a share the wealth program, but is in reality a method to consolidate and control the wealth, then the seeming paradox of super rich men promoting socialism becomes no paradox at all. Instead it becomes the logical, even the perfect tool of power seeking megalomaniacs. Communism, or more accurately, socialism, is not a movement of the downtrodden masses, but of the economic elite. The plan of the conspirator insiders then is to socialize the United States, not to communize it. They go on to state one major reason for the historical blackout on the role of the international bankers in political history is the Rothschilds were Jewish. The Jewish members of the conspiracy have used an organization called the Anti-Defamation League AD, as an instrument to try and convince everyone that any mention of the Rothschilds and their allies is an attack on all Jews. In this way they have stifled almost all honest scholarship on international bankers and made the subject taboo within universities. Any individual or book exploring this subject is immediately attacked by hundreds of ill communities all over the country. The ill has never let the truth or logic interfere with its highly professional smear jobs. Actually, nobody has a right to be more angry at the Rothschild clique than their fellow Jews. The Rothschild Empire helped finance Adolf Hitler. Author, Hank Messick, publishes his book, Lansky, a biography of Jewish crime kingpin, Maya Lansky. It is initially printed with the following subtitle on the cover Jews control crime in the United States. However, as soon as the ill got wind of this, they contacted the publishers, as they revealed in their bulletin in October of this year, and as a result of their involvement. The cover was reprinted with the following subtitle on the cover, which appears to have been translated into, Jewish English. The mob runs America and Lansky runs the mob. In the congressional record of December 6, Congressman John R. Rara quotes a speech given by Senator Jack B. Tenney of California in which he stated the following of the Anti-Defamation League, and the CIA and FBI are tinker toys compared to the ad we are beginning to understand something of the magnitude of the ill's operations. We are beginning to appreciate the vast spy network sprawling over the nation and throughout the whole world. Our imagination is staggered by its apparent control of the avenues of communication. Their secret agents spy upon American citizens. Extensive files and dossiers are compiled on those with whom they disagree. Through their multitudinous controls of the media of communication, they are capable of destroying reputations and silencing all rebuttal. 1972. The World Health Organization, who, undertakes a massive smallpox vaccination program for millions of Africans. This smallpox vaccine is laced with the HIV AIDS virus so that the Rothschild backed population reduction program could begin amongst the poor black population which was growing at a rapid rate. 1973. In an attempt to get land stolen from them by Israel including the Golan Heights, Gaza and the West Bank, Egypt, Jordan, Syria and Iraq attack Israel and force Israeli forces to retreat. Their initial attempts at negotiation with Israel are repeatedly met with belligerence. 
With Israel facing defeat, the Jewish-controlled United States government sends massive amounts of United States military equipment and arms at taxpayers' expense to bolster the retreating Israeli forces, and further alienate the victims of Jewish supremacism from America. On top of all that the United States government put United States forces stationed both in Germany and in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, on alert, that they may be sent to Israel to assist Israeli forces in this war. This proves not to be necessary, as the Israeli forces emerge victorious following the massive infusion of military aid already given to them by the United States government, or rather the American taxpayer. On April 15th. Democratic Senator from Arkansas, J. William Fulbright, states the following on CBS television in relation to Jewish power in America The United States Senate is subservient to Israel. Israel controls the Senate. This has been demonstrated time and again, and this has made it difficult for the government. On October 10, United States Vice President, Spiro Agnew resigns. He is accused of bribery in the media, but the real reason for his removal, is his knowledge and disdain for the Jewish Communist Mafia in control of the United States. This is revealed in the following speech he had made the people who own and manage National Impact Media are Jewish and, with other influential Jews, helped create a disastrous U.S. Mideast policy. All you have to do is check the real policy makers and owners and you find a much higher concentration of Jewish people than you're going to find in the population. By National Impact Media I am referring to the major news wire services, pollsters, Time and Newsweek magazines, the New York Times, Washington Post, and the International Herald Tribune. For example, CBS Mr. William Pale is Jewish. Mr. Julian Goodman, who runs NBC, and there's a Leonard Goldenson at ABC. Mrs. Catherine Graham owns the Washington Post and Mr. Salzberger the New York Times. They are all Jews. You go down the line in that fashion. Not just with ownership but go down to the managing posts and discretionary posts. And you'll find that through their aggressiveness and their inventiveness, they now dominate the news media. Not only in the media, but in academic communities, the financial communities, in the foundations, in all sorts of highly visible and influential services that involve the public. They now have a tremendous voice. Our policy in the Middle East in my judgment is disastrous, because it's not even handed. I see no reason why nearly half the foreign aid this nation has to give goes to Israel, except for the influence of this Zionist lobby. I think the power of the news media is in the hands of a few people. It's not subject to control of the voters, it's subject only to the whim of the board of directors. George J. Laura, an employee of the Rothschilds controlled IBM, invents the UPC, universal product code, barcode which will eventually be placed upon virtually every item traded worldwide and bear the number, 666. The Book of Revelation, Chapter 13, Verse 17 through 18, states the following in relation to this number and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of man, and his number is 603 score and 6. N. M. Rothschild and Sons British and Newfoundland Corporation, Churchill Falls Project in Newfoundland, Canada, is completed. N. M. Rothschild and Sons also create a new asset management part of the company which traded worldwide. This eventually became, Rothschild Private Management Limited. Edmund de Rothschild, a great-grandson of Jacob, James, Meyer Rothschild, buys the Cru Bourgeois estate of C.H. Toclark in Bordeaux. One thousand nine hundred and seventy-four. On August 8, President Nixon resigns from office as a result of the Watergate scandal, which was the allegation that a group responsible for promoting the re-election of Nixon, 
two years prior, had broken into the offices of the Democratic National Committee. What the public are not told, however, is that in the year prior to that, 1971, Nixon had instructed officials to investigate the activities of the large number of Jewish IRS agents, as he had concerns they were protecting wealthy Jews in America from paying the tax they should. Isn't it interesting that following the possibility of big Jewish money being investigated, a scandal starts resulting in the only time in history a United States president has resigned from office. A New York periodical publishes an article claiming that the Rockefeller family are manipulating the Federal Reserve for the purpose of selling off Fort Knox gold at bargain basement prices to anonymous European speculators. Three days after the publication of this story, its anonymous source, longtime secretary to Nelson Rockefeller, Louise Orchin Kloss Boyer, mysteriously falls to her death from the window of her 10-story apartment block in New York. On December 10, the United States National Security Council under Henry Kissinger completes a classified 200-page study entitled, National Security Study Memorandum 200, Implications of Worldwide Population Growth for U.S. Security and Overseas Interests, NSSM 200. The study falsely claims that population growth in the so-called lesser developed countries is a grave threat to U.S. National security and outlines a covert plan to reduce population growth in those countries through birth control, war, and famine. 1975. The United Nations passed UN Resolution 3379 which condemns Zionism as racism. In the resolution it is stated any doctrine of racial differentiation or superiority is scientifically false morally condemnable, socially unjust and dangerous. This is one of those humorous situations in which the Jews' lies end up like a snake eating its own tail. This is because they promote diversity throughout the world, saying we are all equal. Yet at the same time they promote the direct opposite in their control of the most racist state in history, Israel, in which they claim we are God's chosen people. This leaves the Jewish-controlled United Nations in a quandary, as whichever way they rule will go against Jewish claims. In his book, Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time, published this year, Carol Quigley states there does exist an international network whose aim is to create a world system of financial control in private hands able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world. 1976. Ashkenazi Jew, Harold Rosenthal, aide to fellow Ashkenazi Jew, Senator Jacob Javits, states most Jews do not like to admit it, but our God is Lucifer. 1977. On December 25, the Israeli Knesset passes the anti-missionary law, 5738 to 1977 which decrees that if a non-Jewish Christian is apprehended giving a new testament to an Israeli, he may face a jail term of up to five years. 1978. In March, as a result of an attack on Israel in which 30 bus riders were killed, Israeli forces enter South Lebanon and occupy a six-mile strip of land north of their border, from where they launch indiscriminate cluster bomb attacks which result in the deaths of over 1,500 Lebanese and Palestinians, most of them civilians. They only end their illegal occupation when threatened by President Carter that if they do not, the United States will cut off all aid to Israel. Carter pointed out to Israeli Prime Minister, Menachem Begin, that the weapons the Israelis were using, were subject to an agreement between the United States and Israel, which was that they were only to be used in the event of an attack on Israel. Interestingly, it is only revealed years later that this invasion had been planned by Israel at least two years before, which questions whether the so-called terrorist attack on the bus which triggered off this invasion, was not in fact an Israeli, false flag, operation. The idea behind this invasion is to seize control of the Litani River, which amazingly Israel was allowed access to, by a United Nations security force after the Israelis left southern Lebanon. 
So, in essence, the Israelis launch an illegal war to steal Lebanon's water supply. They withdraw, but get what they wanted anyway thanks to the United Nations. On October 16, Archbishop Wojtyla becomes the first non-Italian pope since Hadrian V, 455 years prior, but chooses not to reveal his mother was Jewish, which would of course also qualified him for Israeli citizenship. He is the youngest pope in 132 years, aged only 58 and he takes the name of John Paul A. Ashkenazi Jew, Stephen Brine, then a Senate Foreign Relations Committee staffer, is overheard in a Washington DC hotel offering confidential documents to top Israeli military officials. Brian obtains a lawyer, Nathan Lewin, and the case heads for the grand jury, but is mysteriously dropped. Brian later goes to work for Richard Paul. More than 1,000 promiscuous homosexual males in the United States are targeted for an experimental hepatitis B vaccination sponsored by the National Institute of Health and Centers for Disease Control CDC, and run by the head of the New York City Blood Bank, Dr. Wolf Schmunner, a Polish Jew born in 1919. This vaccination is intentionally laced with the bioweapon commonly known as the AIDS virus, and by 1981, the CDC is trying to claim only 6% of the hepatitis B vaccine recipients were infected with AIDS. However, in 1984, the true figure is revealed as 64%, a figure which could yet increase as the complete studies remain classified. In his book, The Jewish Paradox, published this year, former president of the World Jewish Congress from 1948 to 1977, Nahum Goldman, stated the following on the subject of the Jews collectively I hardly exaggerate. Jewish life consists of two elements, extracting money and protesting. 1979. In the January issue of Playboy magazine, Marlon Brando states the following in an interview, in relation to Jewish control over Hollywood you've seen every single race besmirched, but you never saw an unfavorable image of the kike because the Jews were ever so watchful for that. They never allowed it to be shown on screen. The Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty in 1979 is underwritten by United States aid which pledges $3 billion annually to Israel from the United States taxpayer. Shin Bet, the Israeli Internal Security Agency, tries to penetrate the United States Consulate General in Jerusalem through a honey trap, using a clerical employee who was having an affair with a Jewish girl from Jerusalem. Baron and Baroness Philippe Eid Rothschild in a joint venture with Robert Mundavi, begin the construction of a pyramid in Napa Valley, California, where the leader-slash-founder of the Church of Satan, Ashkenazi Jew, Anton Lavey, is based. This is known as Opus One, which means, the first work, and the front for this temple is that it is a winery. 1980. The global phenomenon of privatization increases dramatically. The Rothschilds are behind this from the very beginning in order to seize control of all state-owned assets worldwide. The St. Georgia Guidestones are erected in Elbert County, Georgia, USA. These are engraved with ten points, the first one being maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. Being as the world population is 6 billion, this will mean a reduction of 9 tenths of the world's population. Interestingly on July 24 a document called the Global 2000 Report, written by former Secretary of State Cyrus R. Vance, is presented to President Carter. This report indicates that the resources of the planet are not sufficient enough to support the expected dramatic increase in the world population and calls for the population of the United States to be reduced by 100 million people by the year 2050. Emigration figures from the Soviet government in Russia reveal that in the 10 years from 1970, 246,000 Jews had been allowed to emigrate from Russia compared with only 2,000 non-Jews. 
What makes these figures even more staggering is that there were only 3 million Jews living in Russia at the time compared with 255 million non-Jews. This clearly shows that as late as 1980, the Soviet government showed a far higher level of regard to the wishes of Jews as opposed to non-Jews, and would indicate that there is still a large element of Jewish control over the Soviet government. Interestingly, out of the 246,000 Jews who left Russia during this past decade, well over half, 157,000 in fact, emigrated to Israel. This is a greater percentage than those who left Germany for Palestine prior to the outbreak of World War II, during the Zionist collaboration with the Nazis. 1981 On July 10, violence once again erupts in southern Lebanon and Israel once again bombards Beirut killing 450 people. According to Kurt Waldheim, the UN Secretary General, the Israeli Air Force bombarded Palestinian targets in South Lebanon, and in response, later that day Palestinian elements fired artillery and rockets into northern Israel. Bank Rothschild is nationalized by the French government. The new bank is called, Compagnie Europe in the bank. The Rothschilds subsequently set up a successor to this French bank, Rothschild and Kai Bank, RCB which goes on to become a leading French investment house. 1982 From September 16 to 18, future Prime Minister of Israel and then Defense Minister, Ashkenazi Jew, Ariel Sharon, orchestrates Israel's invasion of Lebanon, which provides aerial lighting in order to facilitate the killing of between 1,000 and 2,000 men, women and children in the Sabra and Shaitla massacres. They call this operation, in Jewish English, Operation Peace for Galilee. Sharon then turns his attention to the capital, Beirut, and in a series of airstrikes on civilian targets, at least 18,000 Lebanese and Palestinian civilians are killed. Israeli Prime Minister, terrorist, Menachem Begin, arrogantly states of this massacre we do not have to answer to the world, only to ourselves. The public are told the reason for this illegal invasion of Lebanon is to stop cross-border attacks by Palestinian guerrillas in southern Lebanon on Israel's northern settlements. Interestingly, at the time of the Israeli invasion, a truce had been in effect for more than a year and not a single settler had been killed. However, the real reason for this indiscriminate slaughter comes to light when it only ceases, once Palestinian Liberation Organization Leader, Yasser Arafat, who was residing in Beirut, flees to Tunisia. 1983. In order that Ecuador's government be allowed a loan of $1.5 billion from the Rothschild Controlled International Monetary Fund, IMF, they are forced to take over the unpaid private debts Ecuador's elite to private banks. Furthermore, in order to ensure Ecuador can pay back this loan, the IMF dictate price hikes in electricity and other utilities. When that doesn't give the IMF enough cash, or rather, interest, they ordered Ecuador to sack 120,000 workers. Ecuador are also required to do a variety of things under a timetable imposed by the IMF. These include, raising the price of cooking gas by 80% by November 1, 2000 transferring the ownership of its biggest water system to foreign operators, granting British Petroleum BP, the rights to build and own an oil pipeline over the Andes, and eliminating the jobs of more workers whilst reducing the wages of those remaining by 50%. In October, Chairman He Eilbrun of the Committee to Re-elect General Shlomo Lahat as mayor of Tel Aviv, states we have to kill all the Palestinians unless they are resigned to live here as slaves. On October 23, in Beirut, the United States Marine Barracks is blasted to shreds by a truckload of explosives resulting in the deaths of 241 servicemen. In his book, By Way of Deception, former Mossad agent, Viktor Ostrovsky, confirms Israel had advanced knowledge of the attack, yet did not bother to warn the Americans. 
he states the general attitude at Mossad about the Americans was, as far as the Yanks go, we are not here to protect them. Mark Lee Raphael, publishes his book, Jews and Judaism in the United States, a documentary history, in which he states the following in relation to the slave trade in America Jewish merchants played a major role in the slave trade. In fact dot 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 Jewish merchants frequently dominated. 1984. The Mossad run into a problem. They are training both the Sri Lankan special forces and the Tamil Tiger rebels from Sri Lanka at the same Mossad training school, Far Sakin, in Israel. This is after selling both sides military training courses. This is a step up from the Rothschild family funding both sides in war. This time Jews are actually selling courses in how both sides can best kill each other. It is touch and go, but the Mossad managed to keep both sides apart in their three weeks at this training camp and both factions leave to return to Sri Lanka, none the wiser that their enemy was being trained in the same camp by the same organization. 1985. Jack Bernstein publishes his book, The Life of an American Jew in Racist Marxist Israel, which contains the following statement under the heading, A Challenge. I am well aware of the tactics of you, my Zionist brethren, used to quiet anyone who attempts to expose any of your subversive acts. If the person is a Gentile, you cry, you're anti-Semitic, which is nothing more than a smokescreen to hide your actions. But, if a Jew is the person doing the exposing, you resort to other tactics. First, you ignore the charges, hoping the information will not be given widespread distribution. If the information starts reaching too many people, you ridicule the information and the persons giving the information. If that doesn't work, your next step is character assassination. If the author or speaker has not been involved in sufficient scandal you are adept at fabricating scandal against the person or persons. If none of these are effective, you are known to resort to physical attacks. But, never do you try to prove the information wrong. Jack Bernstein subsequently offers to debate the Anti-Defamation League on live television, the a decline and instead Bernstein ends up being assassinated by the most art. The New York Times reports the FBI is aware of at least a dozen incidents in which so-called American officials transferred classified information to the Israelis, quoting, former assistant director of the FBI, Raymond Wannell. The Justice Department does not prosecute. In late November, Jonathan Pollard is arrested in the United States for passing classified information to LACAM, Lishka Lakash Rimada, which is the Israeli Defense Ministry's Scientific Liaison Bureau, and is run by Raphael Letton, who had taken part in the 1960 abduction of Adolf Eichmann from Argentina. Pollard worked in research at the Naval Investigative Service based just outside Washington, and this year he was transferred to the Anti-Terrorism Alert Center, which of course gave him access to extremely sensitive material. As a result of his espionage, Pollard is sentenced to life in prison. Richard Smythe, the owner of Milko, is indicted on charges of smuggling nuclear timing devices to Israel. Israel Conduct Say Black Ops, Operation On There, Agil Loro, cruise ship as she is sailing from Alexandria to Port Said within Egypt. The ship is hijacked, and the Israelis, coup de grace, is when a wheelchair-bound passenger, American Jew, Leon Klinghoffer, is executed and thrown overboard, generating outrage throughout the world, especially in America. Furthermore, the Jews ensure that this is the major story of the day worldwide, in print and on the television. This tactic is explained in the book, Prophets of War, in which former Special Intelligence Advisor to Israeli Prime Minister, Yitzhak Shamir, Ari Ben Menash, explains how Israeli intelligence had been funding Palestinian terror groups to carry out attacks on Israeli targets, in order to make the world, especially America, sympathetic to Israel and the Jews, and hateful of the Palestinians. N. M. Rothschild and Sons, 
advise the British government on the privatization of British gas. They subsequently advise the British government on virtually all of their other privatizations of state-owned assets including, British Steel, British Coal, all the British Regional Electricity Boards, and all the British Regional Water Boards. They will go on to make several billion pounds from this, advice. A British MP involved in privatizations is future Chancellor of the Exchequer, Norman Lamont, a former Rothschild banker. It is important to illustrate that the great majority of money is not even printed these days. For proof of this, please see the following speech by the late Lord Biswick which appeared in Hansard, 27th of November 1985, volume 468, columns 935-939, under the title, Money Supply and the Private Banking System which states Lord Biswick rose to call attention to the statement made by the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster on 23rd of July 1985 that the 96.9% increase in money supply over a five-year period has been created by the private banking system and without government authority. The noble lord said, my lords, on 10th June this year one asked Her Majesty's government by what amount the money supply had increased in the five-year period to mid-April 1985. Interestingly, they gave me the answer in percentages and not in pounds. Having given him prior notice, perhaps the minister would be good enough later to give me the answer in money terms. The government reply on 10th June was that the increase had been by 101.9%, and that of that very large amount only 5% was accounted for by the state minting of more coins and the printing of more notes. That 96.9% increase represented not only an enormous sum of money but also a crucially important factor in our economy. I wanted to know by whom it had been created and on 23rd July I again asked Her Majesty's government to what extent this increase had government approval. I was told by the Chancellor of the Duchy, speaking for the government, the 96.9% represented new bank deposits created in the normal course of banking business and no government authority is necessary for this. Had he said that some counterfeiter of coins or forger of notes had been at work there would of course have been an immediate and indignant outcry, yet here we have a government statement that private institutions have created this enormous amount of extra purchasing power and we are expected to accept that it is normal practice and that the government authority does not come into it. When I asked whether we ought not to consider more deeply who was benefiting from this money creating power, the minister said that the implications, though interesting, were maybe too far reaching for question time, and so I raised the matter again in debate and hope to get more enlightenment. The issues are important, they are certainly under discussed, perhaps not adequately understood and I hope that I am not being unduly unfair if I say that those who understand the mechanisms often do very well out of them. I make no party point, it is all much bigger and wider than that. Notice how the Chancellor of the Duchy gives the game away when he says that, no, government authority was needed for this present system of credit creating. 1986. Sephardic Jew, more Chive Namnu. A technician at Daimona, Israel's nuclear installation, from 1976 to 1985, discovers that the plant has been secretly producing nuclear weapons. His cites his conversion to Christianity as his reason for having the conscience to speak out and this year he provides the London Sunday Times with the facts and photos they used to tell the world about Israel's nuclear weapons program. His evidence shows that Israel had stockpiled up to 200 nuclear warheads. On September 30th, an Israeli Mossad agent, Cheryl Bentoff, operating under the name of Cindy and masquerading as an American tourist, begins an affair with Vaynanu, eventually persuading him to fly to Rome with her on a holiday. Once in Rome, the juice, instead of going through proper channels and seeking his extradition, send Mossad agents to kidnap him, drug him, drive him to a deserted beach and smuggle him to Israel on a freighter. 
After a secret trial he is sentenced to 18 years imprisonment for treason and espionage, something Israel are very familiar with, even though he had not spied for any foreign power and had received no payment for his exposure. Throughout the trial the Israeli government refused to admit or deny whether or not they have nuclear weapons. Jews, Ivan Bosky, Dennis Levine, Martin Siegel, and Michael Milken are convicted of insider trading running into the billions of dollars. All of them subsequently receive light sentences and fines that do not reflect the fortunes they fraudulently amassed as a result of their participation. The Gordon Gecko character in the Oliver Stone film, Wall Street, is based upon Ivan Bosky, and once again the Jew, Oliver Stone, fails to identify Gecko as Jewish. In his book published this year, Terrorism, How the West Can Win, future Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu refers to the Palestinians as a malign cancer that must be removed. In Britain the Public Order Act of 1986 is brought into law. This act is designed to prevent British people from discussing in any way the problems of immigration and Jewish supremacism. It also gives police the power to violently enter the homes of anyone they consider being opposed to the Race Relations Act. The act was placed before Parliament by the Home Secretary Leon Britton, actually a Lithuanian Jew whose real name is Leon Britoniski, with the assistance of his cousin, another Lithuanian Jew, Malcolm Rivkind, also known as Malcolm Rivkind, who would go on to become Foreign Secretary. 1987 Edmund de Rothschild creates the World Conservation Bank which is designed to transfer debts from third world countries to this bank in exchange for land those countries would give to this bank. This is designed so the Rothschilds can gain control of the third world which represents 30% of the land surface of the earth. On April 24, the Wall Street Journal reveals the role of Israel in Iran Contra scandal won't be explored in detail by panels. 1988 The three arms of the World Central Bank, the World Bank, the Bank of International Settlements, BIS, and the International Monetary Fund, IMF, now generally referred to as the World Central Bank, through their BIS arm, require the world's bankers to raise their capital and reserves to 8% of their liabilities by 1992. This increased capital requirement puts an upper limit on fractional reserve lending. To raise the money, the world's bankers have to sell stocks which depress their individual stock markets and cause depressions in those countries. For example in Japan, one of the countries with the lowest capital in reserve, the value of its stock market would crash by 50%, and its commercial real estate crash by 60%, within two years. The idea is for the IMF to create more and more of their international currency known as, Special Drawing Rights, SDRs, backed by nothing, in order for struggling nations to borrow them and therefore increase their cash reserves to the required BIS level. These nations will then gradually come under the control of the IMF as they struggle to pay the interest, and have to borrow more and more. The IMF will then decide which nations can borrow more and which will starve. They can also use this as leverage to take state-owned assets like utilities as payment against the debt until they eventually own the nation-states. The Anti-Defamation League ADL, initiates a nationwide competition for law students to draft anti-hate legislation designed to protect minority groups. That competition is won by a man named, Joseph Rybakov, whose proposals stipulate that not only must hate-motivated violence be banned, but any words which stimulate, suspicion, friction, hate, and possible violence, must also be criminalized. This and price winning paper suggests that not only should state agencies monitor and restrict free speech in general, but they should also censor all films that criticize identifiable groups. Furthermore, even if the person making the statement can justify it, for example Christians criticizing homosexuality because the Bible expressly forbids it, Rybakov asserts that the truth is to be no defense in court. 
the only proof a court will need in order to secure a conviction of hate speech is that something has been said, and a minority group or member of such group has felt emotionally damaged as a result of such criticism. Therefore, under these proposals which the ill will have forced into law all over the world less than 15 years later, through their bought and paid for politicians and media, Jesus Christ would have been arrested as a hate criminal. This law is designed to protect the Rothschild conspiracy from being revealed in that if you criticize the Rothschild's criminal cabal, you will be targeted as anti-Semitic, and thus risk imprisonment. It is also interesting to note that say, for example, a rabbi torches his synagogue to collect insurance money because it is in need of repair, as opposed to someone else perpetrating the crime who was found to have an interest in anti-establishment media the latter would receive a stiffer sentence for the same act. Historian, James Beck's book, Other Losses, which reveals the shocking allied treatment of German prisoners of war, allies who were of course under the direct instructions of the Jew, Eisenhower, then supreme commander of allied forces, features shocking revelations from a former lieutenant in the 101st Airborne Division. This lieutenant, who would rise to the post of senior historian, United States Army and would retire as Colonel Ernest F. Fisher Ph.D., wrote the following in his foreword to Back's book starting in April 1945, the United States Army and the French Army casually annihilated about one million men, most of them in American camps. Eisenhower's hatred, passed through the lens of a compliant military bureaucracy, produced the horror of death camps unequaled by anything in American military history an enormous war crime. It would later be revealed that more than 9 million Germans, both soldiers and civilians, had died as a result of the policies of starvation and expulsion adopted by the Allied forces in the first five years following the end of the Second World War. These would include the deaths of prisoners on the road and those in Allied prison camps, where food parcels were barred and children were enslaved. One can only assume that Eisenhower was following the edicts of his beloved Jewish Talmud which is the highest religious and ethical guide for observant Jews. In this book, which to the Jews far surpasses the Bible, and alongside the Zohar and the Kabbalah, it is repeatedly stated that non-Jews are inherently bad, and Jews good, and furthermore, that the best among the non-Jews deserve to be killed. Unlike the Bible and Quran, which are widely available to all, it is very difficult to obtain a copy of the most holy Jewish book, the Talmud, anywhere. Maybe this is because within the Talmud, it is expressly stated that it is forbidden to teach the Talmud to a non-Jew. The penalty for someone who does so is revealed in Sanhedrin 58a, Hajjaga, in which it is stated such a person deserves death. On August 17th, the President of Pakistan, General Zia al Haq, is assassinated in an air crash. The United States Ambassador to India at the time, John Dean, reports to his superiors that he had evidence that the Israeli Secret Service, the Mossad, were behind the assassination in an effort to stop Pakistan developing the nuclear bomb. For his troubles, Dean, is accused of mental imbalance and relieved of his duties at the State Department. However, he refuses to relinquish this view and comes out publicly with it in 2005 when he is 80 years old. Philippe de Rothschild dies. 1989. Many of the satellite states in Eastern Europe, through the influence of Glasnost, become more open in their demands of freedom from communist governance in their republics. Many revolutions happen in 1989 most of them involving the overthrow of their respective communist governments and the replacement of them with republics. Thus, the hold the communists had over Eastern Europe, the Iron Curtain, becomes very weak. Eventually, as a result of perestroika and glasnost, communism collapses, not only in the Soviet Union but also in Eastern Europe. In Russia, Boris Yeltsin, whose wife is the daughter of Joseph Stalin's marriage to Rosa Kaganovich, and the Republican government takes steps to end the power of the Communist Party by suspending and banning the party and seizing all their property. 
this symbolizes the fall of communism in Russia, and results in the start of a mass exodus of 700,000 Jews from the former Soviet Union to Israel. In the Israeli journal, Kodam, November 24, 1989, there is a report of a speech that the then Israeli Deputy Foreign Minister, Ashkenazi Jew, Benjamin Netanyahu, gave to students at Bar Ilan University in which he states Israel should have exploited the repression of the demonstrations in China, when world attention focused on that country, to carry out mass expulsions among the Arabs of the territories. On December 20, the United States invade Panama as they suspect its de facto leader, General Manuel Noriega, of drug trafficking. Early reports state that a Mike Harari, has been captured in Panama, a man described in the Wire News stories as a shadowy former officer of Israel's Mossad intelligence service who became one of Noriega's most influential advisors. An official from the new American installed administration in Panama claims that apart from, of course, Noriega, Harari was the most important person in Panama. However, Whilst Noriega would go on to be extradited to America and jailed, Harari subsequently disappears under mysterious circumstances only to surface in Israel. Harari is not extradited to the United States to face charges, nor does it appear that his extradition was even sought by the United States. In the former concentration camp of Auschwitz, a plaque claiming that four million people had been murdered there, mainly Jews, is replaced with a plaque stating that one and a half million had died there. Strangely, the figure of six million Jews dying in the Holocaust is not reduced accordingly to reflect this two and a half million reduction of the stated death toll at Auschwitz. Furthermore, no reasons for this reduction in the death toll at Auschwitz, nor the fact the six million figure has not been reduced to reflect this reduction are ever given. The London and Paris Rothschilds announced the launch of a new subsidiary, Rothschild GmbH, in Frankfurt, Germany. 1990. In his book, By Way of Deception, published this year, former Mossad agent, Viktor Rostrovsky, reveals the following. 1. The Mossad recruits Arab agents to carry out missions. 2. Israeli agents are skilled at impersonating Arabs. 3. Mossad has an elaborate plan to vilify Iraq and involve the US in a war against it. He makes the following startling claims on the willingness of the worldwide Jewish community to assist the Mossad, as, Sionim, which derives from the Hebrew word Lasa'i which means, to help, over and above any loyalty they have to the nation they are citizens of or, resident in. On page 86, Ostrovsky states dot 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 the Sionim, a unique and important part of the Mossad's operation. Sionim, assistants, must be 100% Jewish. They live abroad, and though they are not Israeli citizens, many are reached through their relatives in Israel. An Israeli with a relative in England, for example, might be asked to write a letter saying the person bearing the letter represents an organization whose main goal is to help save Jewish people in the diaspora. Could the British relative help in any way? There are thousands of Sionim around the world. In London alone, there are about 2,000 who are active, and another 5,000 won the list, in his 1994 book. The other side of deception, Ostrovsky reveals that the Mossad maintain over a hundred safe houses in London alone. They fulfill many different roles. A car scion, for example, running a rental agency, could help the Mossad rent a car without having to complete the usual documentation. An apartment scion would find accommodation without raising suspicions, a bank scion could get you money if you needed it in the middle of the night. A doctor Sion would treat a bullet wound without reporting it to the police, and so on. The idea is to have a pool of people available when needed who can provide services but will keep quiet about them out of loyalty to the cause. One thing you know for sure is that even if a Jewish person knows it is the Mossad, he might not agree to work with you, but he won't turn you in. 
you have at your disposal a non-risk recruitment system that actually gives you a pool of millions of Jewish people to tap from outside your own borders. And on page 292 many of the youths trained at the summer camps in Israel later become Sinem, and it certainly provides a strong group of willing helpers, well trained, undaunted by the lingo, who have already shown the ability to take chances. This would explain the desire of the group, Birthright Israel, to offer free holidays to Israel for Jews resident throughout the world between the ages of 18, 26, in order to, according to their official website strengthen the sense of solidarity among world Jewry. Due to a mass panic among Jewish groups, regarding alleged discrepancies in the official version of the Holocaust, they use their influence to ensure France introduces and passes the Gaysot law, making Holocaust denial a crime. The following European countries follow suit, Germany, who already had limited Holocaust denial laws, Switzerland, Austria, Belgium, Romania, Czech Republic, Lithuania, Poland, and Slovakia. This is done to protect the Jews' greatest weapon against those who criticize their criminal actions, the alleged slaughter of six million Jews during World War II, a weapon which they use continually to both victimize themselves and justify their oppressive actions against other races. Following the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait on August 2, 1990, on January 16 of this year the United States and Britain began an aerial bombing campaign of targets within Iraq. On 24 February the ground campaign commences which lasts 100 hours until on February 28 when a horrendous war crime occurs. This crime is the slaughter of 150,000 Iraqi troops with fuel air bombs. These Iraqis are fleeing on a crowded highway from Kuwait to Basra. President George Herbert Walker Bush orders United States military aircraft and ground units to kill these surrendering troops, who are then bulldozed into mass unmarked graves in the desert, some of whom are still alive. President Bush then orders a cessation of hostilities. What was the significance of this slaughter and President Bush declaring the war over on this day? Well it was the day the, day of Purim, fell on this year. This the day the Jews celebrate their victory over ancient Babylon, now based within the borders of Iraq and a day when the Jews are encouraged to get bloody revenge against enemies, which Purim declares are basically all non-Jews. Of approximately the 697,000 American servicemen and women deployed to the Persian Gulf during Operation Desert Storm, some 40,000 end up dead and the further 400,000 end up suffering from various maladies associated with what has become known as Gulf War Syndrome. It is subsequently discovered that the military obtained 800,000 chemical and biological protective suits from the Iratex company of Raynell. WV, which were defective, and contained holes and tears, that can allow insufficient biological or chemical material to kill a person wearing it. Iratex, which netted $44 million in defense contracts in the late 1980s and early 1990s to make these protective suits, declared bankruptcy in 1995. For committing this genocide on American soldiers, for nothing more than financial gain, this is how the United States judicial system dealt with the principles of Iratex. Abrin, the former president, receives four months detention, three years supervised release and a $4,000 fine. His brother, Yehuda Yov Brin, who had been a fugitive until he was captured at JFK airport, receives six months plus one day in jail, two years supervised release and a $40,000 fine. Vi Rosenthal, formerly the company's production manager, has to serve six months home detention, three months probation and receives a $20,000 fine. The real reason for this war in Iraq is revealed in Viktor Ostrovsky's book, The Other Side of Deception in which he states on page 315 what the Mossad really feared was that Iraq's gigantic army, 
which had survived the Iran-Iraq war and was being supplied by the West and financed by Saudi Arabia, would fall into the hands of a leader who might be more palatable to the West and still be a threat to Israel. The first step was taken in November 1988, when the Mossad told the Israeli Foreign Office to stop all talks with the Iraqis regarding a peace front. At that time, Secret negotiations were taking place between Israelis, Jordanians, and Iraqis under the auspices of the Egyptians and with the blessings of the French and the Americans. The Mossad manipulated it so that Iraq looked as if it were the only country unwilling to talk, thereby convincing the Americans that Iraq had a different agenda. By January 1989, the Mossad lap, Israeli psychological warfare, machine was busy portraying Saddam as a tyrant and a danger to the world. The Mossad activated every asset it had, in every place possible, from volunteer agents in Amnesty International to fully bought members of the US. Congress. Saddam had been killing his own people, the cry went, what could his enemies expect? The gruesome photos of dead Kurdish mothers clutching their dead babies after a gas attack by Saddam's army were real and the acts were horrendous. But the Kurds were entangled in an all-out guerrilla war with the regime in Baghdad and had been supported for years by the Mossad, who sent arms and advisors to the mountain camps of the Barazani family, this attack by the Iraqis could hardly be called an attack on their own people. The media was supplied with inside information and tips from reliable sources on how the crazed leader of Iraq killed people with his bare hands and used missiles to attack Iranian cities. What they neglected to tell the media was that most of the targeting for the missiles was done by the Mossad with the help of American satellites. The Mossad was grooming Saddam for a fall, but not his own. They wanted the Americans to do the work of destroying that gigantic army in the Iraqi desert so that Israel would not have to face it one day on its own border. That in itself was a noble cause for an Israeli, but to endanger the world with the possibility of global war and the deaths of thousands of Americans was sheer madness. On March 20, under pressure from the rabbinical Chabad Lubavitch movement, the 102nd Congress of the United States passes Public Law 10214 to designate March 26, 1991, as Education Day, U.S.A, in respect of educating the public to the seven Nohide laws from the Talmud, which are merely what the Pharisees, derived from specific passages in the Torah. Furthermore they are laws that only non-Jews have to follow. The focus of Public Law 10214 being in, Education Day, is merely a smokescreen to fool the public into believing that the seven Nohide laws were not actually passed into law within this act. Instead the Jews want the public to believe that this public law only introduced a one-off, not annual, day of March 26 this year to educate people about this subject. However, it is rapidly obvious that a government-sponsored one-off Education Day does not require a law passed to ensure its implementation. Therefore, these laws were passed March 20, in readiness for when the United States courts wish to use them, and these seven laws are. 1. Avadazara, do not worship false gods. 2. Shifa Chatamim, do not murder. 3. Jezel, do not steal or kidnap. 4. Gilui Ariat, do not be sexually immoral, forbidden sexual acts are traditionally interpreted to include incest, bestiality, male homosexual sex acts and adultery. 5. Burkat Hashem, do not, bless God, euphemistically referring to blasphemy. 6. Ever minutes Harchai, do not eat any flesh that was torn from the body of a living animal given to Noah and traditionally interpreted as a prohibition of cruelty towards animals. 7. Dinim, do not permit oppression or anarchy to rule. Set up a system of honest, effective courts, police and laws to uphold the last six laws. These laws are the bedrock for Jewish supremacism, as they forbid the worship of any god but their own god, Satan. This is revealed in law number one, do not worship false gods, which, coming from the Jewish Talmud, 
means any gods the Jews don't recognize, such as Jesus Christ and the Prophet Muhammad. The Talmud states the penalty for disobedience of these laws to be as follows one additional element of greater severity is that violation of any one of the seven laws subjects the Nohide to capital punishment by decapitation, Sanhedrin 5070. Strangely enough these laws or the, Education Day, link to them receives no criticism from the American Civil Liberties Union, a clue, which one would have expected as not only do they represent the enforcement of a particular religion's edicts upon all non-Jewish people, but they also violate the Eklu's long-held belief in the separation of church and state. At the Bilderberg Conference on June 6 to 9 of this year, in Baden-Baden, Germany, David Rockefeller, a Rothschild, makes the following statement We are grateful to the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine and other great publications whose directors have attended our meetings and respected their promises of discretion for almost 40 years. It would have been impossible for us to develop our plan for the world, if we had been subjected to the lights of publicity during those years. But the world is now more sophisticated and prepared to march towards a world government. The supranational sovereignty of an intellectual elite and world bankers is surely preferable to the national auto-determination practiced in past centuries. 1992 In March, former Federal Reserve Board Chairman, Paul A. Volcker becomes chairman of the European banking firm, J. Rothschild, Wolf and Son and Company. Stephen Brine caught offering confidential documents to Israel in 1978, is found to be serving on the board of the pro-Israeli Jewish Institute for National Security Affairs while continuing as a paid consultant, with security clearance, on exports of sensitive as technology. The Samson Option, by Seymour M. Hirsch reports illicitly obtained intelligence was flying so voluminously from LACAM, a secret Israeli intelligence unit a Hebrew acronym for Scientific Liaison Bureau, into Israeli intelligence that a special code name, Jumbo, was added to the security markings already on the documents. There were strict orders, Ari Ben Maynash recalled, anything marked Jumbo was not supposed to be discussed with your American counterparts. The Wall Street Journal reports that Israeli agents apparently tried to steal Recon Optical Incorporated's top secret airborne spy camera system. Privatization begins in earnest in Russia. As a result of this, through corruption, the vast wealth of Russia ends up in the hands of the so called seven oligarchs, all of them new billionaires who backed Boris Yeltsin with money and media support. The seven are Boris Berezovsky. Vladimir Gsonsky, Mikhail Kudorkovsky, Mikhail Friedman, Alexander Smolsky, and Pyotr Van, all Jewish, and one Russian, Vladimir Potanin. Potanin would be used as the other's public liaison to the government. What aid Russia receives from the West, goes straight to the Jewish banking cabal also. This is revealed when the Washington Times reports that Russian President, Boris Yeltsin, who was upset that most of the incoming foreign aid was being siphoned off, stated it was going straight back into the coffers of Western banks in debt service. The Third World detonations who had borrowed from the World Bank pay $198 million more to the central banks of the developed nations for World Bank funded purposes than they receive from the World Bank. This only goes to increase their permanent debt in exchange for temporary relief from poverty which is caused by the payments on prior loans, the repayments of which already exceed the amount of the new loans. This year Africa's external debt had reached $290 billion, which is two and a half times greater than its level in 1980, and has resulted in deterioration of schools, deterioration of housing skyrocketing infant mortality rates, a drastic downturn in the general health of the people, and mass unemployment. On September 16 Britain's pound collapses when currency speculators led by Rothschild agent, Ashkan Azijou, George Soros, borrow pounds and sell them for Deutsche Marks, 
in the expectation of being able to repay the loan in devalued currency and to pocket the difference. This results in the British Chancellor of the Exchequer, Norman Lamont, announcing a rise in interest rates of 5% in one day and as a result drives Britain into a recession which lasts many years as large numbers of businesses fail and the housing market crashes. This is right on cue for the Rothschilds, as after they had privatized Britain's state-owned assets during the 1980s, and driven their share price up. They now took advantage of the collapse in the market so they could buy them up for pennies on the pound, a carbon copy of what Nathan Meyer Rothschild did to the British economy 180 years before, in 1812. It cannot be overstated that the Chancellor of the Exchequer at that time, Norman Lamont, prior to becoming a MP, was a merchant banker with N. M. Rothschild and Sons who he joined after reading economics at Cambridge. 1993. Norman Lamont leaves the British government to return to N. M. Rothschild and Sons as a director, after his mission to collapse the British economy to profit the Rothschilds is accomplished. After Labour come to power under Tony Blair in 1997, Norman Lamont is given further recognition for his sterling work in crashing the British economy when he is made Lord Lamont of Lerwick. Former Congressman, Paul Findlay publishes his seminal book, Deliberate Deceptions, Facing the Facts About the U.S. Israeli Relationship. In this book he lists the 65 United Nations member resolutions against Israel from the period 1955 to 1992, and the 30 United States vetoes on Israel's behalf which if not made would have seen Israel have 95 resolutions against them at this point. No matter, even with Israel's puppet, the United States, helping them terrorize others. The 65 resolutions passed against Israel are more than all the resolutions passed against all other countries combined. Not that Israel care too much about the views of the United Nations when you consider that less than two weeks after Israel's attack on the USS Liberty, an attack designed to sink the Liberty and blame it on Egypt prompting the United States into a war with Egypt on behalf of Israeli lies, remember the Mossad motto, by way of deception. Thou shalt do war, the Israeli Foreign Minister, Abban, stated of the United Nations, as reported in the New York Times, June 19, 1967 If the General Assembly were to vote by 121 votes to one in favor of Israel returning to the armistice lines, pre-June 1967 borders, Israel would refuse to comply with the decision. The Anti-Defamation League, Adl is caught operating a massive spying operation on critics of Israel, Arab Americans, the San Francisco Labor Council, International Longshore and Warehouse Union, ILWU, Local 10, Oakland Educational Association, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAP, Irish Northern Aid, International Indian Treaty Council, the Asian Law Caucus and the San Francisco Police. Data Collected which included more than 10,000 names and confidential information concerning right-wing Christians, conservatives and Muslims in America, is sent to Israel and in some cases to South Africa. Pressure from Jewish organizations forces the city to drop the criminal case, but the Ill settles a civil lawsuit for an undisclosed amount. On July 25, Israeli forces launch Operation Accountability against southern Lebanon in response to an attack by Hezbollah forces which killed seven Israeli troops in northern Israel. This takes the form of a week-long series of air strikes in which 130 Lebanese civilians are killed and another 300,000 are forced to flee their homes. Jewish director, Steven Spielberg releases his Jewish propaganda, Tour de Force, Schindler's List which will go on to receive lavish praise from the Jewish-controlled media, and earn him the Best Director Oscar from the Jewish-controlled Hollywood. It is important to note here, a very interesting line that wasn't properly quoted in the film. This is where Schindler is depicted lamenting how few Jews he had been able to save from a Nazi labor camp, 
and then a little, old Jewish man says to him, in our holy book, the Talmud, it says that if you save just one life, it is as if you have saved the entire world. Wrong. What the exact wording in the Talmud actually states, is that if you save just one Jewish life, it is as if you have saved the entire world. It must never be forgotten that according to the Talmud, the lives of non-Jews have absolutely no value at all. 1994. In Israel, on February 25th, the day of Purim, Dr. Baruch Kapel Goldstein, who served as a physician in the Israeli Defense Force, IDF, and is a direct descendant of Rabbi Shneir Zalman of Liadi, the founder of the Chabad Lubavitch movement, enters the cave of the Patriarch's Mosque during prayers and kills 29 Muslims and wounds 125 others. He does this by shooting them with an automatic weapon. He is eventually overpowered by the survivors and beaten to death. At the inquiry two Israeli army guards testify that Goldstein did not act alone, and even the gun found on his body did not match the gun he went into the mosque with. Nevertheless the inquiry decides that Goldstein acted alone. Almost immediately Goldstein's grave becomes a place of pilgrimage for many Jews. Indeed, the local religious council of Kiryat Arba declares the grave site a memorial and a properly constituted cemetery. Sidewalks, spotlights, streetlights, a cupboard with prayer books and pedestals with candles are installed by supporters. This is the inscription on his gravestone Here lies the saint, Dr. Baruch Kapel Goldstein, blessed be the memory of the righteous and holy man, may the Lord avenge his blood who devoted his soul to the Jews, Jewish religion and Jewish land. His hands are innocent and his heart is pure. He was killed as a martyr of God on the 14th of Adar, Purim, in the year 5754. Only two days after Goldstein's massacre, Rabbi Yaakov Perrin, states one million Arabs are not worth a Jewish fingernail. Another Jewish spiritual leader, Rabbi Yitzhak Ginsburg, who is also the head of the Kiva Yosef Yeshiva Talmudic School in Nablus, also sings the praises of the Goldstein Massacre, which he calls a fulfillment of a number of commands of Jewish religious law. Among Goldstein's good deeds, as enumerated, are taking revenge on non-Jews, extermination of the non-Jews who are from the seed of Amalek, and the sanctification of the Holy Name. Poland demands the extradition of Jew, Solomon Morel from Israel, for, crimes against humanity. Morel was a commandant of a concentration camp at Swetoklois, in Poland, after World War II. This concentration camp housed Polish men, women and children who were of German descent, and had subsequently had their property seized by the Jewish communist authorities. Among the charges that Morel is accused of are, 1. That he murdered babies by bashing their heads against stone walls. 2. He bludgeoned inmates to death with stools and clubs. 3. He committed torture on inmates. His preferred method was sticking objects up an inmate's sameness. 4. He forced women and children to parade round naked in sub-zero temperatures. 5. He made inmates eat human feces. 6. He starved inmates to death. Following these charges, the Israeli government assist Morel in fleeing to Tel Aviv, and dismiss the charges as an anti-Semitic plot. The Polish prosecutor in charge of pursuing Solomon Morel, Eva Koch, states of the Israeli authorities the Israelis are extremely efficient in pursuing people they have accused of such crimes, and they must accept that other nations want to do the same. However, Israel refuses to extradite Morel, not that they would be able to anyway, as Israel does not extradite its citizens. In fact Israel cannot extradite its citizens as the whole basis of that racist state is that the Jews are above all other races, which is why it does not and cannot form extradition treaties with any non-Jewish nations. As a result of this, many Jewish criminals have fled to their safe haven of Israel over the years, 
to evade prosecution for whatever crimes they have committed around the world. Going back to the choice of Solomon Morel, as a concentration camp commandant, interestingly, in his book, An Eye for an Eye, author, John Sack, states, the following of Russia's Jewish leader, Stalin Stalin deliberately picked Jews as camp commandants in the knowledge they would show little mercy to the inmates. Former Mossad agent, Viktor Ostrovsky, releases another book entitled, The Other Side of Deception, in which he reveals the following, on page 241 Uri was on a cooling off period from the United States. What is the Mossad doing giving humanitarian assistance to blacks in Soweto? I remember asking him. There was no logic to it, no short-term political gain, which was the way the Mossad operated, or any visible monetary advantage. Do you remember Nsaiona? His question sent shivers up my spine. I nodded. This is very much the same. We're testing both new infectious diseases and new medication that can't be tested on humans in Israel, for several of the Israeli medicine manufacturers. This will tell them whether they're on the right track, saving them millions in research. What do you think about all this? I had to ask. It's not my job to think about it. Nelson Mandela, who served 26 years in prison for amongst other things. 193 counts of terrorism committed from 1961 to 1963 and had stated at his trial in 1964 I do not deny that I planned sabotage. Is elected president of South Africa to a fanfare of media sycophancy worldwide, as the Jewish owned media praise the historic day that a black man is elected to run South Africa. What they fail to mention is that Mandela who incidentally prior to his incarceration wrote the pamphlet, How to Be a Good Communist, has simply been put there to ensure there is no disruption to the running of South Africa by the Rothschild Oppenheimer family and in particular their gold and diamond mining interests. Indeed the current head of the Oppenheimer family, Harry Oppenheimer, owns 95% of the world's diamond mines. Isn't it surprising that the Jewish media fail to inform their readers why, if the blacks in South Africa are getting Africa for the Africans, all the gold and diamond mines, i.e. the wealth of South Africa, is still controlled by Jews. Communism was of course invented for the Rothschilds by Moses Maud Chilevi, more commonly known by his crypto-Jew name of Karl Marx which makes it no surprise that the African National Congress, ANC, in South Africa was guided by two communist Jews, Albi Sachs, and Yossel Mashal Slavo, Joe Slavo. Indeed, when Nelson Mandela's ANC took over South Africa, Slavo was named Minister of Housing. Communism is designed to concentrate the wealth in the hands of the few Jews at the top, plus in this case, the odd token black man whilst the population of the country they have usurped is left in poverty. It therefore should come as no surprise that none of the mineral wealth controlled by Rothschild front men, the Oppenheimer family, is returned to the black people and instead, South Africa, far from becoming free, experiences a dramatic decrease in living standards for the black population, and rapidly declines to the status of the world's most violent and crime-ridden country. AIDS infection soars to at least 25% of the black population and Mandela's successor, Dabo Mbiki, son of one of the terrorists jailed alongside Mandela, Govan Mbiki, after he succeeds Mandela as president, states that poverty, not HIV is the cause of AIDS. This results in confusion to a population who under so-called freedom have seen crime levels and poverty soar, and in their desperation in the realization the government won't help them, have resorted to witch doctors who advise that sex with a virgin will cure them of AIDS. This, in a country which already boasts statistics of one rape every 26 seconds, now sees incidences of sex with babies less than six months old soar. Interestingly, the Jewish Talmud legitimizes sex with girls under the age of three and justifies it in the Misner of Kethuboth 11a, because, apparently, according to the Jewish rabbis, it is like putting your finger in the baby girl's eye and just as tears come to the eye again and again, 
So does virginity come back to the baby girl? 1995. On October 21st, former Mossad agent Viktor Ostrovsky, who published two books exposing the activities of the Mossad, appears on a Canadian breakfast television show, Canada Am, with Israeli journalist Yosef Lapid, the former head of Israeli television, also on the program via satellite link. Lapid had already called for the Mossad to see Kostrovsky out in Canada and kill him for writing his revealing books. However this time, Lapid states live on the show that as Israel's Mossad could not kill Ostrovsky in Canada without causing diplomatic incident I hope that there would be a decent Jew in Canada who would do the job for us. Ostrovsky decides to sue in a Canadian court Joseph Lapid for inciting his murder and, Canada am, for airing his incitement to the public. However, Ostrovsky is unable to find any lawyer in Canada who will take the case. Ostrovsky then has the last portion of his advance, $46,000, withheld by his publisher Harper Collins, owned by Jew, Rupert Murdoch, against advertising. Ostrovsky informs Harper Collins that this was not in their contract to which they reply, sue us. The collective Jewish harassment goes on. Ostrovsky's daughter, a television producer, is denied a job she had been offered at a Vancouver television station after its Toronto head office learns of her relationship to Ostrovsky. Ostrovsky's Canadian publisher cancels the publication of his new book and some time after that, his home is burnt to the ground in an arson attack. Former atomic energy scientist, Dr. Kitty Little claims the Rothschilds now control 80% of the world's uranium supplies giving them a monopoly over nuclear power. The Defense Investigative Service circulates a memo warning us military contractors that Israel aggressively collects, United States, military and industrial technology. The report states that Israel obtains information using ethnic targeting, financial aggrandizement, and identification and exploitation of individual frailties of United States citizens. 1996 a General Accounting Office Report, Defense Industrial Security, Weaknesses in Us Security Arrangements with Foreign-Owned Defense Contractors, finds that according to intelligence sources, Country A, identified by intelligence sources as Israel, Washington Times, February 22, 1996 conducts the most aggressive espionage operation against the United States of any US ally. The Jerusalem Post, August 30, 1996, quotes the report classified military information and sensitive military technologies are high priority targets for the intelligence agencies of this country. The report describes an espionage operation run by the intelligence organization responsible for collecting scientific and technologic information for, Israel, paid a U.S government employee to obtain U.S. classified military intelligence documents. The Washington Report on Middle East Affairs, Sean L. Twing, April 1996, noted that this was a reference to the 1985 arrest of Jonathan Pollard, a civilian US naval intelligence analyst who provided Israel's LACAM espionage agency an estimated 800,000 pages of classified U.S intelligence information. The Gao report also notes that several citizens of Israel were caught in the United States stealing sensitive technology used in manufacturing artillery gun tubes. An Office of Naval Intelligence document, Worldwide Challenges to Naval Strike Warfare, reports that U.S. technology has been acquired by China through Israel in the form of the Lavi fighter and possibly SAM surface-to-air missile, technology. Jane's Defense Weekly, February 28, 1996, notes that until now, the intelligence community has not openly confirmed the transfer of U.S. technology, via Israel, to China. The report noted that this represents a dramatic step forward for Chinese military aviation. Flight International, March 13, 1996. On April 13, 
In the course of Israel's military offensive against Hezbollah forces in South Lebanon entitled, Operation Grapes of Wrath, Israeli forces launch a rocket attack on an ambulance in Beirut, killing six civilians, two women and four children. Israeli forces apologize, an Israeli spokesman Glyn Davis, calls it a, terrible tragedy. Less than a week later, on April 18, Israeli commit another, terrible tragedy, when they deliberately shell the United Nations safe compound in the village of Kana, South Lebanon, killing 106 Lebanese civilians who had only taken refuge there on the understanding that it was an agreed non-combat area, between the fighting forces of Hezbollah and Israel. Israel makes excuses as usual, claiming it was a mistake but unfortunately history has by now proven that they are never able to enter into any sort of combat without committing some sort of war crime, or rather series of war crimes, which they always seem to have excuses for. Major General Stanislaw Wozniak of the United Nations Interim Force in Lebanon, UNIFIL, clearly sees it this way, as revealed in his response to Israeli excuses in which he firmly states of the Kana massacre simply. You do not attack civilians. You do not attack unpositions. Amskel Rothschild, 41, is strangled with the heavy cord of his own towel robe in his hotel room in Paris. For some reason, the French Prime Minister, Jacques Chirac orders the French police to close their investigation, and, Rupert Murdoch, born of a Jewish mother and so a Jew by Israeli immigration law, instructs his editors and news managers around the world to report it as a heart attack, if they need to report it at all. On May 12, United Nations Ambassador and Ashkenazi Jew, Madeleine Albright, when appearing on 60 Minutes, is asked the following by correspondent Leslie Stahl, in reference to the years of United States-led economic sanctions against Iraq we have heard that half a million children have died. I mean, that is more children than died in Hiroshima. And, you know, is the price worth it? To which Ambassador Albright replies I think that is a very hard choice, but the price, we think, the price is worth it. Her comments cause no public outcry. In fact, the Holocaust of half a million Iraqi children is positively admired by the United States government when you consider less than eight months later. President Clinton appointed Albright as Secretary of State. Whilst appearing before the Senate committee, who were considering her appointment, Albright is literally chomping at the bit for the blood of more Iraqi children when she states we will insist on maintaining tough on sanctions against Iraq unless and until that regime complies with relevant Security Council resolutions. The paper, A Clean Break, A New Strategy for Securing the Realm, is published which makes the following statement that will be replaced with the cock and bull story of, weapons of mass destruction, to justify the United States invasion of Iraq in 2003 Israel can shape its strategic environment, in cooperation with Turkey and Jordan, by weakening, containing, and even rolling back Syria. This effort can focus on removing Saddam Hussein from power in Iraq, an important Israeli strategic objective in its own right. The people behind this report are, Richard Pull, James Colbert, Charles Fairbanks Jr. Douglas Feith, Robert Lowe Anberg, David Wormser, and Mayraf Wormser. On Larry King Live in April, actor, Marlon Brando, makes the following statement Hollywood is run by Jews. It is owned by Jews, and they should have a greater sensitivity about the issue of people who are suffering because they've exploited them. As a result of this statement, the Jewish Defense League immediately demand Brando's star be removed from the Hollywood Walk of Fame, but, fearing a public outcry, the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce refuses to do this. 1997 On February 20, the New York Times reports that an army mechanical engineer, Ashkenazi Jew, David A. Tenenbaum, inadvertently, gave classified military information on missile systems and armored vehicles to Israeli officials. 
The Washington Post also reports that United States intelligence has intercepted a conversation in which two Israeli officials had discussed the possibility of getting a confidential letter that then Secretary of State, Warren Christopher had written to Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat. One of the Israelis, identified only as, Doff, had commented that they may get the letter from, Mega, the code name for Israel's top agent inside the United States. United States Ambassador to Israel, Martin Indk, complains privately to the Israeli government about heavy-handed surveillance by Israeli intelligence agents. Israeli agents place a tap on Ashkenazi Jew and daughter of a rabbi, Monica Lewinsky's, phone at the Watergate and record phone sex sessions between her and President Bill Clinton. The Ken Starr report confirms that Clinton warned Lewinsky their conversations were being taped and ended the affair. Interestingly, at the same time, the FBI's hunt for, Mega, is called off. Edgar Bronfman, chairman of the World Jewish Congress, effectively extorts one and a half billion dollars from Switzerland for alleged Holocaust victims who he claimed had deposited their money there. He has no proof. But the Swiss government give in as Bronfman is one of President Clinton's largest financial backers and they feared the diplomatic consequences of their failure to do so. Interestingly, this year a 17-member tribunal based in Zurich is set up to investigate the identities of the 5,500 foreign accounts and 10,000 Swiss accounts that have lain dormant since the end of the World War II, which subsequently discovers that only 200 accounts containing a total of approximately $10 million, less than 1% of the $1.5 billion extorted by Bronfman, could be traced back to alleged Holocaust victims. Does Bronfman give the Swiss back the other 99% of the $1.5 billion? Of course not, and incidentally some six years later he has given almost nothing to the alleged Holocaust victims he claimed the money was for. Bronfman simply misappropriated his ill-gotten gains that he had fraudulently obtained in his demands of justice for alleged Holocaust victims. Less than two months before Tony Blair comes to power in England, another interesting entry can be found in Hansard, 5th of March 1997, Volume 578, No. 68. Columns 1869 to 1871, in which the Earl of Caithness is recorded as having stated the next government must grasp the nettle, accept their responsibility for controlling the money supply and change from our debt based monetary system. My lords, will they? If they do not, our monetary system will break us and the sorry legacy we are already leaving our children will be a disaster. On May 2, the British Labour Party leader, Tony Blair is elected as Prime Minister. Prior to his election, the man in charge of donations to Blair's, private office, donations which reached the princely sum of £7 million, was none other than Blair's tennis partner, a Jew, Michael Levy. Furthermore, Levy agreed to raise large sums of money for the Labour Party, so long as they never became, anti-Israel whilst Blair is leader? Interestingly Blair was initially introduced to Levy at a dinner party in 1994, by Gideon Mr, a senior Israeli diplomat. Levy has also acted as a fundraiser for Israeli Prime Minister at Barak, and both his children live in Israel. Another Jew, David Sainsbury, becomes the Labour Party's single largest donator this year when he donated £1 million to the party. Coincidentally both Levy and Sainsbury are given life appearages and become lords, following Blair's election victory. On May 6, only four days after Tony Blair's election as Prime Minister, his Chancellor of the Exchequer, Gordon Brown, announces he is going to give full independence from political control to the Bank of England. No change there then. On October 29 Edmund de Roth's child dies in Geneva. Interestingly on the exact same day Anton Zander Lavey, real name Levy, a crypto Jew, the founder of the Church of Satan also dies, who in his book, Satan Speaks, states in relation to the Jewish blueprint for world domination, the protocols of the elders of Zion.
The first time I read the protocols of the elders of Zion, my instinctive reaction was, so what's wrong with that? Isn't that the way any master plan should work? Doesn't the public deserve, nay, demand, such despotism? Kofi Annan becomes Secretary General to the United Nations. He is married to Nain Lagergren, a Rothschild, who he wed in 1984. In Los Angeles, a major local, state and federal drug investigation sours. The suspects in this investigation? Israeli organized crime with operations in New York, Miami, Las Vegas, Canada, Israel and Egypt. This Israeli organized crime network was involved in cocaine and ecstasy trafficking, alongside sophisticated white-collar credit card and computer fraud. To the astonishment of the investigating officers, the Israelis under investigation had the investigators' beepers, cell phones, even home phones under surveillance. Some of the network who were arrested even admitted to having hundreds of telephone numbers and using them to avoid arrest. The investigators look at where this information may have come from and they soon stumble upon the Israeli firm Andux which has a virtual monopoly in the United States on telephone billing services, and upon checking their own phone system for how they could have been wiretapped, they discover their main contractor was Converse Infos another Israeli firm which works closely with the Israeli government. On January 18th, Michael Spector, publishes a story in the New York Times entitled, Traffickers New Cargo, Naive Slavic Women. The story reveals how the Jewish-Russian mafia dominate the white slave trade in prostitution with many of the unsuspecting women they deceive into this business ending up in Israel. Indeed Spector states the following in the article that Ropikana, in Tel Aviv's bustling business district, is one of the busiest bordellos. The women who work there, like nearly all prostitutes in Israel today, are Russian. Their boss, however, is not. President Bill Clinton receives a letter dated January 26, from a group calling themselves the Project for a New American Century, PNUC, which is signed by the following persons, Elliot Abrams, Richard L. Armitage, William J. Bennett, Jeffrey Berner, John Bolton, Paula Dobryansky, Francis Fukuyama, Robert Kagan, Zalma Khalil Zad, William Crystal, Richard Paul, Peter W. Rodman, Donald Rumsfeld, William Schneider Jr. Van Weber, Paul Wolfowitz, R. James Wolsey, Robert B. Zolik, most of which are Jews. The letter states we are writing you because we are convinced that current American policy toward Iraq is not succeeding, and that we may soon face a threat in the Middle East more serious than any we have known since the end of the Cold War. In your upcoming State of the Union address, you have an opportunity to chart a clear and determined course for meeting this threat. We urge you to seize that opportunity, and to enunciate a new strategy that would secure the interests of the U.S and our friends and allies around the world. That strategy should aim, above all, at the removal of Saddam Hussein's regime from power. We stand ready to offer our full support in this difficult but necessary endeavor. Given the magnitude of the threat, the current policy, which depends for its success upon the steadfastness of our coalition partners and upon the cooperation of Saddam Hussein, is dangerously inadequate. The only acceptable strategy is one that eliminates the possibility that Iraq will be able to use or threaten to use weapons of mass destruction. In the near term, this means a willingness to undertake military action as diplomacy is clearly failing. In the long term, it means removing Saddam Hussein and his regime from power. That now needs to become the aim of American foreign policy. In September, with the above letter at the back of his mind perhaps, Bill Clinton whilst on a visit to Ireland, makes the following startling admission as to who really makes the decisions in the world you know, by the time you become the leader of a country, someone else makes all the decisions. You may find you can get away with virtual presidents, virtual prime ministers, virtual everything. Indeed rather ominously on October 31st, as per his instructions from the PNAC group, 
President Clinton signs into law H.R. 4655, the Iraq Liberation Act, which supported the pursuit of regime change in Iraq. However, history does tell us that the PNUC group are not actually particularly creative. Indeed, as far back as February 1990 Mossad Sion in New York supplied a false story to ABC television that Saddam Hussein had a uranium manufacturing plant in Iraq in order to draw attention to Saddam Hussein's so-called, weapons of mass destruction, one year before America's first war with Iraq. On February 19, a five-strong Mossad team is arrested in Bern, Switzerland, having been caught attempting to bug a private house. The International Monetary Fund, IMF, eliminate food and fuel subsidies for the poor in Indonesia. At the same time the IMF soak up tens of billions of dollars to save Indonesia's financiers or rather the international banks from whom they had borrowed. A document leaks out of the World Bank, called, Master Plan for Brazil. In it, it spells out five requirements to ensure a flexible public sector workforce. These are as follows. 1. Reduce salary slash benefits. 2. Reduce pensions. 3. Increase work hours. 4. Reduce job stability. 5. Reduce employment. The European Central Bank is set up in Frankfurt, the city from which the Rothschilds originate. 1999. In Brazil, Rio's privatized electric company named, Rio Light, is responsible for repeated blackouts in neighborhoods. The company blames the weather in the Pacific Ocean for the blackouts, when Rio is on the Atlantic. Where blackouts wouldn't have anything to do with the fact that after privatization Rio Light axed 40% of the company's workhorse would it? No problem for Rio Light as a result of the drop in employees which naturally reflects their drop in standard of service, their share price goes up 33%. The National Security Agency, NSA, headquartered in Northern Maryland, issues what's called a top secret sensitive compartmentalized information report, TS, slash SI, warning that records of calls in the United States were getting into foreign hands, in Israel, in particular. Interestingly an Israeli firm named Amdex has a virtual monopoly on the billing records of all phone companies in the United States as all the major ones such as at and outsource this process to them. 2000. George W. Bush is elected President of the United States. Bush and his family claim to be descendants of the House of Plantagenet which is descended from the Royal House of Judah. He is in fact a crypto-Jew. However, Bush portrays himself as a Christian for the purpose of making it appear that it is a white Christian who would go on to commit illegal wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, rather than the Jews behind the scenes.
president of Venezuela, Hugo Chavez, prior to making an official state visit to Iraq states imagine what the Pharisees will say when they see me with Saddam Hussein. The Pharisees were the Jewish leaders responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ who continue to be revered by Jews today. In April, Jacob Cookie Ogad, a self-confessed former Mossad agent, is arrested for running one of the biggest ecstasy smuggling operations in America on record. This operation delivered hundreds of millions of dollars in illegal drugs, manufactured in the Netherlands, to cities across the United States. One of the unique features of this operation was that Orthodox Hasidic Jews acted as drug couriers, hoping their traditional black hats, black coats and locks of hair dangling around their ears, would make them appear unlikely suspects. Indeed, Commissioner of the United States Customs Service, Raymond W. Kelly, states the drug comes to us from various smuggling bases, mainly Europe, the Dominican Republic, and Canada. Israeli organized crime groups dominate the trade. Russian Jewish oligarch, Boris Berezovsky, flees to London to avoid arrest in Russia and transfers his business interests to his proji, another Russian Jew, Roman Abramovich, who goes on to purchase Chelsea Football Club. On October 1st, the Rome Observer, runs a story of how the Italian police have broken up a pedophile ring which had been kidnapping non-Jewish children aged between 2 and 5 from orphanages, and then raping and murdering them. The pedophile ring had filmed these rapes and murders for the benefit of the global, snuff film, industry and had already sold copies to over 1,700 customers who had paid as much as $20,000 a time to see these two to five year old children being brutally raped and killed. This is not the problem, however. The problem is that this pedophile ring consisted of 11 Jewish gangsters, and the Italian broadcast media had been so bold as to inform them more than 11 million viewers of such and even go so far as to broadcast footage of these Jewish gangsters' arrests. Naturally, instead of maintaining a low profile or apologizing for the crimes of their brethren, the Jewish community in Italy went mad claiming, blood libel, and demanded that the Jewish elite who sat on the board of the TV network responsible, no surprise there, fire the news executives who allowed this story to broadcast. This was of course done. And incidentally, none of America's news networks carried any report of this Jewish pedophile network story. One has to wonder whether, the Jews' most holy book, the Talmud, had any influence on these Jewish pedophiles. The Talmud clearly states that sex between a grown man and a girl under three years of age is, permissible, and also, that the best among the non-Jews, deserve to be killed. It would appear the actions of these Jewish pedophiles satisfied both of these edicts. The International Monetary Fund IMF, require Argentina to cut the government budget deficit from its current $5.3 billion to $4.1 billion by the following year, 2001. At that point unemployment is running at 20% of the working population. They then up the ante and demand an elimination of the deficit. The IMF offer Argentina some ideas of how this could be achieved. Cut the government's emergency employment program from $200 a month to $160 a month. They also ask for an across the board 12% 15% cut in salaries for civil servants and the cutting of pensions to the elderly by 13%. By December of 2001, middle-class Argentines, sick of literally hunting the streets for garbage to eat, start to riot and burn down Buenos Aires. In January, Argentina had devalued the peso wiping out the value of many common people's savings accounts. Dismayed that they can't trade that country further, James Wolfe and so, the Jewish president of the World Bank states sorrowfully almost all major utilities have been privatized. How do they control the unrest within the population caused by Jewish banking? An example is of an Argentinian bus driver, a 37-year-old father of five, who lost his job as a bus driver from a company that owed him nine months pay. During a demonstration against this and other injustices perpetrated upon him and the population, 
the military police shot him dead with a bullet through the head. In Tanzania with approximately 1.3 million people dying of AIDS, the World Bank and the IMF decided it is now necessary to require Tanzania to charge for what were previously free hospital appointments. They also ordered Tanzania to charge school fees for their previously free education system, then express surprise when school enrollments dropped from 80% to 66%. During the time the IMF and World Bank have been in charge of Tanzania's economy, which is since 1985, Tanzania's gross domestic product has dropped from $309 to $210 per capita, standards of literacy have fallen and the rate of abject poverty has increased to envelop 51% of the population. When the IMF and World Bank took charge in 1985, Tanzania was a socialist nation. In June 2000 the World Bank reported arrogantly one legacy of socialism is that most people continue to believe the state has a fundamental role in promoting development and providing social services. There is rioting in Bolivia after the World Bank drastically increased the price of water. The World Bank claim this is necessary to provide for desperately needed repairs and expansion. This is utter nonsense but certainly not original nonsense. A British water supplier, Wessex Water, a privatized water company that was actually owned by Enron claimed the same thing after it was privatized, England was the first country to privatize the public water supply, and like Bolivia the quality dropped and the prices exploded. Furthermore, almost all privatized water companies in Britain have consistently failed to meet government targets on leakages so the increase in charges is clearly not going on maintenance. 2001 On January 20, only hours before leaving office, President Clinton grants Mark Rich, a crypto Jew from Belgium, real name Mark Reich, an extremely controversial presidential pardon. In 1983, Mark Rich was indicted by United States Attorney and future Mayor of New York City, Rudolph Giuliani, on charges of tax evasion and illegal trading with Iran. He fled to Switzerland before a court appearance, and remained on the FBI's, most wanted list, for many years. Interestingly Anti-Defamation League, Adel, National Director Abraham Foxman admits that his organization had received $250,000 in contributions from Mark Rich during a 16-year period including a grant of $100,000 shortly after Foxman had agreed to assist Rich in obtaining a presidential pardon from Bill Clinton. Foxman also admits it was his idea to use Rich's ex-wife, Denise, a major financial contributor to the Democratic Party, as a means of influencing Clinton. On September 10, The Washington Times runs a story by Rowan Scarborough entitled, U.S troops would enforce peace under army study. This article focuses on a 68-page paper by the Army School of Advanced Military Studies, SAMS, which looks at a variety of issues including different military agencies and their modus operandi. Of the Mossad, the Israeli intelligence service, the SAMS officers state wildcard. Ruthless and cunning. Has capability to target U.S forces and make it look like a Palestinian slash Arab act. On September 11, the attack on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon is orchestrated by Israel with the complicity of Britain and America, under the orders of the Rothschilds which they in turn blame on so-called Muslim terrorists. This is stage one of getting the Western world to go to war with the Arab world, on behalf of the Jews. Another textbook Mossad false flag operation remember their motto by way of deception, thou shalt do war. They also will use the attacks to gain control of the few nations in the world who don't allow Rothschild central banks and so less than one month after these attacks, United States forces attack Afghanistan, one of only seven nations in the world who don't have a Rothschild controlled central bank. These nations are all predominantly populated by Muslims who, unlike the majority of white Christians, see Nehemiah 5 colon 7, obey their scripture and refuse to partake in the lending or borrowing of money, usury, something which has riled the Jews for hundreds of years. 
The Jews are also most unhappy with Muslims throughout the world. This is because the plan to destroy the Muslim faith that worked so well for the Jews with regard to the Christian faith has largely failed. The Jews worked hard to get Muslims to migrate into many Western nations, the plan being that they would forget their religious beliefs and become nothing but consumers of Jewish-owned products, services and governments, like the majority of the white Christian world. Unfortunately the majority of Muslims maintained their religious faith and formed their own communities within these Western nations, failing to fall into the Jews' trap, like the Christians. The Jews decide this means the Muslims have to be destroyed, and they decide they'll get the Christians to do the job for them. Interestingly on the day after the attacks, in the Jerusalem Post, former Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, states regarding what took place on September 11th, well it's very good. It will generate immediate sympathy for Israel. Interestingly Boston Logan Airport from where Al Flight 175 and Al Flight 11 originated from, which struck the Twin Towers and Newark Airport where Al 93 originated from and which supposedly crashed in Pennsylvania, both had their security outsourced to a private firm named Huntley USA. This firm in turn is a wholly owned subsidiary of an Israeli company called International Consultants on Targeted Security, ICTS, International NV. A Holland-based aviation and transportation security firm headed by former Israeli military commanding officers and veterans of government intelligence and security agencies. The principles of ICTS are Menek Matsman, convicted in Israel in 1996 when he was treasurer of Adel Mitz Memorial Campaign, for campaign finance fraud unlike his fellow defendant Adel Mitz who was acquitted and goes on to become Prime Minister of Israel in 2006, and Ezra Hare, who would go on to, to die of a heart attack two years later at the age of 53 on his yacht off the coast of Palestine. These two Israeli citizens, took over management of security at the Boston and Newark airports when it bought Huntley USA in 1999. Less than a week before the 9-11 attack on September 5, the so-called lead hijacker Mohammed Ata and several other hijackers made a still unexplained visit on board one of pro-Israeli lobbyist, Ashkenazi Jew, Jack Abramov's casino boats. No investigation is undertook as to what they were doing there. Interestingly out of the 19 so-called hijackers blamed for carrying out the attack on September 11, seven would turn up still alive, some attending United States embassies in Arabic countries and asking why they are being named as hijackers. Does the United States or the Jewish media question this? No. On 9-11, five Israelis disguised in Arab clothing are arrested for dancing and cheering while videotaping the World Trade Center towers collapse. Supposedly employed by urban moving systems, the Israelis are caught with multiple passports, a van which tested positive for explosives and a lot of cash. As a result of this arrest, the mayor of Jerusalem, and future Prime Minister of Israel, Adelmet, personally calls New York City Mayor Udi Giuliani, with instructions for him to intervene in this matter. Adelmet offers the following assurances that these men had nothing to do with the terrorist attack, and were just having a bit of fun, which I guess, must be something Jews do when they see two giant buildings full of non-Jews collapse, when he states that's why the five laughed at the collapse of the World Trade Center buildings they were just being immature and irresponsible. Two of these five Israelis are later revealed to be Mossad, negating Olmate's claims. The other three are strongly suspected of being Mossad also. As witness reports track the activity of the Israelis, it emerges that they were seen at Liberty Park at the time of the first impact, suggesting a foreknowledge of what was to come. However, the Israelis are interrogated and then eventually sent back to Israel and furthermore the arresting officers from New Jersey Police Department are told not to discuss their arrest, so presumably if you ever want something done in New York, you're best off speaking to the mayor of Jerusalem first. Interestingly these five Israelis who were dancing and cheering the collapse of the World Trade Center, 
later appear on radio and television in Israel where they state they were in New York City on September 11th to document the event, as America had never suffered an attack like this on its shores. How did they know the attack was going to attack place? The owner of a moving company used as a cover by these Mossad agents abandons his business and flees to Israel. The United States government then classifies all of the evidence related to the Israeli agents and their connections to 9 to 11. Much of this is reported to the public via a four-part story on Fox News by Carl Cameron. Pressure from Jewish groups, primarily APAC, forces Fox News to remove the story from their website. Two hours prior to the 9 to 11 attacks, Odigo, an Israeli company with offices just a few blocks from the World Trade Towers, receives an advance warning of the attack via an internet instant message. The manager of the New York office provides the FBI with the IP address of the sender of the message, but the FBI does not follow this up. The FBI is investigating five Israeli moving companies as possible fronts for Israeli intelligence. Approximately 200 Israelis with ties to these moving companies which were very active in the World Trade Center in the months prior to the attack, are subsequently arrested on suspicion of involvement when bomb residue is discovered in some of the removal vans they were using. However, under the direct orders of Michael Chertoff, they deported to Israel as a result of, visa violations. Chertoff a dual United States slash Israeli citizen whose father is a rabbi and mother was one of the first Mossad operatives, prefers to order the arrest of approximately 900 Muslims with no ties to the either the World Trade Center or explosive residue. On September 12th, the Jerusalem Post tipped off about possible exposure of Israel as the perpetrators of the 911 attacks runs a story claiming that two Israelis died on the hijacked airplanes and that 4,000 were missing at the WTC. One week later, a Beirut television station reports that 4,000 Israeli employees of the WTC were absent the day of the attack, which would appear to clarify the story in the Jerusalem Post. Finally on September 22nd, the New York Times states the following there were, in fact, only three Israelis who had been confirmed as dead, two on the planes and another who had been visiting the towers on business and who was identified and buried. Between August 26 and September 11, a group of speculators, identified by the American Securities and Exchange Commission as Israeli citizens, sold short, a list of 38 stocks that could reasonably be expected to fall in value as a result of the pending attacks. These speculators operated out of the Toronto, Canada, and Frankfurt, Germany, stock exchanges and their profits were specifically stated to be, in the millions of dollars. The FBI never follow this up as they know it won't lead to the official line of Bin Laden, but instead, the real perpetrators, Israel. Also, Earlier this year, Louis Eisenberg who was responsible for the privatization of the World Trade Center, finds the ideal owner in, former strip club owner, Larry Silverstein. Both of these men have held leadership positions with the United Jewish Appeal, ah, a billion dollar Jewish, charity, organization. Also three months prior to its destruction, Silverstein doubles the insurance on the World Trade Center. Interestingly Silverstein is very close friends with former Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, claiming they have spoken on the phone every Sunday, at the start of the Jewish week, for years. Following the World Trade Center attack, anonymous letters containing anthrax are sent to various politicians and media executives. As a result of exposure to anthrax within these letters five people are killed. Like the 9-11 attack this is immediately blamed on Al-Qaeda, until it is discovered that the anthrax contained within those letters is a specific type of weaponized anthrax made by a United States military laboratory. The FBI then discover that the main suspect for these anthrax letters is an Ashkenazi Jew, Dr. Philip Zak, who had been reprimanded several times by his employers due to offensive remarks he made about Arabs. Dr. Philip Zak was caught on camera entering the storage area where he worked at Fort Dittrich which is where the anthrax was kept. At this point, 
both the FBI and the mainstream media stopped making any public comments on the case. Jewish Defense League chairman since 1985, Ashkenazi Jew, Irv Rubin, is jailed for allegedly plotting to bomb a mosque in the offices of an Arab American congressman. He dies shortly afterwards, allegedly slitting his throat in a suicide attempt, before he can be brought to trial. One week prior to the WTC attack, the Zim Shipping Company moves out of its offices in the WTC, breaking its lease and costing the company $50,000. No reason has ever been given, but Zim Shipping Company is half owned by the State of Israel. As a result of the September 11th attack being blamed on Osama bin Laden, the United States invade Afghanistan and topple the Taliban rulers there. This did happen but not for the reason I have just told you. The real reason is that Taliban leader, Mullah Omar had banned opium production in July 2000, and thus that year's opium crop was destroyed. Do you recall what happened in 1839 when the Manchu Emperor in China ordered opium destroyed, to stop the endemic addiction of the Chinese people? The Rothschild family ordered the British Army to go over there to fight the Chinese to protect its drug-running interests. Well that is exactly what happened here with the United States Army this year. Afghanistan is the source of 75% of the world's heroin, and due to Mullah Omar's destruction of 2001's profits, there was no time to lose in ensuring he couldn't possibly be allowed to interfere in the profits of this, Synagogue of Satan, for 2002, and thus the invasion occurs in October 2001, and soon after, the media is already reporting a bumper crop of opium in March 2002. On October 3rd, Israeli Prime Minister, Ariel Sharon, makes the following statement to Ashkenazi Jew, Shimon Peres, as reported on Kol Yisrael Radio. Every time we do something you tell me America will do this and will do that. I want to tell you something very clear, don't worry about American pressure on Israel. We, the Jewish people, control America, and the Americans know it. At the American Friends of Lubavitch dinner, in October, Ari Fleischer, President Bush's press secretary, is given the group's Young Leadership Award and Senator Joe Lieberman is declared the Knights Honoree. Both Ari Fleischer and Senator Lieberman lavish praise on the active Chabad Lubavitch effort to establish an army of young staffers in governmental and political jobs. This dinner is attended by hundreds of Washington political bigwigs, Capitol Hill staffers and Washington money people. Incidentally following Ari Fleischer's stint as President Bush's press secretary, he goes on to become an ordained Lubavitch rabbi. Former Director of National Affairs at the American Jewish Committee, Dr. Stephen Stinlight, in his October article for the Center for Immigration Studies entitled, The Jewish Stake in America's Changing Demography, Reconsidering a Misguided Immigration Policy, under the heading, Facing Up to the Gradual Demise of Jewish Political Power, explains how the Jews control America not that it is the case that our disproportionate political power pound for pound the greatest of any ethnic slash cultural group in America, will erode all at once, or even quickly. We will be able to hang on to it for perhaps a decade or two longer. Unless and until the triumph of campaign finance reform is complete, an extremely unlikely scenario, the great material wealth of the Jewish community will continue to give it significant advantages. We will continue to court and be courted by key figures in Congress. That power is exerted within the political system from the local to national levels through soft money, and especially the provision of out-of-state funds to candidates sympathetic to Israel, a high wall of church-slash-state separation, and social liberalism combined with selective conservatism on criminal justice and welfare issues. He then moves on to the power of the media which he admits is a Jewish propaganda machine it is also truth that Jewish economic influence and power are disproportionately concentrated in Hollywood, television, and in the news industry, theoretically a boon in terms of the formation of favorable public images of Jews and sensitizing the American people. He goes on to cite the absolute necessity of repeated propaganda regarding the alleged Holocaust of Jews in World War II when talking about dual Israeli-slash-American citizens, 
when he states America has largely tolerated this dual loyalty, we get a free pass, I suspect, largely over Christian guilt about the Holocaust. And he goes on to state how he believes Jewish media will benefit Muslim immigrants I confess that I suspect that MTV, for better or for worse, will prove more powerful with young Muslim immigrants. Over traditional sources of religious and political authority. Adam Goldman is appointed White House liaison to the Jewish community. Interestingly no other ethnic groups have a race-specific White House liaison. Russian Jewish oligarch, Vladimir Gsonsky, flees Russia, where he was facing money laundering charges, for Israel, he is a dual Russian and Israeli citizen. It is discovered that United States drug agents communications have been penetrated. Suspicion falls on two companies, Amdux and Converse Infos, both owned by Israelis. Amdux generates billing data for most United States phone companies and is able to provide detailed logs of who is talking to whom, whilst in Israel, Converse Infos gets reimbursed for up to 50% of its research and development costs by the Israeli Ministry of Industry and Trade. Converse Infos builds the tapping equipment used by law enforcement to eavesdrop on all American telephone calls, but suspicion forms that Converse Infos, which gets half of its research and development budget from the Israeli government, has built a backdoor into the system that is being exploited by Israeli intelligence and that the information gleaned on United States drug interdiction efforts is finding its way to drug smugglers. The investigation by the FBI leads to the exposure of the largest foreign spying ever uncovered inside the United States, operated by Israel. Half of the suspected spies have been arrested when 9-11 happens. Professor Joseph Stiglitz, former chief economist of the World Bank, and former chairman of President Clinton's Council of Economic Advisers, goes public over the World Bank's four-step strategy which is designed to enslave nations to the bankers. I summarize this below one. Privatization. This is actually where national leaders are offered 10% commissions to their secret Swiss bank accounts in exchange for them trimming a few billion dollars off the sale price of national assets. Bribery and corruption, pure and simple. 2. Capital market liberalization. This is the repealing any laws that taxes money going over its borders. Stiglitz calls this the, hot money, cycle. Initially cash comes in from abroad to speculate in real estate and currency, then when the economy in that country starts to look promising, this outside wealth is pulled straight out again, causing the economy to collapse. The nation then requires International Monetary Fund, IMF help and the IMF provides it under the pretext that they raise interest rates anywhere from 30% to 80%. This happened in Indonesia and Brazil, also in other Asian and Latin American nations. These higher interest rates consequently impoverish a country, demolishing property values, savaging industrial production and draining national treasuries. 3. Market-based pricing. This is where the prices of food, water and domestic gas are raised which predictably leads to social unrest in the respective nation, now more commonly referred to as, IMF riots. These riots cause the flight of capital and government bankruptcies. This benefits the foreign corporations as the nation's remaining assets can be purchased at rock bottom prices. 4. Free Trade this is where international corporations burst into Asia, Latin America and Africa, whilst at the same time Europe and America barricade their own markets against third world agriculture. They also impose extortionate tariffs which these countries have to pay for branded pharmaceuticals, causing soaring rates in death and disease. There are a lot of losers in this system, but one winner, the Jewish owned and operated banking system. In fact the IMF and World Bank have made the sale of electricity, water, telephone and gas systems a condition of loans to every developing nation. This is estimated at $4 trillion of publicly owned assets. In September of this year, Professor Joseph Stiglitz is awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics. 2002 
Webster's Third New International Dictionary, unabridged, reprinted in 2002, provides a new definition of anti-Semitism, a definition which has not been updated since 1956. The new definition reads anti-Semitism. 1. Hostility toward Jews as a religious or racial minority group, often accompanied by social, political or economic discrimination. 2. Opposition to Zionism. 3. Sympathy for the opponents of Israel. Definition, 2, and, 3, are added in the 2002 edition, just before the USA decide to invade Iraq under orders from Israel. Also this year, the Prime Minister of Israel, war criminal, Ariel Sharon, orders another Jewish genocide with the massacre in the Jenin refugee camp in the West Bank. Interestingly in response to this President Bush demands an immediate Israeli troop withdrawal from Palestinian cities, which Ariel Sharon publicly refuses to do. Bush's response to this is to state the following, on April 18 Ariel Sharon is a man of peace. The day issues a report that Israeli spies, posing as art students, have been trying to penetrate United States government offices. Police near the Hidby Island Naval Air Station in southern Washington state stop a suspicious truck and detain two Israelis, one of whom is illegally in the United States. The two men were driving at high speed in a rider rental truck, which they claimed had been used to deliver furniture. The next day, police discover traces of TNT and RDX military grade plastic explosives inside the passenger cabin and on the steering wheel of the vehicle. The FBI then announced that the tests that showed explosives were false positive by cigarette smoke, a claim test experts say is ridiculous. Based on an alibi provided by a woman, the case is closed and the Israelis are handed over to Immigration and Naturalization Service, INS, to be sent back to Israel. One week later, the woman who provided the alibi vanishes. On October 29th, Jewish Project for a New American Century, PNUC, members, Robert Kagan and William Crystal, state the following in a weekly standard article entitled, The Gathering Storm. What looms over the horizon? A wide-ranging war in locales from Central Asia to the Middle East and, unfortunately, back again to the United States. Afghanistan will prove but an opening battle. This war will not end in Afghanistan. It is going to spread and engulf a number of countries in conflicts of varying intensity. It could well require the use of American military power in multiple places simultaneously. It is going to resemble the clash of civilization that everyone has hoped to avoid. Thomas Torfer, a consulting economist in Washington, estimates that since 1973, Israel has cost the United States about $1.6 trillion which if divided by 2002's population is more than $5,700 per person. In his autobiography, Memoirs, published this year, Rothschild, David Rockefeller admits his role in the world government conspiracy when he states for more than a century, ideological extremists at either end of the political spectrum have seized upon well-publicized incidents to attack the Rockefeller family for the inordinate influence they claim we wield over American political and economic institutions. Some even believe we are part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the United States, characterizing my family and me as internationalists and of conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic structure, one world, if you will. If that's the charge, I stand guilty, and I am proud of it. On April 12th, every major paper in the United States runs a story that Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez had resigned as he was, unpopular and dictatorial. In fact he had been kidnapped under a cheat where he was imprisoned on an army base. Following sympathy from the guards, the coup falls apart and President Chavez is back in his office one day later. Interestingly he has video evidence that whilst he was imprisoned on that base a United States military attach entered the base. President Chavez, demonized by the Jewish media, commits the crime of giving milk and housing to the poor 
and giving land not used for production by big plantation owners for more than two years, to those without land. His biggest crime, however, was in passing a petroleum law that doubled the royalty taxes from 16% to 30% on new oil discoveries, which affected ExxonMobil, a Rothschild operation, along with many other international oil operators. He also took full control of the state oil company, TFSA, which before was nominally owned by the government, but in actual fact was enthralled to these international oil operators. Not only that, but President Chavez is also the president of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, and vehemently rejects the World Bank's four-step strategy, and their plan to reduce wages of the common people for the benefit of the bankers. Indeed President Chavez has increased the minimum wage by 20%, which has increased the purchasing power of the lower paid workers and strengthened the economy. His minister, Miguel Bustamante Madriz, fully aware of the danger Venezuela poses to the bankers when people contrast the fact it wouldn't let them in, for example, with Argentina who did, states America can't let us stay in power. We are an exception to the new globalization order. If we succeed, we are an example to all the Americas. Veteran filmmaker, James Longley, releases his documentary, Gaza Strip, to critical acclaim. This documentary shows Israeli troops both shooting Palestinian children through the head because they were throwing stones, and leaving booby-trapped toys on the ground to blow up curious children. It also shows Israeli helicopters dropping canisters of debilitating nerve gas on densely inhabited areas of the Gaza Strip. On March 16, 23-year-old American, Rachel Corey, who had traveled to the Gaza Strip to defend Palestinians against Israeli war crimes being carried out there is killed whilst trying to prevent the demolition of the home of a Palestinian pharmacist, his wife, and three young children. When she stands in front of this house to protest in front of an Israeli defense force, in Caterpillar D9 bulldozer, she is deliberately driven over by the driver. The driver then reverses back over her for good measure. Rachel dies after saying to shocked Palestinians, who come to her aid I think my back is broken. The United States does nothing to criticize Israel for this, accepting their excuse that it was an accident, even though there are several eyewitnesses that categorically say the act was deliberate and there is even photographic evidence showing Rachel was wearing a bright orange fluorescent jacket at the time it happened and immediately afterwards, which was in broad daylight. The New York Jewish community has a lot to say about it however. When, in early 2006, a play entitled, My Name is Rachel Corey, is due to premiere in New York, following two successful runs in London, it is abruptly cancelled after pressure from the Jewish community. The United States, under the presidency of the crypto-Jew, George W. Bush, invade Iraq on March 19, which this year is when the Holy Day of Purim falls in the Jewish calendar. This Day of Purim, is a day the Jews celebrate their victory over all the Goyim, non-Jews, in ancient Babylon, which is now based within the borders of Iraq, how interesting. What is also interesting is that the previous United States-led invasion of Iraq ended on the Day of Purim ten years earlier with the genocide of 150,000 fleeing Iraqis under the current president's father, George Herbert Walker Bush. Purim is also the time when the Jews are encouraged to get bloody revenge against the non-Jews. Iraq, is now one of six nations left in the world who don't have a Rothschild-controlled central bank. However, this war is mainly about stealing Iraq's water supply for Israel, as Israel has always struggled for fresh water. Indeed, it had to steal the Golan Heights from Syria which provided Israel with one-third of its fresh water 36 years before, yet still in Israel water extraction has surpassed replacement by 2.5 billion meters in the last 25 years. This means the water is far more precious to them than even the oil reserves which are the second largest reserves of oil on the planet. 
Indeed, less than four years ago in 1999 Israel's Environment Minister, Dalia Itzik, declared a state of emergency in relation to the country's water supply. In a rare display of honesty, in June, President Bush puts a Jew, Paul Bremer, in control of Iraq when he names him, the United States Administrator of Iraq. Paul Bremer had been from 1989, Managing Director at Kissinger and Associates, the worldwide consulting firm founded by Jew, Henry Kissinger. Malaysian Prime Minister, Mahathir Mohamad states in a speech Jews rule the world by proxy. They get others to fight and die for them. The police chief of Cloudcroft stops a truck speeding through a school zone. The drivers turn out to be Israelis with expired passports. Claiming to be movers, the truck contains junk furniture and several boxes. The Israelis are handed over to immigration. The contents of the boxes are not revealed to the public. Israel deploys assassination squads into other countries, including the United States. The United States government does not protest. Russian Jewish oligarch. Mikhail Khodorkovsky is detained in prison in Russia facing charges of fraud, embezzlement and tax evasion. 2004 Two years into an FBI investigation of the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee, APAC, the largest political lobbying group in the United States with over 65,000 members whose job is to run the United States government on behalf of Israel, which the FBI suspect is a spy front for Israel, Ashkenazi Jew, Larry Franklin, a mid-level Pentagon analyst in the employ of Douglas Feith, is observed by the FBI giving classified information to two officials of APAC suspected of being Israeli spies. He is subsequently sentenced to 12 years in prison in 2006. Interestingly Douglas Feith was fired from the United States National Security Council NSC, in March, 1982 and lost his security clearance after he fell under suspicion of the FBI for passing classified material to Israeli embassy officials. APAC hires lawyer, Nathan Lewin, to handle their legal defense, the same lawyer who defended suspected Israeli spy Stephen Bryan in 1978. Also, Larry Franklin worked in the Pentagon Office of Special Plans, run by Richard Pohl, at the time Pohl, who was caught giving classified information to Israel back in 1970, was insisting that Iraq was riddled with weapons of mass destruction, WMDs, and the United States therefore must invade and conquer Iraq, as soon as possible. There were no WMDs, of course, and Paul dumped the blame for the bad intelligence on CIA director George Tenet, real name, Cohen, another crypto Jew. But what does come to light is that the Pentagon Office of Special Plans was coordinating with a similar group in Israel, based in Ariel Sharon's office. With two suspected Israeli spies, at least, inside the office from which the lies that launched the war in Iraq originated, it soon becomes crystal clear that the people of the United States are the victims of a deadly hoax, a hoax that started a war using the blood and money of American citizens for the purposes of Israeli oppression. The leaking of the investigation of APAC by the Jewish media on August 28, this year, gives advance warning to all the other spies who had been working with Franklin. As if it couldn't get any worse, the damage to the FBI's investigation is completed when United States Attorney General John Nashcroft orders the FBI to stop all arrests in the case. Like the Stephen Bryan case and the hunt for, Mega, this latest spy scandal seems destined to be whitewashed by officials who have their own secret allegiances to protect, barring a massive public outcry. At the beginning of March, dual Israeli-slash-American citizen and Jewish rabbi, Dov Zakheim, resigns as the Pentagon controller and chief financial officer when it is revealed in an audit of the Pentagon budget, that he is unable to account for the disappearance of $2.6 trillion including defense inventory of, 56 aeroplanes, 32 tanks, and 36 Javelin missile command launch units. Interestingly, the United States government claim this cannot be investigated further, because, allegedly, 
the records which would need to be studied to investigate this matter were destroyed in the attack on the Pentagon on September 11, 2001. On May 20, Senator Ernest Hollings, who is not running for a further term decides to speak out about Israel's control of America, which he does on the floor of the Senate, firstly declaring that President Bush went to war in Iraq, to secure our friend, Israel, and, everybody knows it, and then he makes the following statement about APAC's control of America you can't have an Israel policy other than what APAC gives you around here. I have followed them mostly in the main, but I have also resisted signing certain letters from time to time, to give the poor president a chance. I can tell you no president takes office I don't care whether it is a Republican or a Democrat. That all of a sudden APAC will tell him exactly what the policy is. In June, independent presidential candidate Ralph Nader echoes Senator Hollings' comments when he states what has been happening over the years is a predictable routine of foreign visitation from the head of the Israeli government. The Israeli puppeteer travels to Washington. The Israeli puppeteer meets with the puppet in the White House, and then moves down Pennsylvania Avenue, and meets with the puppets in Congress. And then takes back billions of taxpayer dollars. Police near the nuclear fuel services plant in Tennessee stop a truck after a three-mile chase, during which the driver throws a bottle containing a strange liquid from the cab. The drivers turn out to be Israelis using fake identifications. The FBI refuses to investigate and the Israelis are released. Two Israelis try to enter Kings Bay Naval Submarine Base, home to eight Trident submarines. The truck tests positive for explosives. The national director of the Abraham H. Foxman publishes a book entitled Never Again. The threat of the new anti Semitism, in which he states that the New Testaments lie, that the ancient Pharisees were responsible for the death of Christ, has been responsible for anti Semitism throughout the millennia, and thus the New Testament of the Bible is hate speech and should be censored or, preferably, banned. On April 21, Israeli nuclear weapons whistleblower, Mor Chai Anu is released from prison after serving 18 years, over 11 of which was spent in a 2 meter by 3 meter cell in solitary confinement during which time he was only allowed occasional visits from his family, lawyer and a priest. Even though he is released from prison after serving his full sentence, he is not allowed to leave Israel and is not allowed to speak to foreign media. In northern Nigeria, Islamic leaders claim a United Nations Children's Fund UNICEF, polio immunization campaign is part of a United States plot to depopulate the region by spreading AIDS or sterilizing agents as the northern states say their own lab tests show contaminants in the vaccine. In order to prove the vaccine is safe, the United States government sends a team of scientists, religious leaders and others abroad to witness tests on the vaccine in foreign labs, however once the tests are completed they refuse to release the results. Mel Gibson releases his film, The Passion of the Christ. To preserve its authenticity, the dialogue of the film is presented entirely in Aramaic and Latin with subtitles. However there is one subtitle that does not appear. It is spoken but for some reason the subtitle is removed. This is of course due to pressure from Jewish media. The scene from which the subtitle was removed, was when Pilate was trying to get the Jews to stop calling for Jesus Christ's crucifixion. And what was it the Jews said in response to Pilate, that the powerful Jewish lobby were so desperate to censor let his blood be on us and our children. On June 20, according to a report in the Jerusalem Post, the Israeli Knesset has now empowered the State of Israel to criminalize anyone in the world who dares to question whether or not six million Jews died in the alleged Holocaust, and request their extradition to Israel. Furthermore, the Israeli government can also seize, prosecute and imprison people who harbor such beliefs, should they ever set foot in Israel. On September 30, during his first presidential debate with the Jew John Kerry, President Bush states, on the subject of Americans dying in the war in Iraq a free Iraq will help secure Israel. On October 16, 
President Bush signs into law the Global Anti-Semitism Review Act, designed to force the entire world into never being critical of the Jews, whatever their actions. This act establishes a special department within the United States State Department to monitor global anti-Semitism, which is to report annually to Congress. This act defines a person as being anti-Semitic if they purport any of the following beliefs. 1. Any assertion, that the Jewish community controls government, the media, international business and the financial world. 2. The expression of, strong anti-Israel sentiment. 3. Expressing, virulent criticism, of Israel's leaders, past or present. The State Department gives an example of this occurring when a swastika is portrayed in a cartoon decrying the behavior of a past or present Zionist leader. 4. Any criticism of the Jewish religion or its religious leaders or literature with the emphasis on the Talmud and Kabbalah. 5. Any criticism of the United States government and Congress for being under undue influence by the Jewish Zionist community which would include Jewish organizations such as American Israel Public Affairs Committee, APAC. 6. Any criticism of the Jewish Zionist community for promoting globalism or what some call the New World Order. 7. Placing any blame on Jewish leaders and their followers for inciting the Roman crucifixion of Christ. 8. Citing any facts that could in any way diminish the 6 million figure of Holocaust victims. 9. Claiming that Israel is a racist state. 10. Making any claim that there exists a Zionist conspiracy. 11. Offering proof that Jews and their leaders created communism and the Bolshevik revolution in Russia. 12. Making derogatory statements about Jewish persons. 13. Asserting that spiritually disobedient Jews do not have the biblical right to reoccupy Palestine. 14. Making any allegations of Mossad involvement in the 9-11 attack. 2005. On January 20, President Bush makes the following statement as part of his second inaugural address when our founders declared a new order of the ages. This is not true. The founders did not declare a New Order of the Ages, the Jew, President Roosevelt did when in 1933. He put its Latin translation, Novus Ordo Siclorum, on the dollar bill. On February 15, the Jew Michael Chertoff is sworn in as the head of the United States Department of Homeland Security. As previously stated, Chertoff is a dual United States slash Israeli citizen. His father was a rabbi and his mother was one of the first Mossad agents. On February 27, Nation of Islam leader, Louis Farrakhan, makes the following statement with regard to the Jewish domination in the trade of African slaves to America lesson, Jewish people don't have no hands that are free of the blood of us. They owned slave ships, they bought and sold us. They raped and robbed us. On July 7, three stations on the London Underground's network and a London double-decker bus are bombed resulting in the deaths of 52 people. This is blamed on so-called Al-Qaeda suicide bombers. However this is not the only parallel with the attack on September 11, 2001 in America. Here are some of the other interesting parallels. 1. At the times and places the separate bombings on the London Underground occur. A. Crisis management, company known as Visor Consultants is carrying out terror drills of the same event. This is confirmed in separate interviews on both Radio 5 and Britain's most popular television station ITVA with the consultancy's managing director, Peter Power. In the Radio 5 interview, he states at half past nine this morning we were actually running an exercise for a company of over a thousand people in London based on simultaneous bombs going off at precisely at the railway stations where it happened this morning, so I still have the hairs on the back of my neck standing up right now. Readers may recall that the reason planes were not immediately scrambled on September 11, 2001, the day of the attack on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, was. According to the United States government, 
because a drill of the same event was occurring at the same time on that day, which caused confusion to the security services, who couldn't work out if an attack on America was actually taking place or if it was a dream. Why do people not find it suspicious when a terror drill run at the same time at three London Underground stations? It is important to note that the London Underground network consists of 274 stations, so picking three stations represent just over 1% of the stations they could have picked, actually becomes reality as an actual attack on the same three London Underground stations. Unfortunately, the general public do not use their brains and instead allow their thinking to be done for them by a Jewish-owned media. Why would a trained journalist not follow up such a blatant, smoking gun, especially when the man who made these claims, Peter Power, now refuses to discuss the matter any further? The answer is obvious, a journalist would not make that decision, and it can only be assumed the journalists collectively have been instructed not to investigate the matter further by the owners of the media, Jewish owners. As a for the reason for running a terror drill whilst the attacks were taking place, the most likely reason is to provide an alibi for the actual perpetrators of the attack, who knew about this drill. The way this would work, is that if any of the real bombers were caught acting suspiciously, they could claim that they were only part of the drill and they would have the alibi to back that up. This would of course mean that the alleged perpetrators, for Muslim men, were not involved in the attack. 2. The authorities claim that personal documents relating to each of the so-called bombers were found at each of the bomb scenes. This is another strange coincidence between the attack on the World Trade Center, when authorities there claimed that although they could not find traces of bodies, a pristine paper passport belonging to one of the hijackers had been found. 3. Israel's Finance Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is in London on the morning of the attacks in order to attend an economic conference in a hotel over the underground station where one of the blasts occurred, but stays in his hotel room instead after he had been informed by Israeli intelligence officials attacks were expected. This is another similarity with the attacks on America, when 4,000 Jews were warned not to go to work in the World Trade Center that day. How come it's only Jews who get prior warning about alleged Al-Qaeda terrorism? Following the invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq, there are now only five nations on the world left without a Rothschild-owned central bank, Iran, North Korea, Sudan, Cuba, and Libya. Interestingly the satellite state of Israel, more commonly known as the United States government, chooses to refer to these countries as, rogue nations. Physics professor, Stephen E. Jones of Brigham Young University publishes a paper in which he proves the World Trade Center buildings could have only been brought down in the manner they were by explosives. He receives no coverage in the mainstream media for his scientifically provable claims. On September 30th, Danish newspaper, Gylands Boston, publishes 12 so-called cartoons, most of which depict the Muslim prophet Muhammad something it is against the Islamic faith to do, regardless of what he might be doing. These cartoons are subsequently reprinted in over 50 countries resulting in large-scale protests by the worldwide Muslim community. This is exactly why they were printed. To inflame the tensions between the Western world, and the Muslim community and encourage the Western world and the Muslim community to be further alienated so they can fight amongst each other until only the Jews are left. The cultural editor of Gyland's Post is responsible for the original publication of these cartoons? Fleming Rose, a Jew. On October 30th, the head of the Kabbalah Center in Israel, Shaul Yudkovich, is arrested for extracting money from the cancer patient. Over a period of a few months, the victim donated $36,000 to the Kabbalah Center after she was told by Yudkovich that the donation would improve her condition. When her condition did not improve, other rabbis at the Kabbalah Center in Tel Aviv, suggested she make a significant and painful donation. As a result she donated a further $25,000 and also purchased some holy water from the Kabbalah Center, at an exorbitant price. She eventually ran out of money, 
So the rabbis then suggested her husband give up work and instead work for free at the Kabbalah Center. The victim then died and her husband went to the police to report this extortion. Interestingly, Shaul Yudkovich is one of the main teachers of the Kabbalah worldwide and was directly responsible for Madonna's visit to Israel in 2004. On November 15, Robert Stein Jr. an American felon, who was employed as a controller for the Coalition Provisional Authority in Iraq is charged with fraud and accepting kickbacks and pleads guilty to the charges. Stein, Lt. Col. Michael Wheeler and Lt. Col. Deborah Harrison were accused of accepting kickbacks of $200,000 per month from Philip Bloom in return for awarding questionable contracts. A New York Times article commenting on Stein's administration of reconstruction funds from Iraq's soil revenue states for reasons that the Pentagon has so far declined to clarify. Stein was hired as a controller by the Coalition Provisional Authority and put in charge of $82 million for reconstruction, despite his conviction for felony fraud in the 1990s. In November, a group of conservative to moderate Democrats called, Blue Dog Coalition, that focus on the fiscal responsibility of government, report that Jewish President George W. Bush has borrowed more money from banks and foreign governments than all the previous 42 United States presidents combined. Treasury Department figures show that from 1776, 2000, all the previous American presidents borrowed a total of $1.01 trillion dollars. Whereas in the past four years alone, the Bush administration has borrowed $1.05 trillion. On December 5, following accusations from Holocaust revisionists, that World War II leaders never mentioned the alleged Holocaust of the Jews in gas chambers, Richard Lynn, Professor Emeritus at the University of Ulster, reports his research into this matter, as follows I've checked out Churchill's Second World War and the statement is quite correct, not a single mention of Nazi, gas chambers, a, genocide of the Jews, or of, six million, Jewish victims of the war. This is astonishing. How can it be explained? Eisenhower's, Crusade in Europe is a book of 559 pages, the six volumes of Churchill's, Second World War, total 4448 pages, and de Gaulle's three volume, Memoirs de Guerre, is 2054 pages. In this mass of writing which altogether totals 7061 pages, not including the introductory parts, published from 1948 to 1959, one will find no mention either of Nazi, gas chambers, a, genocide, of the Jews, or of, six million, Jewish victims of the war. On December 6, David Cameron is elected leader of the British Conservative Party. Cameron is an old favorite of the Rothschilds having been special advisor to Norman Lamont, when he collapsed the British economy for them in 1993. Cameron is also related to the British royal family. Interestingly, the organization, Conservative Friends of Israel, boasts proudly on their website that over two-thirds of Britain's Conservative members of Parliament, are members. Indeed they even got David Cameron to complete a questionnaire for them prior to his election as leader, in which he stated the following Israel is in the front line in the international struggle against terrorist violence. Another organization, presumably in complete opposition to the, Conservative Friends of Israel, is called the, Labour Friends of Israel. They choose not to reveal how many Labour members of Parliament are members. They do however state, that they have sent at least 50 on expenses paid trips to Israel since 1997. Despite this intense political lobbying, Official government figures reveal that Jews represent less than half of 1% of the British population. Also on December 6, President Bush's wife, Laura Bush, is joined by Rabbi Binyomin Taub, Rabbi Hillel Baron and Rabbi Mendy Minkowitz for the kosherization of the White House kitchen. A photo of this taking place as they stand with staff is shot by Sheila Crayhead and subsequently placed on the official White House website.
2006. Hamas is elected to power in the Palestinian elections in January. This is exactly what Israel want, as it gives them the excuse to get rougher, if that's possible, with the Palestinians. Immediately following Hamas election, Israel demand that aid be cut off to Palestine, and this is dutifully done by the United States, the European Union, and Canada. The result of this is of course what the Jews have always wanted, widespread suffering in Palestine, supporting Israel's long-term goal of the genocide of the entire Palestinian people who refuse to leave Palestine. It also benefits Israel's long-term aims in the Middle East, as former Mossad agent Viktor Ostrovsky prophetically stated on page 252 of his 1994 book, The Other Side of Deception. Supporting the radical elements of Muslim fundamentalism sat well with the Mossad's general plan for the region. An Arab world run by fundamentalists would not be a party to any negotiations with the West, thus leaving Israel again as the only democratic, rational country in the region. And if the Mossad could arrange for the Hamas, Palestinian fundamentalists, to take over the Palestinian streets from the plough, then the picture would be complete. The Edmund de Rothschild Bank, a subsidiary of Europe's Edmund de Rothschild Family Bank Group in France, becomes the first foreign family bank that obtains approval of the China Banking Regulatory Commission and enters China's financial market. On March 5 to 7, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee (APAC) holds their annual convention in Washington D.C. More than half of all United States Senators and one-third of all United States Congressmen attend. The Anti-Defamation League ad, ruthlessly leans on governments throughout the world to pass hate crimes legislation, as they are scared that the Jewish criminal cabal is being exposed more and more on a daily basis, predominantly on the Internet. Their job is to protect this criminal network and what better way to do it than by passing so-called hate crimes laws, in which anyone who exposes a Jewish criminal, in turn becomes a criminal. This hate crimes legislation is promoted in protecting other things, namely ethnic minorities. It is interesting that these Jewish organizations are so keen on forcing laws on countries throughout the world that might seem somewhat contradictory to their own position when you consider the following. 1. Israel only allows Jews to emigrate to Israel and offers them financial incentives for doing so. 2. Israeli law forbids the marriage between a Jew and a non-Jew. 3. Israel does not allow non-Jews to purchase property within the country and most interestingly for Israel does not allow non-Jews to own any media, although Jews see no problem with owning the vast majority of the rest of the world's media. British historian, David Irving is sentenced to three years in jail in Austria, for denying the alleged Holocaust of the Jews in World War II. It is important to note that the only historical event you can be arrested for questioning is this alleged Holocaust. The Jews start to panic about being exposed and therefore up their attack on breaking down America, by encouraging the illegal immigration of millions of Mexicans into America, and then using their lobby groups to get the government to give them all amnesty. The idea is many-fold, but it includes, using their centuries-old policy of divide and conquer, getting cheap labor for the multinational companies they own and using the social and economic problem of massive Mexican immigration to divert the Americans' attention from Jewish supremacism. Why is it that Jews love mass immigration into every country, apart from their own, Israel? On July 12, two Israeli soldiers stray into Lebanese territory and are therefore arrested as prisoners of war by Lebanese forces. The Jewish media throughout the world screams that they have been kidnapped, yet make no reference to the fact that Israel have seized and imprisoned over 9,000 Palestinians without trial, and Israel starts bombing Lebanon indiscriminately, a country in which incidentally 40-45% to of the population are Christian. 
Incidentally, in relation to the 9,000 Palestinians imprisoned without trial, Article 111 of Israeli law, mandates that the government may detain any person whatsoever for an unlimited period, without trial and without declaring a charge. This was brought in with the founding of Israel, and has been gleefully adopted by other Jewish leaders such as President George W. Bush and an attempt was made by Tony Blair to put a slight variation of this into British law. When the Jewish media report this conflict between Israel and Lebanon, they make no reference to the high preponderance of Christians in Lebanon and instead portray the people of Lebanon as a bunch of Muslim Al-Qaeda terrorists and within a month well over 1,000 Lebanese men, women and children have been killed and a quarter of the country's population have been displaced. The war ends with Israel's withdrawal from Lebanon. Many Jews are not satisfied with this outcome and accuse Prime Minister Adelmet of losing this war. However when he appears before the Knesset Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee on September 5, he states the claim that we lost is unfounded. Half of Lebanon is destroyed, is that a loss? To Jewish aspirations, is it indeed?